Section 15 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2. The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 15. Part 1. Cases rated at AIIQ 110 to 120. Giulio Alberoni, 1664-1752, a statesman and cardinal. AIIQ 110, AIIIQ 110. No event in the life of Alberoni before his 38th year can be dated with certainty. 1. Family standing. It is said that Alberoni's parents were in the meanest circumstances. His father earned his livelihood as a gardener. No further information is available with reference to the family. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Alberoni's guiding principle was ambition. 2. Education. The lad was noticed by a parish priest as forward and officious. Taken into the service of this priest, he was taught to read and write and instructed in the rudiments of Latin. Thereafter, he received instruction from some friars who were pleased by his quickness and willingness. 3. School progress and standing. No record. 4. Friends and Associates Alberoni took pains to recommend himself to the goodwill of his associates, especially of those who possessed the ear of the bishop. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and Achievement Alberoni succeeded in so ingratiating himself that he was appointed to the cathedral as a ringer of bells. 7. Evidence of Precocity. No record. AIIQ 110 Relative Coefficient of Data. 0.20 3. Development from 17 to 26. Determined upon an ecclesiastical career, Alberoni succeeded through the influence of those who had befriended him in obtaining minor orders, and later in gaining admission to the priesthood. Because he excelled others in vivacity and buffoonery, he was appointed a sort of steward in the home of the vice legate at Ravenna. He became successively canon, and, after the vice legate had become bishop, preceptor to his patron's nephew. While the events outlined cannot be definitely dated, they appear to have occurred before Alberoni had reached the age of 27. AIIQ 110, relative coefficient data 0.11. Gebhard Lebrecht von Blücher, 1742-1819, a famous field marshal in the Prussian service. AIIQ 110, AIIIQ 125. 1. Family Standing the Blücher family belonged to the gentry of Mecklenburg. Gebhard's father, after serving as captain in the army of the landgrave of Hesse-Cassel, lived as a country gentleman on his little ancestral estate. The von Bülow family, of which the mother was a member, also belonged to the North German gentry. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. The Blücher boys grew up on the family estates, living a hardy out-of-door life. They became practice horsemen and boatmen, skillful and courageous in adventurous and daring undertakings. Early experiences developed natural aptitudes for the manly arts and engendered that love of combat, which, rather than love for a cause, is said to have actuated their early enlistments in the Swedish army. 2. Education Gebhard Blücher appears to have little or no formal education. 3. School progress and standing. C. 2. 2. 4. Friends and associates. His elder brother was his constant companion in childhood and youth. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. At about 14 years of age, Gebhard and his brother ran away to join the Swedish troops. This was an event which the parents had feared and had attempted to prevent. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0 0.00. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Blücher was captured by the Prussians. A Prussian colonel was attracted by the boy's manner. He arranged for his discharge from the Swedish army, secured him a Prussian appointment as cornet, and made him his adjutant. At 18, Blücher became second lieutenant, and at 18 and a half, first lieutenant. He constantly engaged in adventures and duels, and as constantly he progressed in his knowledge of warfare, 
but because of his wild life he was passed over in promotion. After complaining of this injustice without avail, he finally resigned from the army. It was not until his 46th year that he re-entered the army and won distinction. AII IQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0 0.20. Robert Lord Clive, 1725-1774, a noted English general and statesman. AI IQ 110, AI IQ 120. 1. Family standing. The family of the Clives was an ancient one. Robert's father was a lawyer of some ability, but lacking in the sterner qualities which are necessary for success. His mother, too, whom Robert said he owed more than to any school, was remarkable for her talents, and endowed with homely sense and force of character. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Before Robert Clive was seven, his uncle had reported of him that he was out of measure addicted to fighting. Boldness was his chief trait, and he was a leader of a little band in all their mischievous tricks. 2. Education. At a very early age, Robert was sent to a private school at Cheshire. At 11, he attended the Market Drayton Grammar School under a skilled Latin master. At 11 or 12, he went to the Merchant Taylor School in London, and from 13 to 17, he attended a private school at Hampstead, probably to obtain a business training. 3. School Standing and Progress. Macaulay's statement that the general opinion seems to have been that poor Robert was a dunce if not a reprobate, seems to have emphasised the significance of the lad's lack of interest in academic pursuits. It is true that in his youth Clive displayed more courage and sagacity than scholarship, but he did not fail to impress his associates with his unusual ability, and his Cheshire teacher said of him, if that lad should live to be a man, and an opportunity be given for the exertion of his talents, few names will be greater than his. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity. Clive at age 3 years and 3 months was reported by an uncle to be chattering continually and always asking questions. AI IQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After receiving at the age of 17 an appointment as writer for the East India Company, Clive spent ten years in India, years of fighting and adventure. In Sion at twenty-one, he became lieutenant at twenty-three, and captain at twenty-five. In two or more campaigns, he displayed courage and skill in leadership, and before he was twenty-six, his reputation as a bold and capable military commander was established. In his spare hours, he had read widely, and acquired a good clerical knowledge of the vernacular languages. AII IQ 120, relative coefficient of data 0.20. Oliver Cromwell, 1599-1659, a celebrated English general and statesman, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. AI IQ 110, AI IQ 115. 1. Family Standing Cromwell's family belonged to the upper middle class or gentry. The father, who had inherited a valuable estate, was a gentleman of good sense and competent learning, of a great spirit, but without any ambition. The mother possessed a strong character and sterling goodness. 2. Development at age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. From an early age, Cromwell attended the Free Town School under a Puritan schoolmaster. 3. School standing and progress. A contemporary panegyrist credits Oliver in his school days with a quick and lively apprehension, a piercing and sagacious wit, and solid judgment. His progress in school enabled him to enter Cambridge at 17. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AI IQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Cromwell entered Cambridge where as a fellow commoner of Sydney Sussex College, he is said to have acquired a knowledge of Greek and Latin under the tutorship of an excellent master. Although he did not distinguish himself, neither did he waste his time at the university. His tutor observed that he was more addicted to action than to speculation, and it is reported that he was more famous for his exercises in the fields than in the schools. The most important part of his academic education, from the point of view of its latter influence, was derived from biblical study. 
After the death of his father, Cromwell, who was then 18, left college and, according to some accounts, entered upon the study of law at Lincoln's Inn. He married at 21 and lived from that time upon his portion of the modest paternal estate until at 29 he was elected to Parliament. AIIIQ 120. Relative quotient of data, point two zero. George Fox, 1624 to 1690. Founder of the Society of Friends or Quakers. AIIQ 110. AIIIQ 120. 1. Family Standing. The parents of George Fox were humble people, but apparently not in actual poverty. The father was a weaver, and so honest that his neighbours called him the Righteous Christer. The mother, an upright woman, of the stock of the matures, was accomplished above most of her degree, was especially concerned in the training of her children, and perceived that George was of a different temper from other boys. She was tender and indulgent to him. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. The child, George Fox, refused to take part in childish and vain sports, and vain company was not to his taste. His greatest delight was in sheep, so he was very skilful in them. 2. Education. High school education was limited. He learned to read fairly well and to write sufficiently to convey his meaning to others. 3. School standing and progress. No record. 4. Friends and associates. No record. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. At some time after he had reached his twelfth year, Fox was apprenticed to a shoemaker who also dealt in wool and cattle. Of this experience he wrote later, a great deal went through my hands. I never wronged man nor woman in all that time. 7. Evidences of Precocity George very early manifested gravity, wisdom, and pity, and it so displeased him to see older persons behaving frivolously and likely to one another that he would say to himself, If I ever come to be a man, surely I shall not do so, nor be so wanton. While he was in the service of the shoemaker, he used in his dealings the word verily, and became a common saying that if George says verily, there is no altering him. When boys and rude people would laugh at me, he wrote, I let them alone and went my way, but people had generally a love to me for my innocency and honesty. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Grieved at the wickedness in the world about him, Fox, aged 19, left his home and friends to devote himself to a religious life. Several years of spiritual striving, perplexity and distress followed. The young enthusiasts sought the counsel of many priests of the church, but they could give him no comfort. When he was 22, he finally found the answer to his religious questioning in what he defined as a clearer manifestation of God in his own heart. At 23 or 24, he entered, as an itinerant preacher, upon a period of ministry, expounding even then the doctrine which became the distinctive contribution of his teaching. AIIQ 120, relative coefficient of data, point two zero. Christopher Willibald Gluck 1714-1787 A celebrated German operatic composer AIIQ 110 AIIIQ 115 1. Family Standing Gluck's paternal grandfather, as well as his father, followed the chase as rifleman or forest ranger in the service of some petty ruler. Of the mother's family, nothing is reported. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests at home, little Gluck was treated in a manner befitting the son of a rugged forester. From his earliest years, he, with his brothers, accompanied their father barefooted through the forest in the middle of winter, weighted down with hunting implements. It was not until he entered school that Gluck learned music, but when, once the opportunity offered, he soon acquired facility with many musical instruments, and before he was eighteen he had resolved upon one thing, a musician he would be and nothing else. 2. Education in his earliest years, the boy was left to pick up what education he could in the kitchen and the fields. At twelve, he was sent to a Jesuit school where the priest instructed him in school lore, and in playing the violin and organ, he also sang in the church choir and was taught the clavier and cello. 3. School standing and progress. C. 2. 2 and 6. 4. Friends and associates. C. 2. 1 and 2. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production or Achievement 
At his father's death, the boy was left entirely to his own resources, but he was already master of several instruments and was able to gain a living for himself at Prague by singing and playing at public concerts and private entertainments. Difficult though it was, this life not deterred a youth from his resolve to become a musician. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After several strenuous years, Gluck, at 22, migrated to Vienna, where, thanks to his own energy, self-reliance, and study of human nature, he was always successful in securing wealthy friends. Among these was Prince Melzi, who, after giving the youth a place in his private band, took him to Milan and placed him under the instruction of Sammartini, a learned theorist. When Gluck was 27, his first opera appeared and won immediate recognition and success. AIIQ 115 Ulysses Simpson Grant, 1822 to 1885, a celebrated American general, 18th President of the United States. AIIQ 110, AIIQ 125. 1. Family Standing. Grant's father, a prosperous tanner of Scotch pioneering blood, had a strong thirst for education. He read and studied constantly, was something of a debater, and a not infrequent contributor to Western newspapers. He is reported also to have been the first mayor of Georgetown, Ohio. The mother was a woman of strong character and sound common sense, and she too was of pioneer stock. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests From his earliest childhood, Grant had a passion for horses, and before he was eight, he began to drive about alone. At ten, he drove 40 miles from Georgetown to Cincinnati, and returning brought back a load of passengers. He was fond of undertaking and executing a given task on his own initiative and according to his own ideas. He was interested in agricultural pursuits, but detested tanning, his father's occupation. He was devoted to country sports and proficient in them. Whether or not he cared for public speaking is not told, but records show that at 14 he took part in five school debates. 2. Education From the age of 5 or 6 to 17, Grad attended the Georgetown Village School regularly except for one winter in Kentucky and one in Ripley, Ohio. He progressed through the three R's. 3. School standing in progress. No record. 4. Friends and associates. Grant was a favourite with the smaller boys of the village, who looked up to him as a sort of protector. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. A capacity for organisation and management appeared in him at an early age so that, at eight, he was sent by his father to purchase a horse. This particular transaction, however, he managed poorly enough. In early youth, his principal achievement, as well as his chief interest, was in horsemanship. Whatever he undertook to ride, he rode, was his father's comment on this ability. At the age of ten, young Grant accepted the challenge of a circus ringmaster and managed to stick on a horse that was trained to throw its rider. From his twelfth year, when he learned to plough, he did all the farm work that required horses, at fifteen, Grant worked in his father's tan yard, directing other boys employed there. 7. Evidences of precocity. None except in farm and business management, as indicated. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 and 26. At 17, Grant, although not particularly eager for the honour, received, through the influence of his father, an appointment to West Point. There he did fairly good work in mathematics, a subject that was easy for him. He read widely, although in books unrelated to the course of study, and he was the most accomplished horseman in the school. In his third year, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant, but in his fourth, he returned to his former rank of private. He finally graduated as 21st in a class of 39, after maintaining, through the four years, a rank near 150 in a corpse numbering about 225. From the age of 19 to 22, Grant served as Beveret's second lieutenant. He carried on during this period a regular program of self-directed study in preparation for the teaching of mathematics, his intention being to resign shortly from the military service. Although a pulmonary weakness threatened his health, it did not dampen his zeal for work, and at 23 he was ready to be appointed full second lieutenant. At 24 he was engaged in active military service for the first time, and during the same year won his initial commendation for successfully effecting a hazardous mission. As the war continued, he distinguished himself on numerous occasions, 
attracted the attention of his superiors, and, after a special recommendation for gallantry, was advanced at 25 to a first lieutenancy. AII IQ 125. Relative coefficient of data 0.75. William Hogarth, 1697-1764, a celebrated English painter and engraver. AI IQ 110, AII IQ 115. 1. Family Standing Hogarth's father was a man of exceptional attainments, but impractical in his business schemes. He kept school for a time and thereafter became a corrector for the press. He was also the author of a number of laborious tomes and the compiler of a Latin dictionary, which, however, he never published. Of the mother's family, nothing is known. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Hogarth early discovered that he had a good eye and a fondness for drawing, and after interest in a neighbouring painter, had diverted his attention from play. He was engaged at every possible moment in making drawings or sketches. 2. Education Hogarth's academic education was clearly neither intensive nor extensive, in fact, his school essays were said to have been more remarkable for the ornaments which adorned them than for their content. After a limited education, and doubtless actuated by the thought that he might thus avoid the precarious career of his educated father, Hogarth withdrew from school to learn a trade. 3. School standing on progress. The artist's letter remarked of his standing at school that blockheads with better memories had surpassed him. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. After leaving school, Hogarth was apprenticed at his own request to a silver plate engraver, but long before the completion of his apprenticeship, when he was 20, he had begun to crave something better. 7. Evidences of precocity, no specific record, C22. AI IQ 110, relative coefficient of data 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. During his service with the silver plate engraver, Hogarth acquired skill in copying designs. At twenty, he evolved a scheme for developing his memory for design, the first step in his course of self-training in composition. At twenty-three, he set up for himself as engraver and produced numerous plates, frontispieces, etc. The first of these published, and on his own account, appeared when he was twenty-seven. He first became known in his profession by a work published in his thirtieth year. AIIIQ 115. Relative quotient of data 0.11. John Hunter. 1728 to 1793. A noted British surgeon, anatomist, and psychologist. AIIQ 110. AIIIQ 130. 1. Family standing. The Hunters were an ancient family, owners of an old manor near Glasgow. John Hunter's father, a very frugal man, the owner of an estate had three sons who became physicians. Of these, two achieved distinction. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. John was good at games and an observer of nature from his earliest years. He had an aversion to books, but he wanted to know all about the clouds and grasses and why the leaves changed colour in the autumn. He watched the ants, bees, birds, tadpoles and caddis worms, and he pestered people with questions about seemingly trivial things. At a very early age, his interests were clearly defined, and he would do nothing but what he liked. 2. Education Hunter learned to read late, and with difficulty. At Kilbride Latin School, which he attended until his father's death, he made no progress at all. In fact, he is said to have been at this time impenetrable to everything in the form of book learning. A little later, however, he exhibited considerable ability as a student of the classics. 3. School standing in progress C. 2. 2. 4. Friendships and Associates. No record. 5. Reading. He hated books. 6. Production and Achievement. No record. He was employed for a time in his brother-in-law's timber yard. 7. Evidences of Precocity. Great as was his aversion to formal studies, Hunter was considered by no means a stupid boy, and although he retained the habit of childish crying long past the age when such a thing is generally tolerated, when occasion required, he was bold and intrepid. Indeed, at twelve years, he displayed his courage by attacking a practical joker disguised as a devil when his grown companions were petrified with fear. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. 
At twenty, Hunter suddenly awoke from the indifference that had characterized him up to that time. He demanded permission of his surgeon brother to be allowed to assist in his laboratory, and there, working long hours at anatomy, he soon won great praise for his dissections. At twenty-one, he attended at Chelsea Hospital under Chesildon, the most celebrated surgeon of the day, and from time to time, during operations, he acted as surgeon's pupil at another hospital. At twenty-four, he made, with his brother William, what they claimed as a new discovery in anatomy. At twenty-five, his brother, wishing to improve his manners, entered him as gentleman commoner at St. Mary's Hall, Oxford. Of the latter plan, Hunter stated in characteristic phrase, These schemes are cracked like so many vermin. AII IQ 130, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.43. Andrew Jackson, 1767 to 1845, seventh president of the United States. AIIQ 110, AIIQ 130. 1. Family standing. Jackson's father was an Irish immigrant, an impecunious frontiersman. The mother, although a poor man's daughter, cherished a wish that her only surviving son, Andrew, might receive a liberal education and so become a clergyman. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Andrew was fond of athletics and proficient in various sports. At 14, he became a fighter. At 15, when first left to his own resources, he is reported to have dissipated a little in gambling, races, drinking, and cockfights. 2. Education. After attending an old-fashioned school where he learned the rudiments, he entered an academy where languages were added to the common school curriculum and young men were prepared for college. At thirteen, he learned practical first aid by assisting his mother in tending the injured after a raid. 3. School standing and progress. He was remembered to have made commendable progress in school. 4. Friends and associates. No record. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. Jackson gave early evidence of unusual initiative. When the family were forced to flee from their North Carolina home, he paid his own expenses by doing chores. At fourteen, after being taken prisoner in guerrilla warfare, he enabled a neighbour to escape. He secluded better treatment for the other prisoners through remonstrance with Grad. At sixteen or seventeen, he is reported to have taught school in South Carolina. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0.43. 3. Development from seventeen to twenty-six. At 17 or 18, Jackson commenced the study of law with an eminent attorney in North Carolina, being at this time a married fellow as well as a rising young clerk at law. At 20, he was licensed to practice, and from his 21st to his 26th year, he exercised his license with unusual success on the Tennessee frontier. After holding an appointment as public prosecutor, he was named United States District Attorney at 24. He married soon after the latter appointment and was elected trustee of Davidson Academy the same year. AII IQ 130, Relative Coefficient of Data 0.43. Cornelius Jansen, Cornelius Jansenius, 1585 to 1638, a Dutch Roman Catholic theologian, founder of the sect named after him. AII IQ 110, AII IQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Jansen's parents were peasants of a grade so humble as not to be distinguished by a surname. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. There is no record of these beyond the mention of his inclination for study. 2. Education. No account is preserved of Jansen's early education, but before he was 17 he was sent to the University of Utrecht, where, in the College of St. Jerome, he studied the humanities under Catholic teachers and rhetoric and dialectics under Protestant instruction. However, his Catholicism was so well grounded that he was not led from it even by mingling with Protestants. 3. School standing and progress. When the poverty of his parents forced him to leave the university, no date given, Jansen had already shown his superiority and convinced his teachers of the probability of his future success. 4. Friendships and associates. Zilli, a fellow student at Utrecht, was a dear friend with whom, on his return to college, Jansen shared books, study and recreation. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. No record has been found except of his employment in a carpenter's shop, 
for some time before the age of 17, he acquired funds sufficient to continue his education. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Jansen was sent to the Catholic University of Louvain, where he acted as servant to one of the teachers, and where he studied with such assiduity and success as to be publicly declared the first student of his year. At the age of 19, when he and an aristocratic fellow student were rivals for first honours, Jansen, probably supported, as was customary, by the fists of his colleagues, and more certainly by his reputation among his professors, was awarded the prize. The Jesuits claim that it was at this time that he applied for admission to their order and was refused. At any rate, an old professor, Jansen, who hated Jesuits, made much of him. A little later, Jansen went to Paris and there became the friend of the great St. Siran, who secured him a tutorship whereby he might defray his expenses in the city, thus enabling the two eager scholars to pursue their studies together. But even the tutorship proved too great a distraction, and so when Jansen was twenty-six, he and St. Siran left Paris to continue their studies in the countryside undisturbed. AIIQ 140, relative coefficient of data, 0.53. George Monk, 1608 to 1670, an English general. AIIQ 110, AIIQ 120. 1. Family standing. George Monk's father, Sir Thomas Monk, came of a most ancient and honourable Devonshire family, whose estate, however, was badly run down at the time of Sir Thomas's tenure. George's mother was the daughter of Sir George Smith, also of Devonshire. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Monk had inclinations toward a military career, although it was chance that finally cast him into the army. Having sadly beaten an officer of the law who, after accepting a bribe to refrain, had publicly arrested Sir Thomas for debt, young George, at the age of 16, had to flee from the consequences. He joined the expedition against Cadiz as a volunteer on board ship, and upon the failure of the expedition enlisted under the Duke of Buckingham in a campaign against the Isle of Derrie. 2. Education Monk had very little education, spelled badly and expressed himself awkwardly, but his letters were always clear and to the point. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 110, relative coefficient of data 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 18, George Monk distinguished himself by successfully executing a state around under grand hazard to his life. In 20, he became a mercenary soldier in Holland, superior to his comrades in talent, but similar in his tastes. After several years of service, he obtained command of a company of volunteers. Although his men were ill disposed to strict discipline, and did not well understand their profession. Monk soon gained ascendancy over them and won, for himself both love and obedience. AII IQ 120 Relative coefficient data 0.11 Bartolome Espastian Murillo, 1617-1682 A celebrated Spanish painter, chiefly of religious subjects. AII IQ 110 AII IQ 120 1. Family standing. Murillo's parents were humble toilers living in the Jewish quarter of Seville. While the mother sold fruit, the boy ran wild in the streets. The family are said to have been opulent at one period, but during Murillo's childhood, they were in the most reduced circumstances. His uncle, a physician of very moderate means, adopted the boy, aged 10, after the death of his parents. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. None other than painting recorded. 2. Education. Of Murillo's early education nothing is known, but when the boy was ten, the uncle who had adopted him, seeing his desire to paint and his facility with the pen, used his small savings to apprentice him to a distant relative, a clever painter, Juan del Castillo. The man had neither genius nor enthusiasm, but he would turn out pictures by the score, and from him Murillo learned the use of the brush, something about composition and the grinding and mixing of colours. 3. School standing and progress. No record. 4. Friends and associates. 
no record except of members of the family and a teacher. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. Tales are told of Murillo's very early artistic production, indeed his first authenticated work, The Virgin with St. Francis, was painted when he was fifteen, but is said to be hard and flat, and to give little or no promise of the artist's future excellence. 7. Evidences of Precocity Murillo probably began to draw or paint at a very early age, but no work is preserved from before his sixteenth year. AIIQ 110, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.11 3. Development from 17 to 26 After a period of apprenticeship under his first teacher, Murillo at 22 was thrown upon his own resources. He resorted to the public fairs, where his wares commanded an extensive market, and he produced innumerable pictures. At 24, he came under the influence of a student of Dutch art. Inspired by this artist's tales of travel, he set out on foot for Madrid where, as an impoverished art student, he nevertheless soon won the interest and active patronage of Velasquez, that time court painter. Merla remained three years in the capital, accumulating both wealth and experience. AIIIQ 120, relative coefficient of data, 0.11. Jean Victor Marie Moreau, 1763 1813, a French general. AIIQ 110. AIIIQ 125 1. Family standing Marou's father was an advocate in good practice who insisted on his son's attendance at the university in preparation for a legal career. 2. Development to age 17. No record. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data 0.00. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Dr. Namuru wanted to enter the army and at the age of 17 he attempted to do so but was prevented by his father, who sent him to the university at Rennes. Having no inclination for the law, the young man took no degree, but he completed his course in the first rank among the law students. At the university, he revolved in the freedom of a student's life, became the leader of the academic youth, and formed his associates into a sort of army which he commanded. At twenty-five, he organized the students and other young men at Rennes in defense of the parliament, in opposition to the reforms of Cardinal Brienne, and in daily phrase which lasted five months, he showed himself very clever and cautious. AIIQ 125. Relative coefficient of data 0 0.20. Michael Ney, Duke de Elchingen, and Prince de la Mosca. A celebrated French marshal. AIIQ 110. AIIQ 120. 1. Family standing. Ney's father was a tunneler, or perhaps a cooper, in comfortable circumstances, who had served as a soldier in the Seven Years' War. Of the mother's family, no record has been found. 2. Development of age 17. 1. Interests. Young Ney showed an early taste for the activity of a career at arms. Diligent in school, he was always restless in his free hours. He would frequently organise and drill his school companions, because of the slight opportunity for advancement that the army offered to a working man's son, the elder Ney was opposed to Michael's military aspirations, and encouraged him to take up a civil occupation. This he did, but as he became in turn notary, procurer, miner, and mine superintendent, the burning wish to follow a military career never lessened its strength. 2. Education With the other children of his age, Ney attended the Augustinian school until his sixteenth year. 3. School standing and progress. No record beyond the statement of his diligence. 4. Friends and associates. Ney grew up in the military atmosphere of a garrison town. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. Before he had reached the age of fifteen, Ney was apprenticed to a notary, but he found the office so irksome that he soon gave it up and became a Procureur de Roy. In his sixteenth year, his father sent him to work in the mines, and his new occupation the boy enjoyed his work only until he had mastered its detail. At sixteen, he was very able, exact and active, and already noted for its zeal. It was no doubt because of these qualities that he was offered a position as superintendent of the forges of Selec, which he held thereafter for two years. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No record. AIIQ 110, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.43 3. 
Development from 17 to 26. After two years at Selleck, Ney, now 18, could no longer resist the strong inclination that had long been drawing him to enter the army, and so against the wishes of his family, he enlisted with the Hussars. Soon he began to attract the attention of his superiors by his application and his ability. He excelled in all forms of bodily exercise, and because of his exceptional handwriting he was appointed quartermaster. At twenty-two he was made a brigadier, and a little later he fought his first duel, sustaining the honour of his regiment. After winning rapid promotion in his twenty-fourth year, he was called at twenty-five a division general to become the aide-de-camp of General Colland, receiving, on this occasion, a certificate of bravery signed by the officers and men of his regiment. After further successful and distinguished service, and before the end of the same year, Ney was made to General Chief the Battalion. AII IQ 120, relative to coefficient data 0.43. Giofani Pierluigi da Palestrina, 1525-1594, a celebrated Italian musician, surnamed Princeps Musicae, Prince of Music. AIIQ 110, AIIQ 120. 1. Family Standing Giovanni's parents lived in the village of Palestrina, where they possessed a house, vineyard, chestnut grove and other property. A brother of the celebrated composer was lettered and became a musician by profession. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. According to the story, Giovanni often went to Rome, and one day, passing Santa Maria Maggiore, seeing as he went, he was heard by the choir master who, struck by the beauty of the childish voice as well as by the manner of singing, took possession of his discovery for the choir. 2. Education. It is recorded that Palestrina, at eleven, was one of the six selected choir boys of Santa Maria Maggiore, who, in the charge of the chaplain, Giacomo Coppola, were instructed in music by the choir master. The biograph infers from Giovanni's age that he remained in the choir long enough to be instructed, in 1540, by the great Fermin Lebel, appointed chaplain and choir master in that year. The records of the village show that the young musician was thought worthy of mention as early as his fifteenth year. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidence of precocity, no record. AIIQ 110, relative coefficient of data, 0.00. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 18, Palestrina was appointed organist and choir master at the Cathedral of St. Agapito in his native town, and there he served as choir master on all occasions, organist on festival days and instructor of canons and boys. Before a period of seven years' service at St. Agapito was at an end, the young musician married Lucrezia de Gores, a virtuous maiden who bought him a respectable dowry. In 1550, the bishop of Palestrina became Pope Julius III, and it was doubtless because of his influence that, in the following year, Palestrinus previously granted life appointed to the Cathedral of St. Agapito was annulled so that he might accept the important office of Master of the Boys in the Julian Choir at St. Peter's. AIIQ 120, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.11 Raphael Sanzio, 1483-1520, a celebrated Italian painter. AIIQ 110, AIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing. Raphael came from a lowly race. His father, who kept a store as representative of a general dealer or goldsmith, was a good painter and also something of a poet. His mother was a daughter of a thriving village merchant. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. From his earliest childhood, art was Raphael's all absorbing interest. 2. Education. It is probable that the boy received his first instruction in painting at an early age from his father, but while he studied the elements of his art, reading and writing were not entirely neglected. It is said that Raphael accompanied his father to Cugli and assisted there in the painting of frescoes for the Church of the Dominicans until the death of his parent, when the son was eleven. There is some slight evidence that Raphael learned painting first from Signorelli and Timotero Vitti, and not from his own father, in which case his art instruction began after he was eleven years old. As early as his thirteenth year, or perhaps as late as his seventeenth, 
Raphael went to Perugia, where he was placed under the instruction of the great master Perugino. In addition to his study of art, the boy is said to have received instruction in architecture from a famous Perugian goldsmith. 3. School standing in progress. There is no record of Raphael's having attended common school, or of his having received any general training in the common branches other than that imparted by his father. 4. Friends and associates. Before he was 17, Raphael was associated with a number of the foremost artists of the time. He attracted himself warmly to both teachers and fellow pupils. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. According to tradition, Raphael's earliest paintings date from his 11th year, but although it is clear from his later productions that he did not produce at an early age, there is no certain evidence regarding his work before his 20th or 21st year. It is said that under Perugino's tutelage, young Raphael soon surpassed all his fellow students, and exact sketches and copies after Perugino, probably the work of the pupil at 16, or perhaps earlier, are corroborative of this estimate. Raphael began early in his apprenticeship to assist Perugino in important works and became a close student of his master's technique. In Urbino, he sketched copies of the Flemish works in the palace, while they probably assisted in Perugino's Cambio frescoes the same year. 7. Evidences of Proquicity, C2-6 AI IQ 110, Relative Quotient of Data, point one one. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Between the ages of 17 and 20, Raphael had received and filled his first orders for independent work. At this period, he executed perhaps two dozen pictures in that style of his master, Perugino. When he was 21, the year that he left Perugino's studio, he painted his first famous picture, The Marriage of the Virgin, followed soon by the Granduccia Madonna. Soon after, he was invited to assist the distinguished artist Pinturicino. Then, having heard of Leonardo, he determined to go to Florence to learn from him. The next four years, broken by a prolonged visit to Perugia, were spent in Florence, with use were received as an equal by the great artists assembled there. One after another, great masterpieces came from his brush. Raphael had exhibited true genius when he was twenty-one, a twenty-five recognised as the greatest painter of his time. He was called to join the brilliant group at the Pavel Court in Rome. AII IQ 150 Relative Coefficient of Data 0.43 End of section 15section 16 of genetic studies of genius volume 2 the early mental traits of 300 geniuses by Catherine cox this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter 15 part 2 rembrandt hermann zun van rijen or ryan 1606 to 1669, a celebrated Dutch painter and etcher, the chief member of the Dutch school of painting. AIIQ 110, AIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing. Rembrandt's father, a miller, was an honoured and respected citizen of Leiden. His mother was the daughter of a baker of the same city. The family sustained a comfortable position in the lower middle class and owned a considerable property including several houses and a burial place in the church of St. Peter. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. When young Rembrandt was 14 or 15, by what means we know not, the art craving was fully aroused, and his parents' ambitious scheme for his serving the city and republic was as nothing beside his own irresistible desire to express himself in form and colour. 2. Education. He exhibited little affection for reading and writing, subjects which he had probably learned not to do well at home. But we may be sure that his religious instruction was the object of his mother's special care, and that she strove to instill into her son the faith and moral principles that formed her own rule of life. In his latter years, Rembrandt often painted his mother, and in his pictures she usually appears with the Bible in her hand or close beside her for the passages she had read to him and the stories she recounted from her favourite book had made deep and vivid impressions on the child and in later life, 
he sought subjects for his works mainly in the sacred writings. At 14 or 15, Rembrandt studied Latin literature for a short time at the University of Leiden, whither he was sent by his parents so that he might prepare to serve the state by his knowledge. After leaving the university, Rembrandt entered the studio of the artist Van Swanenberg, where, however, during his three years' apprenticeship, he learned little beside the first principles of his art. Before his eighteenth year, he had entered Last Man's Studio in Amsterdam. 3. School Standing and Progress Rembrandt proved but an unwilling scholar, for the lines of Virgil and Ovid were lifeless to him in comparison with those of Lucas and Leiden and so his parents finally gave up the effort to make a statesman of him and consented to apprentice him to a painter. His vocation was so pronounced that directly he was permitted to give up all his time to his art, he made astonishing progress. 4. Friends and Associates In Lastman's house, Rembrandt was doubtless brought to contact with famous artists and other persons of distinction. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of Precocity. C. 2.3. AIIQ 110. Relative coefficient of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After a few months with Last Man, Rembrandt returned at the age of 18 to Leiden, determined to study and practice painting alone in his own fashion. His first extant work, St. Paul Imprisoned, which appeared when he was 21, is compared with his later productions, a mediocre work but it nonetheless reveals certain evidences of a great artist's power of careful observation. A second picture belongs to the same year. At 22, Rembrandt was executing works of remarkable excellence. The Gotha portrait of himself, two other well-known paintings, many etchings and a tiny picture on copper probably date from this year, and the young artist had become a master painter, for it was then that he took his first pupil. Inspired by a passionate devotion to his art, he studied with such ardour that he never left his father's house as long as daylight lasted. Between his 23rd and his 27th year, he showed rapid development in the quality of his art, while in quantity, the work he produced is remarkable. In addition to numerous paintings and engravings, he executed some 84 etchings, including no less than 20 etched portraits of himself. At 25, Rembrandt went to live in Amsterdam, where his work was attracting much attention. And now, at one bound, he leaped into the position of first portrait painter of the city. AII IQ 135, relative coefficient of data 0.43. Albrecht Erisbius von Wallenstein, or Wallenstein, or Wallenstein, 1583-1634, Duke of Friedland, Mecklenburg, and Sagan, a celebrated Austrian general. AI IQ 110. AIIIQ 115 1. Family Standing Wallenstein's family were of German origin and had for generations been active in the political development of Bohemia. Though noble and numerous, they appear to have been poor. The father received from his wife, a baroness of Smiriki, all the moderate fortune he possessed. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests at seven, and perhaps later also, the stubborn little Albrecht was averse to study, of ungovernable temper, and fond only of military games, which he always assumed the command over his companions. 2. Education As both parents were Protestants, the young Albrecht received the first rudiments of religious instruction in the same faith. But religious instruction did not produce docility in behaviour. The boy became quite early unmanageable, and his father, finding his own harsh methods unavailing, sent his son to the prince's school of Goldberg, where he was under the severe hand of Canton Fetcher. A little later, and after the death of both his parents, a maternal uncle sent him to the school of the Bohemian Brothers Society, patronised by the aristocracy of that region. It is stated by some authorities that the boy, aged twelve, was placed in the College of the Nobles, established by the Society of Jesuits at Ulmutz, and that at sixteen he entered the University of Altdorf, remaining there for seven months. 3. School Standing and Progress At Goldberg, wherever there was a wild prank to be played, Al Albrecht was in the lead. Games of war and rough play occupied him more than his books, and his teachers were finally forced to send the unimaginable youth back to his parents. 
but alas, his behaviour was no better at his next school, and here he earned the sobriquet, Der Tolle, the mad fellow. Finally, at Olmutz, his teachers discovered his talents, and being themselves ardent believers, converted him to the Catholic Church, an easy enough task in his case, since Albert was glad thus to win release from the study of Latin. His rowdy propensities were again in evidence during his attendance at the University of Altdorf, for after serving a short term in jail for damaging property, he was finally threatened with expulsion from the city as a result of his connivance in the escape of a friend who had committed a murder. Though at his petition he was reinstated, he soon left the city and started out at sixteen on his travels. 4. Friends and Associates An indulgent tutor in the school at Olmutz so won the boy's admiration that he afterwards spoke of the good Jesuit as a real founder of his fortune. Another priest, Father Pachtar, was a friend of his early youth, while a wealthy young nobleman, Lord Leek of Reisenstein, was the companion with whom he set out at the age of sixteen. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production or achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity. When his mother punished him, Albrecht, aged seven, cried out, If I were only a prince, so I would not have to be punished. On another occasion, being sharply rebuked by an uncle for speaking more in the tone of a prince than of a gentleman's son, he replied with great fire and quickness, If I am not a prince, I may yet live to become one. AI IQ 110. Relived coefficient of data 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. The period from his 17th to 22nd year, Wallenstein spent in travel through Europe, with a considerable soldier in Italy, where he devoted much attention to the study of military arts and astrology. Returning, he entered the army in a humble capacity at the age of 22, received shortly, at the siege of Grau, the command of a troop of infantry, and within the year was promoted major. After a few months later, he had settled down on his estate in Moravia, and here he continued to live in uneventful life for some ten years. AII IQ 115. Relative coefficient of data 0.11. Pierre Jean de Beranger, 1780-1857. A French lyric poet. AII IQ 115. AII IQ 130. 1. Family standing. The grandfather and father of Beranger, although they both aspired to be thought of noble blood, were really of very humble station. The former was an innkeeper, and the latter, after some years of service as a lawyer's clerk in the provinces, became first a bookkeeper in a Paris grocery store, and later a small banker. Beranger's mother, also of lowly extraction, worked in a shop before her marriage, and afterward, when deserted by her husband, supported herself by dressmaking. Her father, a tailor, and her mother appear to have had considerable fondness for reading. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As a child, Beranger cared little for school. His greatest delight was to stay noiselessly in a corner, making cutwork designs or small baskets from cherry pits, an occupation which engaged his attention for days and aroused the admiration of his relatives. He showed considerable talent for drawing, but this was not developed owing to the expense that training would involve. Growing up in the midst of the revolution, the boy acquired a lively interest in politics, and at twelve he became the president and official speechmaker of a Republican club, composed of schoolboys. At the age of fifteen, young Berenjo was given a position in a bank which his father had started, and here he became a very clever financier. 2. Education but Andrew's education was slow and irregular. From the age of three until he was nine, he lived chiefly with his maternal grandparents, and as he was sickly and spoiled, he was not sent to school until he had passed the usual age for entrance. He says, I never gained a love for school. On occasional visits to his mother in Paris, he delighted in the theatres, the balls, and the parties in the country to which she took him. In the city, as he says, I listened much and said little. I learned many things, but I did not learn to read. The father, who had been absent from home for some time, reappeared when the boy was nine and arranged to send his son to a boarding school in the suburbs. There I saw the taking of the Bastille from the roof of the house. It is practically the only thing I learned there, for I do not recall that anyone ever gave me any lessons in reading and writing. How did I learn to read? I have never been able to decide. 
Before the end of the year, the boy was removed from school and sent to live at Peron with his paternal aunt, who taught him to read from the works of Racine and Voltaire, whom she greatly admired. By a system of practical application, she taught him morality and citizenship, and she gave him religious instruction, but the last named is said to have had no great effect. Later, an old schoolmaster taught the boy to write and calculate with greater precision than he had been able to acquire by himself. In his thirteenth year, the boy was enrolled for a short time in a free primary school organised on the principles of Russell. This, says Beranger, completed my studies. My aunt had not the means to give me more education, and besides the college at Peron had been closed. At thirteen, he was put to work in a publishing house, where he remained two years. 3. School standing in progress. According to his own account, Beranger never excelled in his studies. He took no prizes except one, and that was for good conduct. 4. Friends and associates. The child passed his early years boarding about with various relatives. In his tenth year, he associated at school with two brothers named Gramont, the younger his dearest friend, the older his most implacable enemy. At the publishing house, where he was apprenticed, aged thirteen and fourteen, the publisher's son became his friend, and it was he who taught the future poet the rules of versification. 5. Reading. At the age of nine, Beranger had already read the Henriade and a translation by Meribord of the Jerusalem delivered. The letter had been given him by an uncle, who hoped that he might, from his intellectual stimulus, acquire tasteful books. Beranger wrote of the period before he was nine, although I knew almost by heart two epic poems, I knew how to read only with my eyes, and could not join two syllables aloud, as I have never been taught the value of consonants. See also two, two. 6. Production and Achievement At twelve, Beranger began to write poetry, but as he had never been taught the principles of versification, he simply traced rhymed lines, some good, others bad, but of the same length, thanks to two penciled lines drawn from the top to the bottom of the page. 7. Evidences of Precocity In his childhood, Barango was in some respects advanced, in others strangely backward. When at eleven he was being prepared for his first communion, he was unable to learn by heart the Latin of the church services, and the priest, in spite of the rules, had to let him say his prayers in French. On one occasion, attempting to serve as altar boy, he mixed the responses and paid so little attention to what he was doing that the priest dismissed him in disgust. At the same time, he possessed, from a very early age, great manual dexterity. Before he was nine, he had memorized two long epic poems, and a little later he became intensely interested in politics. At fifteen, he went to work in his father's bank, and was soon noted for his skill in business. The science of calculation developed suddenly in me, he wrote, without my learning the regular rules. In all my work, I have invented my own procedure, and I got so I could do calculations in my head with marvellous rapidity. See also 2, 1 and 2. AIIQ 115, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. From the age of 17, Beranger bore almost the whole responsibility of the family business. At this time, his father predicted for him a great financial career, for he had already achieved phenomenal success. But when the general collapse of the year 1798 occurred, the business failed. Young Beranger sought consolation in poetry. He studied versification, language, and poetical forms. He outlined an epic poem. In his father's circulating library, he devoured the works of the newer writers. To live alone, to write verses at my ease, that seemed happiness to me. Before he was twenty-four, he had produced numerous political satires, odes, ideals, comedies and epic poems. Brilliant young men of literary and artistic talents had become his associates. Lucien Bonaparte, to whom he had addressed two poems, became interested in him, obtained a pension for him, and encouraged him in his writing. At twenty-five, having secured a modest employment which satisfied his desire to assist his family, Beranger was free to devote a large part of his time to his literary interests and activities. But it was not until he was thirty-two that he began the song-writing which brought him immediate fame. AIIIQ 130, Relative Caution of Data, 0.53 Jean-Baptiste Jules Bernadotte 
1763 to 1844. Charles fourteen, King of Sweden. King of Sweden and Norway, 1818-44, French General, etc. AI IQ 115, AI IQ 120. 1. Family Standing Bernadotte's father, although descended from the lesser nobility, was by profession a lawyer of high standing in his community. The mother, not herself of noble birth, was connected with the nobility of the neighbourhood. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests From the first, Bernadotte manifested more interest in an active, adventurous life than the law studies for which his father had destined him. As a boy, his favourite resort was the post house, and his chief delight was to be allowed to ride the post horse as postillion. It is not, however, to be inferred from this that he showed any tendency to participate in low life, for his character was mainly brave and combative. 2. Education According to a well-founded tradition, Bernadotte was educated by the Benedictines at the Lycée at Pau. At the age of 14, he became a law student and apprentice, with the intention of employing his natural witness, presence of mind, and spontaneous eloquence in following his father's profession. The death of the latter, when Bernadotte was 17, frustrated this plan. 3. School standing and progress. No specific record. 4. Friends and associates. No specific record is preserved of friends and associates other than members of his family, but see 2, 1. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of precocity. No specific record. AIIQ 115. Relative quotient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Fearing to become a burden to his family if he continued to pursue the law course he had outlined, Bernadotte, without his mother's knowledge, enlisted in the army and entered upon a period of service on the Mediterranean coast. After service in various garrisons, he received in 19 his first proclamation to the rank of grenadier. During a prolonged furlough and visit at home, his family attempted to persuade him to give up a career of arms, but in vain. For Bernadotte returned at 22 to his regiment, and before his 26 had been promoted successfully to the ranks of corporal, sergeant, quartermaster, and finally surgeon major. As a commoner, he was not eligible to a commission, but nonetheless he enjoyed the friendship of the officers, as he had already won their praise for his efficient service. AII IQ 120, relative quotient of data 0 0.20. Hernando Cortez, 1485-1547. to 1547. A famous Spanish soldier, the conqueror of Mexico. AII IQ 115, AII IQ 120. 1. Family standing. Cortes was descended from an ancient and respectable family. His parents were in moderate circumstances. The father, a Christian gentleman, was a captain of infantry. The mother, a remarkable woman, possessed to an unusual degree all the feminine virtues. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. The youth of action was galled by the life of a student, especially that of a poor student. His taste was for arms and adventures. At sixteen he planned to enlist in the navy, but the mishap of falling from a wall which he was scaling in order to keep an appointment with a lady prevented his departure with the fleet. 2. Education. His father, perceiving in him unusual talents, natural quickness and sagacity, a certain degree of eloquence, and a prudent reserve superior to the use of youth, decided to educate him for the law. Accordingly, when the boy was fourteen, he was sent to the University of Salamanca, where he learned Latin and versification. 3. School standing and progress. At the university, Cortes proved himself in no way fitted for the career which his parents had chosen for him, and as a consequence of the irregularities into which he launched, he found himself involved in difficulties and threatened with expulsion. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. From the age of 14 and 15, Cortes learned to write good prose and even verse of some estimation. 7. Evidences of precocity. The biographers concur in noticing early evidences of ability in this youth who had, however, entered on life with a feeble constitution. AIIQ 115, relative quotient of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. 
Sailing to the Indies in 19, Cortes distinguished himself by his bravery during a stormy passage, and soon after his arrival in the new country, he gave a good account of himself in battle. At the close of the war, being then twenty, he was appointed notary of a new town and granted a large tract of land, where he spent the next five years engaged in the usual activities of a planter. AIIIQ 120 Relative quotient of data point two zero. Oliver Goldsmith, 1728 to 1774, a noted English poet, novelist, dramatist, and miscellaneous writer. AIIQ 115, AIIIQ 115. 1. Family Standing Goldsmith's father, the prototype of a number of characters in his son's works, was a typical descendant in the line of good hearted and utterly unworldly Irish folk. He was a Protestant clergyman with a most uncertain stipend while the mother is recorded only that she was the daughter of a schoolmaster. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. C. 2, 4, and 7. 2. Education. When Goldsmith was three years old, he began his education in a dame's school, conducted by a motherly village woman. At six, he was sent to the village school, kept by a retired quartermaster, one who was more apt to hold forth about the legends of fairies and of battles of war, than about the ordinary school subjects, thus delighting the imaginative Oliver. A little later, the boy was sent away to the excellent school of Mr. Griffin at Elfin, where he was introduced to the works of Ovid and Horace. From the age of eleven to thirteen, he attended a school of repute at Athlone, and from thirteen to fifteen, he studied under the Reverend Patrick Hughes, who was admitted to Trinity College at fifteen as a Caesar, or poor scholar. 3. School Standing and Progress Oliver's progress at the dame school was not distinguished. Never, said the good school mistress letter, was so dull a boy. He seemed impenetrably stupid. At the village school, his teacher apprenticed his poetic ability. But at Mr. Griffin's school, he was considered as a stupid, heavy blockhead, little better than a fool, whom everybody made fun of. His happiest school days must have been with Mr. Hughes, who penetrated his superficial obtuseness and recognised his morbidly sensitive nature. At college, little went well with Goldsmith in his student course. He had a menial position, a savage brute for tutor, and few inclinations to the study excitement. 4. Friends and Associates Oliver's schoolmates at Mr. Hughes' institution later recollected that the boy was diffident and backward at first, but later mustered boldness to take even the leader's place in sports, and they were certain to take part in any exploit or trick, either as actor or victim. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production or achievement. C. 2. 7. 7. Evidences of precocity. Although Oliver was thought dull at the dame school, he had, according to his sister, already exhibited signs of genius. At an age when he could scarcely write, in addition to showing great fondness for books and learning, he had distinguished himself by the habit of scribbling verses upon little scraps of paper which he then threw into the fire. On one occasion, a few of his efforts, rescued by his schoolmaster, so delighted Mrs. Goldsmith that she induced her husband to educate Oliver for a profession rather than for a trade, as had been planned. A little later, at nine, the boy achieved a considerable reputation for quick, witty repartee. When he was fourteen or fifteen, a practical joker, amused at the lad's schoolboy swagger, when journeying, directed him to a large private home instead of an inn. Here the boy issued orders with a lordly air to the host, who went to the spirit of the occasion and did not undeceive his guests until the following morning. AIIQ 115, relative coefficient of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After taking his BA degree, Goldsmith at 20 or 21 tried several employments in turn without success, returning home painless after each attempt. At 22, he went to Edinburgh to begin the study of medicine. There, however, the memory of his social qualities, his tale-telling, and his singing left a deeper impression than his devotion to study. At the end of 18 months, he went to Leiden to continue his medical course. But at the Dutch University, he acquired no more than an additional smattering of knowledge. AIIIQ 115, relative coefficient at a point six zero. Michel de la Hobardelle. 1505 to 1573, a noted French statesman. AIIQ 115, AIIIQ 135. 
one family standing. The hospital's father, the physician, trusted counsellor and companion in exile to the Duke of Bourbon, Constable of France, was a kind and affectionate parent who appears to have educated his children carefully. Nothing is known of the mother or of the maternal ancestry. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. For the hospital, no other than the scholastic interests are reported. To these he applied himself to Ardo when he was somewhat less than 18. 2. Education. When Mark was old enough, he was sent to study law at Toulouse. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 115. Relative coefficient data, 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After serving a prison sentence for a political offence, or perhaps for his father's political offence, the Hobbitor betook himself to the University of Padua, where he entered at the age of 21. There he spent six years, probably the happiest period of his life, in the study of painting and sculpture, and later law and philosophy. His associates were men of standing in the academic world. AIIQ 135 Relative coefficient of data, 0.43. Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546, a German reformer and translator of the Bible. AIIQ 115, AIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. Both of Luther's parents came of peasant stock. The father, a Thuringian peasant, went to the mining district of Mansfeld, where he leased first one mine and then three, and became an esteemed member of the community and one of four village councilmen. The mother was a worthy and a devout woman. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Luther enjoyed hymn singing in his first school. Indeed, this was the only pleasant memory he had of his earliest school years. Fondness for solitary contemplation developed in him, before he was fourteen, an enthusiasm for learning became intense when, between the ages of fourteen and seventeen, he was attending his third school. 2. Education Before he entered school, Luther had been disciplined at home by his strict and pious parents and by poverty. At home, and afterward at school, superstition and theological doctrine were an important part of his training. And though he was taught the words of the commandments by his mother, he remained in ignorance of their meaning. At the village school which he attended from the age of seven to eleven, and where he was taught by a brutal and ignorant master, he learned the three R's, a little Latin, very poorly taught, hymn singing and religion. With the son of the mine overseer, he was then sent on to an excellent school in Magdeburg. The promise of the industrious bright boy induced his father, whose circumstances, though not easy, were improving to continue his liberal education. After three years in Magdeburg, Young Martin was entered at a superior school in Eisenach, where he continued from 14 to 17. 3. School Standing and Progress In his first school, Luther, and apparently his schoolmates also, learned little. Progress in the second is not reported. In the third, whatever may have been his standing in the other subjects, his skill in Latin versification and orations developed so rapidly that he soon surpassed all others. 4. Friends and Associates The mine overseer's son was Luther's long-life friend. The teachers in his second school and the amiable scholar and master of the third school were friendly counsellors. See also 2.6. 5. Reading. No specific record. See 2.3. 6. Production and Achievement Luther, aged 12 or 13, tried his hand for a short time at his father's occupation, mining, but without success. He supported himself at school in Magdeburg in the regularly accepted manner, by begging and singing, until at the age of fourteen he was informally adopted by the lady, Frau Cotta, who had taken a fancy to him. 7. Evidences of Precocity No specific account, but C. 2.2 AIIQ 115 Relative quotient of data, 0.11 3. Development from 17 to 26 Luther progressed so rapidly that at 17 he could enter the University of Erfurt, the greatest of the German universities of that day. He won many friends in the university, but he did not neglect study. 
advancing to the bachelor's degree at the end of his first year, as 39th in a class of 57. He attended lectures, read voluminously, and took active part in hair-splitting disputations. Among his companions he was known as a philosopher, and before long his philosophical attainments were the admiration of teachers and students alike, many of whom believed that he would live to be a great man. At the age of 19 or 20, Luther first came upon a complete Bible, and its contents impressed and delighted him. Melanchthon states that young Martin was already much talked of when at 20 he took the Master of Arts degree as second at a class of 17. After a few weeks' study of the law, which he found distasteful, Luther, now twenty-one, in fulfilment of a vow, but contrary to his father's wishes, gave up university life and entered a monastery. After four years of sincere struggle with himself in his desire to enter truly into the duties and obligations of the monastic life, he accepted ordination at twenty-four. At twenty-five, he was appointed professor of philosophy in the University of Wittenberg, and was awarded the bachelor's degree in theology at the same time. But the latter honour he was unable to accept, as his vows did not permit him to pay the necessary fee. AII IQ 145, relative quotient data, 0.43. Joachim Morat, 1767-1815, a French marshal, king of Naples. AII IQ 115, AII IQ 120. 1. Family Standing Both the Murat's parents belonged to the better class of country folk. The father was a prosperous village innkeeper and postman, the agent of the wealthy district landowners. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education As youngest son destined for the church, Murat was sent at 10 to the K-Horse Preparatory School and thence to the Toulouse Seminary, where he studied theology and philosophy. 3. School standing and progress. At the age of 10, Morat received a scholarship at the College of Cohors. He did sufficiently well to be sent on from the college to the Archiepiscopal Seminary of Toulouse. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 115. Relative coefficient of data, 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 20, after several years in attendance at the Archiepiscopal Seminary of Toulouse, Morat, who loved action and had a little desire for life in the church, left his studies without consent of his family and enlisted in a cavalry regiment. During the next two years, the young novice turned soldier won rapid promotion. At 22, he was quartermaster sergeant, but he was as fractious a military man as he had been student and at 23 he was dismissed from the army for insubordination. At 24, on the outbreak of the revolution, Murat again enlisted, and this time reached the rank of sub-lieutenant. Soon after, he resigned because of dissatisfaction with royalist intrigue, but he re-enlisted in his old regiment a few months later, and rose to the rank of lieutenant before the end of the year. AII IQ 120, relative caution data, 0.43. Jacques Necker 1732 to 1804, a French statesman and financier. AI IQ 115, AI IQ 120. 1. Family standing. Necker's father, a Prussian by birth, was a professor of law in the University of Geneva. He published some works on international law and also wrote on religious and economic questions. There was no information about the mother. Necker's only child was Madame de Stael. See page 618, the celebrated French writer. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education, no record. 3. School standing, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. At the age of 15, Necker went alone to Paris with a very limited fortune, which his parents desired him to enlarge in commerce. He began his life in the metropolis as a bank clerk to M. Tillerson and from that time onward he supported himself. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AI IQ 115, relative quotient of data, 0.00. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Nerga became M. Tillerson's partner, and by the time he had entered upon his 30th year, he had built up a fortune that surpassed that of the first city bankers. 
AII IQ 120, relative coefficient of data 0.11. Nicolas Jean de Dussault, 1769 to 1851, a French marshal. AII IQ 115, AII IQ 130. 1. Family standing. Salt's father was a notary. No further information is found regarding any of the family. 2. Development to age 17. Interests. Salt showed little inclination for the law, and his father allowed him to choose his own career. 2. Education. He was fairly well educated by 16 and was intended for the bar. 3. School standing and progress. No record. 4. Friends and associates. No further record. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. At 16, Salt enlisted as a private in the French infantry, where he distinguished himself by his skill and bravery. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ 115. Relative coefficient of data. 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After six years, aged 16 and 22, of service in the French infantry, Salt's superior education ensured his promotion to the rank of sergeant. At 22, he became instructor of the 1st Battalion of Volunteers of the Bas Rhin. At 23, he was named by acclamation adjutant major, and the following year as captain. The same year, he distinguished himself in battle and was made major and entrusted with the task of organising a division of infantry. At 25, he received the grade of Chief de Battalion from Jordan, and a month later, of Chief de Brigade Adjutant General. Before his 26, he was promoted General of Brigade. AII IQ 130, relative coverage of data 0 0.20. Emanuel Swedenborg, 1688 to 1772, a celebrated Swedish philosopher and theosophist, founder of the New Church. AII IQ 115. AII IQ 145. 1. Family standing. On the paternal side, Emmanuel was descended from a prosperous family whose interests were devoutly religious. The father was a noted Christian reformer who was appointed, through the king's influence, to a professorship of theology at Uppsala. He was later made Bishop of Skara and his family ennobled. The mother was of good family, the daughter of an assessor in the College of Mines. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Swedenborg is quoted as saying, From my fourth to my tenth year, I was constantly engaged in the thought upon God, salvation, and the spiritual experiences of men. 2. Education. No record has been found of Emmanuel's early education. It is believed that he must have received his schooling in Uppsala, and that he entered upon his academic studies when about 15 years of age. 3. School standing and progress. No record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity. Swedenborg wrote of his childhood, Several times I have revealed things at which my father and mother wondered, saying that angels must be speaking through me. On my sixth to my twelfth year, I used to delight in conversing with clergymen about faith, saying that the life of faith is love, and the love which imparts life is love to the neighbour. Also, that God gives faith to everyone, and that those only receive it who practice that love. See also 2 1. AI IQ 115, relative quotient of data 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Young Swedenborg concluded his academic studies at Psala at the age of 21 by writing a thesis containing selected sentences from Seneca and Holy Writ accompanied by apposite reflections. This careful study was published in the same year, as was also a version in Latin verse of his father's paraphrase of the twelfth chapter of Ecclesiastes. Emmanuel received the PhD degree at Uppsala when he was 22, and he published some Latin verses the same year. Between the ages of 22 and 26, he travelled and studied in Europe, acquired a knowledge of the technic and numerous trades which he thought would be useful to him as a scientist, and devised as many as 14 mechanical inventions some which were later made available for public use. AIIQ 145, relative cost data 0.53. William Warburton, 1698-1779, an English prelate, theological controversialist and critic. AIIQ 115, AIIQ 130. 1. Family standing. Warburton was a member of an ancient and well-known family. 
His father was an attorney esteemed for high integrity, and his mother was a woman of more virtues than are generally possessed by whole families throughout the whole course of their existence. 2. Development rate 17. 1. Interests. See 2, 5, and 6. 2. Education. William first attended school in Newark under Mr. Twells, but the chief part of his education was received thereafter at Oakenham. Next he attended the local town school for a few months, under a cousin who had become its headmaster. Apparently, in his various schools, the boy received a thorough training in Greek and Latin. 3. School Studies and Progress Walton's first master was later quoted to the effect that he had always considered this youth the dullest of all dull scholars. There is no evidence to show that the boy ever distinguished himself in his school work. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading As a clerk to an attorney, Warburton, aged 15 to 20, found means to pursue again and digest such of the classic authors as he had read at school, with many others which he understood to be in repute with men of learning and judgment. 6. Production and Achievement During his clerkship, he found time, in addition to his duties in general reading, to work upon other elementary studies, so that by the time his clerkship was out, he had laid the foundation of, as well as acquired a taste for general knowledge. 7. Evidences of Precocity Anecdotes are told of his absorption in his studies in early years, which led his companions to take him for a fool, and enabled him to ride past a house on fire without noticing it. See also 2.6. AI IQ 115 Relative quotient of data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Released from his clerkship at 20, Warburton expressed desire to go into the church rather than into the study of law, and his cousin, headmaster of the school at Newark, furthered this wish by devoting all the time he could spare from regular and school duties to helping his relative in his preparation for holy orders. At 25, the young man was ordained deacon in the Cathedral of York, and in the same year he published a book of miscellaneous translations from the Latin, a volume, however, which he tried afterwards to suppress, perhaps because of its display of poor scholarship. AII IQ 130, relative coast of data 0.43. End of section 16. Section 17 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2. The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 16. Cases rated at AIIQ 120 to 130. Part 1. John Adams, 1735 to 1826, second President of the United States. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. The Adams family, numerous in Massachusetts, included worthy and upright town officials, brewers, preachers, teachers, and virtuous independent New England farmers. The great-grandfather and grandfather John Adams were Harvard graduates, while the father was a farmer of little formal education, but much esteemed and beloved in his somewhat limited sphere of influence as deacon of the church, select men of the town, and officer in the local militia. The mother was the daughter of a Brookline citizen of somewhat higher social standing than her husband. 2. Development 2017 1. Interests. No specific record. 2. Education. When George Adams was prevailed upon, not without some urgent advice and solicitation, to prepare himself for college, his instruction was carried on so effectively by the minister of the local first congregational church that he was able to enter Harvard at the age of 16. 3. School standing and progress. At college, Adams was a distinguished member of a distinguished class, but it is not clear that his ability was especially noted during his first years of attendance. 4. Friends and associates. Adams' college associates were such men as Brown, subsequently governor of Bermuda, Wentworth, governor of New Hampshire before the Revolution, and afterward lieutenant governor of Nova Scotia, and Locke, later president of Harvard. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and achievement. No specific record. 7. Evidences of precocity. No specific record. AIIQ 120. Relative coefficient of data. 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. The three most able members of their Harvard class were 
Hemingway, later a distinguished divine, Locke, C. 2. 4, and John Adams. The inclination of the letter, aged 16 and 20, was already toward the law, but his judgment determined him at this time to choose the ministry. However, at 20, his success at a university commencement oration secured for him a position as Latin master in the Worcester Grammar School. During three years of school teaching, he applied himself with diligence to the study of law. He lived at this time in the home of a physician in whose library he read studiously, and thereafter with a lawyer whose excellent law tomes he as eagerly devoured. At twenty-three he was admitted to the bar, having made a very favourable impression when he appeared before the court. He then immediately entered upon the practice of the law, for which he was eminently fitted. AIIIQ 145, relative coefficient of data 0.75. Ali Willy Zaid, known as Ali Pasha the Lion, 1741-1822, an Albanian who became Pasha of Genia in 1788. AIIQ 120, AIIIQ 120. 1. Family standing. Ali was descended from Albanian stock, his grandfather having been a Pasha of high position and influence. His father, driven from his patrimony by two jealous brothers, became a successful robber chief. The chieftain's wife was the daughter of a local ruler of some importance. She was a woman of great ability and force of character, who successfully instructed her son in the conduct of war and intrigue. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Obstinate and indocile, Ali refused to learn to read and maltreated his teachers. Wild life of a mountaineer, rather than the studious arts, attracted the future bandit. 2. Education. Ali's education was chiefly in warfare, robbery, and pillage. At the age of 14, he was master of these arts. 3. School standing and progress. C. 2. 2. 4. Friends and associates. Ali's associates were his unscrupulous and ambitious parents, especially his mother, for his father died when he was 13. Now the youth whose spirits were like his own. 5. Reading. Lacking intellectual interests as he was, Ali yet recognised the importance of knowing about contemporary local history and of making a careful study of the records of past warfare. He therefore informed himself minutely of all that might have bearing on his future career. 6. Production and Achievement. When he was 15, his mother still governed as regent, but Ali had already found occasion to defend his inheritance by force of arms. Three or four times during the next years, the boys sought by bold attacks to retrieve the family reputation and influence, and as many times was completely routed. Seven evidences of precocity, no specific record. AIIQ 120, relative coefficient of data 0.00. 3. Development from 17 to 26. It is said that after many repulses of fortune, Ali at length won success by the aid of a considerable treasure which he discovered by chance. He took possession of all the passes about Tepelini, his native place, and was successful in these ravages over a wide district until finally brought to terms by the ruler, Kurd Pasha. The latter recognised Ali's ability, and seeing him a useful ally, refrained from putting him to death. Then he made him a district ruler, and thereafter the young man's influence and wealth rapidly increased. AIIIQ 120, relative quotient of data 0.11. Francis Serebi, 1662-1732, a noted English divine, politician and controversialist. AIIQ 120. AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing. Serebi's father and grandfather were rectors of the church, whose interests were probably not political, for they conformed to the requirements of the existing government, whatever it chanced to be. The father became chaplain to a young Duke of Gloucester, and three sermons from his pen appeared in print. Of the mother and the maternal ancestry, there is no record. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. Adapi entered the famous Westminster School at 11 years of age as a King's Scholar, and remained there until his 18th year. 3. School standing and progress, no specific record. 4. Friends and associates, no specific record. 5. Reading, no specific record. 6. Production and achievement, no specific record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no specific record. AIIQ 120, relative coast of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. 
At the age of 17, Atterby passed from his school at the head of a distinguished class which included as members a future lieutenant general and two future bishops. At college, he became a zealous and able student of mathematics and the classics, giving evidence of his ability in the latter field by publishing, at the age of 19, a Latin version of Dryden's Absalom and Achitophel. At 21, he received the B.A. degree, and he published the same year an anthology of Latin poems by Italian scholars. At 22, he became a moderator of the third class, and at 23, of the fourth or senior class. At 24, after receiving the M.A. degree, he was appointed Reader Rhetoric in Christ Church College, and his first controversial tracts, which appeared during the course of the same year, at once, by their masterly attack, put the contributions of his opponents completely in the shade. AIIIQ 150, Relative Coefficient Data, 0 0.60 John Jacob Berzelius 1779 to 1848, a celebrated Swedish chemist. AIIQ 120, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Brazilius's grandfather and his great grandfather were pastors. His father, who was a university MA and head of the College School at Linkumping, unfortunately for his son's happiness, died when the boy was only four years old. The mother was the daughter of a district judge and granddaughter of a noted church dignitary and patriot. Her second husband, Pastor Ekmar, an admirable character and an excellent teacher, cared for the early upbringing of his stepson. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Nature study was fostered by Berzelius's stepfather, who made out-of-door excursions the occasion of careful observation and study. Between the age of 8 to 12, the little boy learned to collect and arrange the flora of his native heath and botanical excursions early began to absorb his time. The youth was first conscious of the pleasures of study when he found intellectual pursuits a solace during a period of anxiety and hardship. At the age of 16, while holding his first post as tutor, Brazilius was interested, with a former teacher, in the study of entomology. A little later, he determined, under his teacher's advice, to give up the study of theology which he had previously chosen, and devote himself to the study of medicine for it is clear that he possessed special scientific gifts and that a medical career would afford him an opportunity for research in which he had become intensely interested. Of his character, a youthful friend stated, a more virtuous youth than Berzelius had seldom ever left a school. 2. Education Berzelius's earliest instruction was received from his stepfather, but after his own mother's death and the third marriage of the stepfather, the boy and his sister became members of an uncle's household, where the two additional mouths were not welcome. John Jacob entered the gymnasium of Linkopig at 13, after receiving instruction from various elementary teachers. He decided at this time to enter the ministry, thus following the family tradition. Shortly before his 17th birthday, he entered the university. 3. School Standing and Progress At the gymnasium, the limitations of Berzelius's earlier training were apparent. Still, he did not care to make good by extra study early deficiencies in subjects for which he felt little or no interest. His indifference to classical studies was expressed in carelessness. As a result, only one teacher, Hornstedt, the instructor in natural history, had a good opinion of him. But Berzelius was the declared favourite of this one. Because of the single emphasis in his study, the boys' teachers became impatient, and when the accidental discharge of his gun gave them the opportunity to express their general disapproval, they voiced it in a public sentence of disgrace. Fortunately, this was later ameliorated through Hornstead's influence. Brazilius's last school certificate expressed his teacher's opinion that happy natural abilities were united in him with less admirable manners, and stated further that the future of this youth must be regarded as doubtful. However, the bishop's judgment, based perhaps on Hornstead's opinion, was stated to Berzerius at this time as follows. You have neglected much at the gymnasium, but I know that you have not wasted time. Go on as you have begun, and one day you will be a useful citizen. 4. Friends and Associates Berzerius's first teacher of natural science remained always his congenial friend. Another friend's report of the boy's character, C2-2, indicates the respect in which he was held. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and achievement. At 15 or 16, Brazilius sought and obtained a position as house tutor 
to the sons of a country gentleman, whose pupils were older than the, their teacher and more interested in agriculture than in science. Before he was seventeen, Brasilius had made by hand a copy of a work of Linnaeus because he could not afford to purchase the printed version. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AI IQ 120. Relative quotient of data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Brasilius entered the university where he studied medicine and chemistry, but his labours were frequently interrupted by the necessity of earning enough to pay his expenses. As a means to a livelihood, he studied pharmacy, assisted a noted physician in his practice, and learned the mysteries of fine glass blowing. But always he carried on research, and at 19 he was engaged on an original study. Three little chemical investigations written at 21 antedated Davy's work on the same problem, though unfortunately for the Northern Scholar they did not appear in print until after the publication of the English report. Brasilius was admitted to the final university examinations at 22, although his thesis had been presented in Swedish instead of the customary Latin. At 24, the young scientist received the degree of MD. From the age of 22 to 27, he was a member of the Stockholm Medical School. At 22, as fellow and lecturer, and at 24 and 25, as acting professor. In addition to his university duties, he served also as assistant physician. AII IQ 140 Relative coast of data, 0 0.60. Richard Cobden, 1804 to 1865, an English statesman, orator, and economist. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 120. 1. Family standing. Cobden's ancestors were yeomen of the soil, but at least two of them were members of parliament in the 14th century. Grandfather was a bailiff, a master, and a farmer. The father was a small farmer of soft and affectionate disposition, wholly without the energy of affairs, and financially unsuccessful. The mother was endowed with native sense, shrewdness, and force of mind. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. In his playtime, little Richard was fond of watching his father's sheep. At 15 or 16, while he was acting as clerk in his uncle's warehouse, he studied French in the early mornings. This was disproved of by his uncle and aunt, with whom he lived, who regarded his fondness for book knowledge as an evil omen for a youth who was to follow a business career. 2. Education Cobden's first tuition was received at a dame's school at Midhurst when he learned to read and write. Following this, and before he was ten, he began to attend the grammar school. From the age of ten to fifteen, he was sent by an uncle to a school in Yorkshire where, according to his own report, he was ill-fed, ill-taught, and ill-used. 3. School standing and progress. Colton was said to be open-hearted, unassuming, steady and diligent, but less quick than Frederick, his older brother. At school he showed no turn for classical acquirements, but he far surpassed his class fellows in geography, a study in which he was much interested. 4. Friends and associates. None are mentioned except members of the family and teachers. 5. Reading. C2, 1 and 3. 6. Production and achievement. At fifteen or sixteen, Cobden became a clerk in his uncle's warehouse in Old Change. Seven. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ one hundred twenty. Relative quotient of data point five three. Three. Development from seventeen to twenty six. At the age of eighteen, Cobden was offered a situation in a Ghent business house, but he refused it to remain in his uncle's business in England. At twenty, he had begun to assist in the support of his younger brothers. At twenty-one, he was promoted in the family business, and at twenty-four, teamed with projects, he borrowed capital and entered business on his own account, prospered in his management of the new enterprise. AII IQ 120, relative quotient data, 0.20. Thomas Cranmer, 1489 to 1556, Archbishop of Canterbury. AII IQ 120. AII IQ 130. 1. Family Standing. Cranmer's father, a man of moderate means, was a member of an ancient family of the English gentry. The mother belonged to a country family of some standing. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. C. 2. 2. 2. Education. At home, under his father's happy tuition, Cranmer learned the gentlemanly arts associated with the hunt. 
Unfortunately, the boy's first teacher in the formal school subjects was tyrannous and brutal, a master who appalled, dulled, and daunted the tender and fine wits of his scholars. At fourteen, Cranmer entered Cambridge, and there he remained as fellow, preacher, and lecturer until he was called to the court at the age of forty. It is said that from his fifteenth to his twenty-third year, he lost his time studying the dry bones of scholasticism. 3. School standing and progress. C. 2. 2. 4. Friends and associates. No record. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Progress and achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ 120. Relief quotient data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 22, Cranmer became Bachelor of Arts and was elected a fellow at Jesus College. From this we may conclude that he pursued the theological course, for it was required of the fellows. AII IQ 130, relative quotient data 0.20. Daniel Defoe, 1659 or 601731. English novelist and political writer. AI IQ 120, AII IQ 125. 1. Family standing. Defoe's father, a London butcher, a nonconformist, was prosperous enough to give his son the best education then open to dissenters. Of the mother, it is recorded only that when her son used to say to her, If you vex me, I'll eat no dinner, she taught him to be wiser by letting him wait until he was hungry. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Even as a boy, Daniel is said to have discovered that spirit of independence which terminated in an uncomfortable love of liberty. 2. Education. No record is preserved of Defoe's earliest education. From perhaps his 15th to his 20th year, he studied in preparation for the ministry in the Nonconformist Academy at Newington Green, where, although the tutors were hampered by want of public libraries and suitable authority for maintaining discipline, they nevertheless gave adequate instruction in languages, logic, rhetoric, mathematics, philosophy, divinity, and the sciences. 3. School standing and progress. From the evidences in Defoe's later writings, it may be inferred that he attained in his youth some mastery of five languages and made progress in science. He is further credited with having been a well-versed student of history. 4. Friends and associates. No record. 5. Reading. Defoe knew the scriptures from childhood. Other reading is not reported. 6. Production or achievement. During the Popery Scare, when the people copied their Bibles for fear of having them confiscated, Daniel, aged about thirteen, worked like a horse till he had written out the whole Pentateuch, where he grew so tired that he was willing to risk the rest. 7. Evidences of Precocity, no record. AIIQ 120, relative coefficient of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Between the age of 18 and 20, Defoe displayed an interest in politics, enlisting himself upon the popular side. His plan for a career was altered when, at twenty, abandoning the idea of entering the ministry, he became a clerk in the office of a hose factor in London. His undertakings prospered, and within three or four years he was in business for himself. It is uncertain whether he wrote anything sufficient during this period beyond the political essay entitled Appeal to Honour and Justice, which was prepared and perhaps published when its author was twenty-three. Defoe was married at 24, and it is thought that a year or two later he took some part in the movement to establish the claims of the Duke of Monmouth. AII IQ 125, relative quotient of data 0 0.20. Andre Marie Jean Jacques Dupin, 1783-1865, a French lawyer and politician. AII IQ 120, AII IQ 140. 1. Family Standing. A paternal grandfather of Dupin was a physician, a solid man who became mayor of his town, an uncle of the paternal grandmother, was physician in ordinary to the king, a man celebrated for scientific research and a member of the Academy of Sciences. Dupin's father was a lawyer and public official of considerable note. His mother, also a Dupin, was distinguished for her intelligence and energy. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. No information is available regarding Dupin up to the age of nine, when we find him in Paris with his mother while his father has been held as a suspect by the revolutionists. During her husband's enforced absence, 
Madame Dupin instructed her sons, utilizing the impressions caused by the opening of the revolution to awaken in their minds noble and generous sentiments, hatred of violence and tyranny, and the seeds of a good character. She read aloud to them Roland's ancient and modern history and Plutarch's lives. When Mr. Dupin was released, the family appears to have returned home, the father taking charge of his son's education himself, as the old schools had been suppressed and the new ones were not yet organized. Since André was destined for the law, he was put to work on Greek and Latin, and a little later on rhetoric. A system of selected readings was used, and without neglecting the classics, the older Dupin put his son through a course of French literature, especially emphasizing the works of Racine, Corniel, Boulau, Molière, and La Fontaine. The method required reading aloud, with rereading of the longer selections by the boy himself. Three school standing in progress, C two two. Four friends and associates, no record. Five reading, C two two. Dupin's memory was so good that he could recite the four cantos of Boileau's La Art Poétique without an error. He early formed the habit of making an abstract of everything he read, a practice which he continued for a long time. The care exercised by his father in training him is shown by the fact that until he was eighteen, Andre never read a single book which had not been put in his hands by his parent. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 120, relative quotient of data, point two zero. Three, Development from 17 to 26. After Dupin at 17 had already pleaded and won his first case, he went with his father to Paris and entered there the school of the Quatres Nations. Here he studied under the most distinguished teachers, among them Lagrange. The standard the young man had won is evidenced by the fact that when the Academy of Legislation was founded, it was Dupin who was chosen as a representative student from his district. He had in the meantime become the master clerk in the law office where he was employed, and when a little later the law schools were reopened, he received, aged 21, the degree of licentiate dated back two years to the time when he began to practice law. At 23, he achieved the doctorate, sustained the first thesis presented after the re-establishment of the law schools. During the same year, he published The Principles of Civil Law in five volumes. With all his other activities, his law practice was not neglected. On the contrary, it was increasing. AIIQ 140 Relative of of data, 0.53. David Glasgow Farragut, 1801-1870, a celebrated American admiral. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 120. 1. Family standing. Many of Farragut's paternal ancestors were high in the court and military councils of Majorca. The father was a restless man of adventurous spirit who immigrated to America at an early age. He served as an officer, now in the army, now in the navy, bought a farm near New Orleans, and after retiring from active service, continued to live there with his children after the death of his wife. The latter, descended from a good old Scottish family, was possessed of courage equal to the demands of the frontier life which she lived with her husband. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. It is clear that Glasgow early developed a taste for the adventurous and the unknown and this taste may have entered into his decision when Commander Porter, visiting the Farragut home, offered to adopt one of the children. For the boy, aged seven, although he said he was inspired in his reply by the uniform of the captain and by that of his brother William, who had received an appointment in the Navy some time before, was perhaps attracted also by adventure. In any case, he said promptly that he would go. Thereafter, as a member of the commander's household, young Farragut, occasionally accompanied his patron on excursions and boat expeditions, and soon became fond of this adventurous sort of life. When he learnt that the brig Fixen had been fired into by a British vessel of war, he was anxious to discharge the debt with interest, and it was said that this incident first aroused in him a prejudice against the British. As an eleven-year-old midshipman, Farragut was fond of climbing to the top of the mainmast and sitting there, curl-legged, gazing out to sea. He participated at one time with evident enjoyment in seal and sea lion hunting when his ship stopped at Charles Island. It was apparently not until he was sixteen that Farragut was first filled with a great desire for study. 2. Education The first reference to his formal education concerns his attendance at school 
while Commander Porter was absent in the capital. The lads spent another period in school, while the Porter family lived at Chester, Pennsylvania. Latter, in company with other midshipmen of his squadron, he attended classes during the winter of his eleventh year, and again when he was twelve. At thirteen, he was instructed by one of Napoleon's former guards, whose method was to lecture without textbooks and to take his pupils on field trips to collect minerals and plants. 3. School study and progress. Farragut, at sixteen, was invited to spend nine months in Tunis, studying with the U.S. Consul Charles Folsom, under whose care he was taught French, Italian, English, literature, and mathematics. 4. Friends and Associates. Fellow midshipmen, who were companions of Farragut's boyhood, his latter associates were of many kinds and often cosmopolitan, during a stay at the Marquesas Islands, when he was twelve, he and the other lads attached to the ship were allowed to ramble about on shore in company with the native boys. During his visit in Tunis, with Folsom, he found the society of the foreign consuls very agreeable, and while on a journey to Pisa, at the same period he made many agreeable acquaintances among the Italian nobility and English tourists. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and Achievement. Through special arrangements made by the Secretary of the Navy, Farragut received a midshipman's warrant at the age of nine and a half. At ten, he had the responsibility of commanding a wherry's crew of seamen. He accompanied Porter on the Essex at eleven, and was then described as the life of the midshipman's mess, full of fun and as agile as a cat. During the War of 1812, which broke out just before he was eleven, he bore a gallant part in all the adventures of the Essex and showed nerve and resourcefulness in his manner of warning the commander in regard to a projected mutiny of prisoners. In a successful encounter with three whalers which occurred at this time, Farragut was in charge of one of the ship's boats, and at the age of twelve he performed the feat of commanding a captured ship to Valparaiso, asserting his authority successfully in a difference of opinion with the captain detailed to navigate the vessel. In the same year, on an expedition to a strange ship, he was sent along as Captain Downs' aide. He experienced his first battle at the age of twelve and three quarters, when the Essex defended herself against the combined attacks of a British sloop and frigate. His conduct on this occasion deserved, in the words of his commander, the promotion of which he was too young to be recommended. Following this encounter, Farragut spent some strenuous days as surgeon's assistant, taking care of men wounded in the battle. Then following many days of cruising, interrupted only by the nine months' visit at Tunis, when Farragut was sixteen. During his early years, the voluntary guardianship and influence of a kind, and many midshipmen preserved the boy from many of the temptations to which the midshipmen were exposed. 7. Evidences of Precocity C. 2, 1 and 6 The U.S. Consul at Tripoli wrote of Glasgow, aged six and a half to Mr. Folsom, if it will only apply to use for the purposes the talents with which he is so bountifully enriched. It must, with his admirable disposition and obliging manners, ensure him the respect and esteem of all who know him, and place him at some future period high in the niche of fame. AIIQ 120, relative kosher data, point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Fredericks' career from the age of seventeen onward, was notable because of the increasing responsibilities that were placed upon his young shoulders. Before the end of his nineteenth year, he received an acting lieutenancy, the duties of which he executed with discretion and ability. At twenty-three, the year of his marriage, he received promotion to an actual lieutenancy. At twenty-four and twenty-five, during a leave of absence from the Navy, and while he cared for his wife, now an invalid, he also attended lectures at Yale and organized a school for ship's boys. AII IQ 120, relative coast data, point four three. Henry Fielding, 1707 to 1754, English novelist and dramatist. AII IQ 120, AII IQ 135. 1. Family standing. Fielding's ancestors were from the nobility, and among them were several persons of considerable note. The maternal grandfather and grandmother were members of the landed aristocracy, Lady Mary Wortley Montagne. Easily the most intellectual woman of the period was Fielding's second cousin, while other members of the family were also known for their ability. Fielding's father was a brave military officer, but evidently a reckless gambler. About the mother, no information has been found. 2. 
Development to age 17. 1. Interests. No specific record, but C26. 2. Education. Fielding was prepared for Eton and Home by the Reverend Mr. Oliver, and he attended the famous public school from the age of 12 to 17 or 18. 3. School standing and progress. Henry is reported to have done especially good work at Eton, but because of interruptions in his residence, there he probably went no further than the sixth form. In the classics, he was notably distinguished, and it is reported of him that he gave evidence of strong and peculiar parts. 4. Friends and Associates. Schoolfellows of Fielding and Eton were William Pitt, afterward Lord Chatham, Charles Hanbury, known later as a diplomat and a wit, Lord Littleton, who became a statesman and orator, and Thomas Winnington, afterward a Whig of prominence. 5. Reading. During the Eton period, the Latin and Greek classics were Fielding's main reading. From childhood onward, he read the fiction, histories, and book of devotion common to country households of the period. Guy of Warwick, Argelus, and Parthenia, the seven champions of Christendom, he mentions especially, and the great favourite of his youth was the Chronicle of the Vikings of England. 6. Production and Achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of Precocity, no specific record. AIIQ 120, Relative Quotient of Data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 18, and soon after he left Eton, Fooding successfully carried out the romantic adventure of carrying off a 15-year-old heiress, the lady of his affections, but unfortunately, as it seemed to him at the time, he was not allowed to keep his prize. From his 20th to his 26th year, he lived a gay life, for the most part in London. He produced numerous satirical works in verse and in prose. Tom Thumb, published when its author was 23, took the town on its appearance, while ten comedies written by the young author between the ages of 23 and 25 were successfully produced in London theatres. AIIIQ 135, relative quotient of data 0.43. Giuseppe Garibaldi, 1807-1882, an Italian patriot and soldier. AIIQ 120, AIIIQ 125. 1. Family Standing The men of the Garibaldi family were merchant captains, sailors, and shipbuilders. Giuseppe's father, a merchant captain, a man of little education, valued formal training so highly that he gave his son a better education than his means could well afford. He always regretted his son's warlike pursuits. The mother was a gentle, pious soul. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests at the age of eight, Giuseppe saved a washerwoman from drowning in a deep ditch. At twelve, he saved several boys whose boat had capsized. Devoted to many outdoor sports, he was an especially ardent fisherman. He was also musical. He had a beautiful voice and was fond of singing. He knew all the songs of the sailors and peasants, and a good many French ones besides. His youthful kind-heartedness is attested by his weeping when the leg of a grasshopper was broken in his hands. So strong was young Garibaldi's inclination to go to sea, that at fifteen he could resist it no longer, and he persuaded some other lads to run away with him. The others were brought back, but Garibaldi was permitted to become a sailor. 2. Education Before the beginning of his sea career, Garibaldi was taught at home, first by two priests and later by a lay teacher who instructed him in Italian and the rudiments of Latin, writing, mathematics and Roman history. By himself he learned algebra, geometry, astronomy, geography, and commercial law, but perhaps this was during his life at sea, 15 and 25. 3. School standing and progress. No specific record. 4. Friends and associates. No specific record. 5. Reading. When he had a book that interested him, Garibaldi would lie for hours reading under an olive tree. He loved the works of Poscolo, the liberal poet of his own age and people. French he read almost as easily as Italian, and he enjoyed the works of Voltaire, and committed some of his verses to memory. 6. Production and Achievement At 15, Garibaldi began his sea career as cabin boy. 7. Evidences of Precocity No specific report. AIIQ 120 Relative coefficient of data 0.43 3. Development from 17 to 26 Garibaldi, cabin boy at 15, 
worked his way through the various ranks to a captaincy at twenty-four. During the Greek War of Independence, he sailed in the Levant on perilous trips full of adventure. It was significant for his future career that, at twenty-five, he was indoctrinated with saint Simonian revolutionary idealism by a group of French exiles. AIIIQ 125, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.43. Francesco Guciardini, 1483-1540, an Italian historian and statesman on the Pontifical Medicine Service. AIIQ 120, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. On the paternal side, Guciardini was descended from a family whose members often held diplomatic and other honourable state posts. The grandfather was a learned man as well as a great general, and the father, a famous lawyer and eloquent diplomat, was also a valiant officer. The mother was descended of an ancient and noble family. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. According to his own statement, Guciardini, when 15 years of age, cherished a desire to enter the church clearly not from religious motives nor from an inclination to lead an idle life, but because he thought that being young he might be in the way of obtaining rich preferments in the church with hopes some time or other to be made a cardinal. 2. Education In his sixteenth year he began to study the civil law, and the same year at Florence he heard the institutes. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Indications of precocity, no record. AIIQ 120. Relative coefficient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Garcia Dini states that at 22, he received his degree in the chapter of St. Lawrence, in the College of the Students of Pisa, and he adds that he chose to be doctor of the civil law only because he thought the canon of little importance. In the 23rd year of his age, he was appointed a professor of the institutes at Florence, with a competent salary for those days, and soon established such a character that he was consulted and preferred to all other lawyers, his contemporaries. At 24, he was chosen by many cities of the state for a standing counsellor. AIIIQ 140, Relative Coast of Data, 0.43. William Harvey, 1578-1657. English physician and physiologist and anatomist. AIIQ 120, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing It is possible that William Harvey was descended from Sir Walter Harvey, a distinguished mayor of London and original thinker of municipal government, for the coat of arms was the same. Be that as it may, William's father, an older man of Folkestone and mayor in 1600, seems to have been a man of more than ordinary intelligence and judgment. He was revered, consulted, and implicitly trusted by his sons. The mother was a tender parent, a careful housewife, and a good neighbour. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Harvey's choice of Caius College indicates that he was already, at the age of 16, destined for medicine, for Caius may be said to have introduced the study of practical anatomy into England. 2. Education. From the age of 10 to 15, William attended King's School, Canterbury, and at 16 he entered Cambridge as an ordinary student. 3. School standing and progress. At Cambridge, Harvey probably studied the usual subjects, classics, dialectics, and physics. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Indications of precocity, no record. AIIQ 120. Relative quotient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 19, Harvey received the BA degree from Cambridge. Not long after, he went to Padua University, at that time renowned for its anatomical school. Fabricius, surgeon, anatomist, and medical historian. Then he engaged in perfecting his knowledge of the valves of the veins, and undoubtedly Harvey learned anatomy under his instruction for the noted master and the pupil became fast friends. At the age of 24, Harvey received his diploma in medicine from Padua with the highest commendation, and in the same year he obtained the MD from Cambridge and admission to the College of Physicians, which held the licensing power in London. AIIIQ 150, 
relative quotient of data point four three. Franz Joseph Hayden, seventeen thirty two to eighteen o nine, a celebrated Austrian composer. AIIQ one hundred twenty, AIIQ one hundred forty. One family standing. Hayden's father followed the craft of many of his forebearers, that of wheelwright, but his chosen avocation was music. He had a fair tenor voice, and without knowing a note, he accompanied himself on the harp. Of the mother we know only that she was tender and affectionate, beloved of her son. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As soon as little Hayden was old enough to sing, he took part in the family musicals, astonishing even the home circle by the correctness of his ear and the sweetness of his voice. He imitated the handling of a violin bow with a little stick, which he drew back and forth over another one, thus accompanying his songs. In Vienna, Hayden, aged 8 to 18, worked on his music while the other boys were at their games. He was chiefly occupied with singing, which he regarded as of the utmost importance for a future composer, but he was also interested in composition, and every piece of paper that fell into his hands he covered with staves and struck them full of notes. Ritter, the Kapellmeister, laughed heartily on finding the boy writing a salve for twelve voices. Nevertheless, he recognised young Hayden's ability, for he advised him to write variations to his own liking on the pieces he heard in church, a practice which gave the boy fresh and original ideas, as well as the benefit of his teacher's corrections. Studying early and late, Hayden was happy. 2. Education At the age of six, and under the tuition of the cousin who had adopted him, Hayden learned the musical rudiments and studied other branches necessary to youth. He learned the nature of the ordinary instruments and could play upon most of them. When he was eight years old, he was pronounced by the court Kapellmeister sufficiently talented to enter the choir, and from eight to eighteen he served as a member of the select choir group. In addition to exercising his voice in frequent practice, he devoted himself to the study of the piano and violin under superior masters. But the general course of studies included only the scantiest instruction in religion, writing, ciphering, and Latin and even the singing was so poorly taught by the imperious and rather indifferent Kappelmeister that Hayden soon became practically his own teacher. 3. School Standing and Progress While a member of the Cathedral Choir in Vienna, Hayden worked from 16 to 18 hours daily, although only two hours' work was required. 4. Friends and Associates Hayden's teachers, his cousin Frank, and the Kappelmeister, Rutter, discovered his remarkable ability and gave him opportunities for developing it. No other friends or associates are specifically mentioned. 5. Reading. C. 2. 6. 6. Production and Achievement. When he was 13, Hayden wrote a church mass, which Reuter severely ridiculed, and the boy felt the justice of the criticism, for he knew that he lacked knowledge of counterpoint and of the rules of musical structure. Reuter, however, had given him only two lessons and did not care to bother further, nor did Hayden have the means to pay for additional tuition. Undismayed, the little musician bought books on the subject and dug it out for himself. Working alone and without a master, he made an infinite number of discoveries that were later the greatest value to him. This incident is ascribed by some writers to Hayden's twentieth year. 7. Evidences of Precocity a visiting relative observed Franz, before he was six, as he sat beating time with astonishing exactness and certainty. This relative, a schoolmaster and choir leader in another town, became so impressed by the child's possibilities that he offered to adopt him and undertake his musical education. Fortunately, the parents, having destined their son for the priesthood, were glad to avail themselves of this step toward what they hoped might be the accomplishment of their purpose. Even at the age of six, Hayden sang with confidence several masses in the church choir, and he could play a little on the piano and violin. Between six and eight, he learned in one lesson to play on the kettle drum, and thereafter he played that instrument in the orchestra. It was this practical demonstration of his ability that convinced his teacher that he was destined for a musical career. Until he was eight years old, Hayden devoted himself to vocal practice, undirected making astonishing progress. When his ninth year he was examined by the court Kappelmeister, he sang a cannon at sight with such precision and purity of tone that the older musician was greatly impressed, but the boy could not true. 
the Kappelmeister showed how this was done, whereupon, after one or two trials, Hayden trilled as if he had always known the trick. He was not then a complete master of any instrument, but he soon knew the quality and action of all of them. He was no mean pianist and singer, and he could play violin concertos. AIIQ 120, Relief Kofstetter, point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When in his 18th year, his voice failed, Hayden was dismissed from the choir of St. Stephen's. Refusing to conform to his parents' wish that he enter the church, he devoted the next eight years to the miserable task of earning a scant livelihood teaching music, while attempting to follow a severe course of musical self-education. In the meantime, he was producing minuets, falses, and other charming pieces, for which the publishers were reaping an income while the author was content to see his name in the bookseller's windows. When he was nineteen, his first opera score was presented successfully, and before he had reached his twenty-fourth year, his genius was quite generally recognised. It was stated that every one was in raptures over the eighteen string quartets which appeared before his twenty-six, but the composer himself was modest even to timidity and could not bring himself to believe that they were of any account. AII IQ 140 Relative coast of data, point five three. Ben Johnson, 1573-1637, a celebrated English dramatist. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Ben Johnson's grandfather was a gentleman in the service of King Henry VIII. His father suffered a long imprisonment under Queen Mary, but was deprived of his estate, became a grave minister of the gospel, and died before his son was born. Ben's mother was a woman of vigorous character, with much of the proud self-consciousness which marked her son. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests After a brief stay at college, the youth took up the craft of his stepfather, but he could not endure the occupation of a bricklayer, and so adopted military service as a means of escape. 2. Education when of a proper age, Ben was sent to a private school in the church of St. Martin in the Fields, and later to the famous Westminster School. There Camden, whose name is dear to literature, taught him to write in prose, and then diversify the matter thus digested. He also taught him Greek and Latin literature thoroughly. When in the uppermost form in the school, Ben was removed, age uncertain, he seems to have gone at once to Cambridge. His stay there was short, perhaps only a few weeks, and the granting of his M.A. was due to the favour of the university and not to his studies. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, C. 2. 1. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 120, relative coefficient of data, point two zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Young Johnson went to Flanders as a volunteer in the army, and returned with a smattering of Dutch and an empty purse. As long as he followed the profession of arms, he had not shamed by his actions. He tells about killing an enemy in the face of both the camps and taking Optima Spolia from him. His first play, Every Man in His Humour, was produced when the writer was 23 and was acted 11 times within six months. At 24, Johnson was listed as a player and a playwright, and was working on two plays. At 25, he worked over his first play, changing the scene of action. The work was then presented and well received. Shakespeare performed in it. Johnson was at this time joint author of a comedy, Hot Anger Soon Cold. The same year he killed another actor in a duel, was convicted of homicide, claimed benefit of the clergy, was dismissed, and forfeited his goods and chattels. While in prison, he was converted to Catholicism. AIIIQ 145, Relief Coefficient of Data, point four three. Antion de Lorette Lavoisier, 1743-1794, a celebrated French chemist and chief founder of modern chemistry. AIIQ 120, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing. Among Lavoisier's paternal ancestors were a rider of the king's horses, and a maitre de poste. The chemist's father, who was procureur or parliament in Paris, had a scientific bent of mind. 
The mother was a lawyer's daughter. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Lavoyer's first interest was in literature, and he dreamed of being a writer. Then after studying philosophy, he developed a decided taste for the sciences. 2. Education. At the age of five, Antoine lost his mother. He went with his father and sister to live with his grandmother and aunt, who appeared to have been wise as well as rich. The aunt, with whom an intelligent infection devoted herself to the children, and nothing was neglected which would contribute to the boy's education. Antony was sent to the Mazarin College, and while in attendance there, he lived with a family of honest people who developed in him sentiments of loyalty and justice and a love of work. 3. School Standing and Progress Lavoisier was full of enthusiasm for study and had numerous successes. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement. Antion outlined a prose drama entitled La Nouvelle Héloise, but wrote only the first scenes. He wrote essays on subjects assigned by the various academies of the province, of which two were as follows. Uprightness of character is as necessary in the search for truth as impartiality of the mind. And is the desire to perpetuate one's name and deeds in the memory of mankind compatible with nature and reason? 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 120, relative quotient of data, 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When leaving Mazarin, Lavoisier studied law, receiving the bachelor's degree at the age of 20, and been admitted to the bar the following year. At the same time, he studied mathematics and astronomy with the learned Abbe de la Cayle, botany with Bernard de Jesus, mineralogy and zoology with Getard, chemistry with Vuel, and also anatomy, unfortunately injuring his health by these many occupations. It was at this time he began to make barometric observations to discover the laws governing atmospheric movement. He became Goethe's assistant in mineralogy and for three years worked on soils. His first original work, at the age of 21, was a piece of research on different kinds of gypsum. The next year he competed for a prize offered for an essay on the best means of lighting the streets of a large city and receiving a special gold medal for the excellence of his work. He accompanied Guettard to Alsace and Lorraine, and took barometric and thermometric readings, made notes on the soil, and collected samples of minerals, etc. At the age of 25, he was elected to the Academy of Sciences. AIIIQ 150, relative coefficient of data 0 0.60. James Madison. 1751 to 1836, the fourth president of the United States. AIIQ 120, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. The Madisons were members of an old colonial family, independent landholders in comfortable circumstances. The father was a careful planter and patriotic citizen, accepting his public duties without aspiring to fame in them. The mother, the daughter of a planter, was held in great reverence by her family and relatives. She was noted for her pity. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. The elder of Madison resolved that his children should have advantages of education which had not been within his own reach. He prepared his son James of college, giving him first a regular school course and then a special training under a tutor, the clergyman in the parish, who lived as a member of the Madison household. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 120. Relative coefficient of data, 0 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 18, Madison entered Princeton, and during his first year there, he founded the American Whig Society. He graduated at 21, but remained at the university for another year studying, apparently, for the ministry. Returning to Virginia at 22, he continued his reading and study, devoting himself particularly to theology and Hebrew. He also tutored the younger children of the family. At 24, he was made chairman of the Orange County Committee of Safety and wrote his response to Patrick Henry's call, for the arming of a colonial militia. At 25, he was a delegate to the New Virginia Convention 
and became a member of the committee which drafted the state constitution. AIIIQ 135 Relative Coefficient of Data 0.43 Francois de Aubigny Francois de Aubigny de Maintenon 1635-1719 The second wife of Louis XIV AIIQ 120 AIIIQ 130 1. Family Standing Madame de Maintenon belonged to a family of position and reputation. Her paternal grandfather was an outstanding figure of his time, a reformer, a writer, and a friend and a companion in arms of Henry IV. Her father and only son, educated and talented in music and verse, was possessed of an immoral, vicious, and treacherous disposition. He was in prison for political offence at the time of his daughter's birth. The mother was a delicate woman, whom trouble had made somewhat severe and cold in manner. She was, however, devoted to the welfare of her children. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Francois was first a philanthropist, when, at seventeen years of age, or perhaps a little later, she accompanied her aunt on a rounds of mercy to the poor and sick. The child's early independence of mind is shown by her tenacity in clinging to the Protestant faith in which she had been reared by her aunt. It was only after years of instruction and exhortation that she was finally reconverted to Catholicism, the religion of her family. 2. Education the teaching she received in the Protestant home of Rand made a marked impression on the young mind of Francois de Aubigny, so much so that her mother, a devoted Catholic, took fright at the thought of the possible consequences and wished to place her daughter in a convent. The mother's desire being accomplished, although only after Francois had spent an unhappy interim in the home of a Catholic relative, the child lived quite contentedly at the Ursuline convent at Neurte. Later, however, at a convent of the same order in Paris, severe treatment made her most unhappy. At the age of fourteen, she visited again in the home of her Catholic relatives, sharing with a young daughter of the house the instructions of a friend of the family, the celebrated Chevalier de Mer, who had a fondness for forming the taste and the manners of charming young ladies. After her marriage at the age of sixteen to Paul Scarron, the noted burlesque poet, even then, a helpless cripple, and three times her age. Her education was perfected by her husband. With him she studied Latin, Spanish, and Italian, so that she could both read and write those languages. 3. School standing and progress. Before she was fifteen, the beauty and intelligence of Francois de Aubigny had already attracted attention. 4. Friends and associates. Francois appears to have been constant in her affections. The little daughter of the jailer of her father's prison was a childhood playmate whom she never forgot. C. 2. 7. While a very holy and learned man, whom she had admired in the convent, became her firm friend, and to him she continued to write weekly as long as she lived. Before she was sixteen, she met Scaron, who was to be her husband, and after her marriage it was her privilege to entertain the most witty and amiable people of Paris, writers and artists of distinction and courtiers of note. 5. Reading the only specific report of her reading states that, when mining the turkeys of her cousin, at the age of eleven or more, she was given a volume of Pieback's poetry, with orders to learn several pages before returning at the end of the day. 6. Production and Achievement Scarron, upon being shown a letter written to Francois in her middle teens, was astonished to find what an amount of wit and intelligence was possessed by the shy, blushing girl who had been brought to his house some time before. 7. Evidences of Precocity in after years, Madame de Maintenon pointed a moral in the story of her quarrel with the jailer's little daughter, who was her playmate before she was ten. She mocked at my poverty, I replied. You are rich, it is true, but you are not a young lady, and I am. AIIQ 120, relative coefficient of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After her marriage, Francois cared for her husband until his death eight years later. From the first, the young wife knew how to take a line of her own and to make herself respected. Her attractions made the salon of her little house in the Rue Marais even more crowded than formerly with visitors. Her influence was pronounced 
for her sake scarron cured himself of his habit of unlicensed conversation while her gracious yet dignified demeanour protected her from the advances of two ardent admirers after her husband's death when she was twenty-five madame scarron took lodgings in a convent where she lived for some time without however giving up association with her friends in the outside world a i i i q one hundred thirty relative coast of data point four three john churchill first duke of marlborough sixteen fifty to seventeen twenty two a famous english general and statesman a i i q one hundred twenty a i i i q one hundred twenty five one family standing john churchill belonged to a royalist family of note long settled in devonshire his father was well known as a statesman and an historian his mother, a clever but sharp-tongued woman, was the daughter of Sir John Drake, a cavalier. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As page to the Duke of York, young Churchill usually accompanied his patron upon military inspections. He evinced the most interest in these parades, and soon learned to answer quickly and clearly all questions concerning drill details. 2. Education. Churchill's father, a nurse student of history, was his son's earliest instructor. But at the age of twelve, the boy was attending the city free school in Dublin, an old foundation for some twenty children of poor freemen. And the following year, he entered St. Paul's School, where he remained until, at the age of fifteen, his school education was ended. 3. School Standing and Progress From the early instruction of his father, Churchill, drank in a love of England and a deep respect for its history, laws, and liberties, which influenced his whole subsequent career. Before leaving school, he had at least an elementary knowledge of Latin. When he further remembered that in early life he could converse fluently in French, we feel that when his enemies pronounced him to be grossly illiterate, they grossly maligned him. 4. Friends and Associates. No specific record. 5. Reading. John first learned the elements of the art of war from Knight's Life of Colette, which he read at school before he was 15. 6. Production and Achievement. In his sixteenth year, Churchill began his service as page to the Duke of York. 7. Indications of atrocity, no record. AIIQ 120, relative quotient of data, point two zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When Churchill was 17, the Duke of York was so pleased with his precocious military knowledge that he made him, at the boy's own request, an ensign. A little later, the popular youth wearied of court amusements, and went to Tangier in search of military adventure and distinctions. At twenty-two, however, he rejoined the household of his duke, and was sent out as captain of Grenadiers to join the French forces against Holland. At the siege of Maastricht, he distinguished himself by his courage and daring, attracting the attention of Louis the Fourteenth. He was promoted over the head of lieutenant of his own corps, and became the hero of the hour. Before he was twenty-four, he had been appointed successfully gentleman of the bedchamber, master of the robes, and lieutenant colonel, and before he was twenty-five, he was designated colonel. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data, point two zero. Johann Röcklin, 1455-1522, a celebrated German humanist. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing of Rooklin's parents, little is known except that they were reputable people, and that his father was bailiff or steward of a Dominican convent. The mother was very pious, and was revered by her son. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. During his boyhood, Rooklin attended the Latin school at Forsheim, where scholarly men maintained a good standard. At fifteen, he entered the University of Freiburg, at that time a youthful institution dominated by medieval tradition. 3. School standing and progress. Rieglin was sufficiently distinguished at school to be sent on to the university. There is chief progress made in Latin scholarship. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 120. Relative coefficient of data point two zero. Three, development from seventeen to twenty six. When he was nineteen, Rooklin served for a time as travelling tutor to a young prince. Then he entered upon the study of classical languages in the University of Paris under the celebrated teacher Johannes Lepide, who in 
whom he later followed to the newly founded University of Basel. He obtained the BA and MA degrees by the time he was 22, after publishing at 20 a Latin dictionary which showed promise amply to be fulfilled of his future erudition. He began to teach Latin and Greek at 22, but in the same year left his teaching to study law at the University of Orleans, where he received the degree of Bachelor of Civil Law at 24. At 26, he received the licentiate with special privileges. AII IQ 150, relative quotient data 0.60. Armand Jean du Plessis, Cardinal and Duce de Recaleo, 1585-1642, a celebrated French statesman. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing Recaleo's paternal ancestors had lived for generations in provincial obscurity. His father was captain of the guard. His mother, however, was the daughter of a celebrated advocate. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. While at the academy and before he was seventeen, Recalou acquired the military tastes that never deserted him. 2. Education. Between his sixth and his thirteenth year, he received a rudimentary education in the town of Recalou. At twelve, he was sent to Paris and admitted to the College of Navarre, and was later transferred to the academy, an institution where his sons of noble families received military training. 3. School standing and progress. At the College of Navarre, he went through the ordinary course of grammar and philosophy. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of recursity, no record. AIIQ 120. Relative coefficient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 and 26. At the age of 18, Raculo left the academy and returned to the university, thus taking the first step toward the fulfilment of his mother's wish that he become a bishop. At 21, he completed his theological course and took deacon's orders. At 22, he was admitted a member of the Sorbonne or Theological Faculty, and at 23, he accepted the bishopric of Lucon, although he preferred to remain in Paris. AII IQ 135, relative question data, 0.43. End of section 17. Section 18 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses, by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 16, Cases Rated at AIIQ 120 to 130, Part 2. Giacchino Antino Rossini. 1792 to 1868, a celebrated Italian operatic composer. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 130. 1. Family Standing. Rossini was descended from a family of some importance in earlier centuries, but the composer's father, who was characterized as lively and superstitious, held the humble positions of town trumpeter and inspector of slaughterhouses. He was an ardent Republican. The mother, a bread baker's daughter, was a handsome woman by nature serious, elevated, and sentimental. While her husband was in prison for a political offence, she became a prima donna buffer and sang in operas, fairs, and carnivals. She was joined in her release by her husband, who became first hornist of the troupe. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Rossini was a lazy little boy. He preferred doing nothing to any definite pursuit. Seeing his lack of interest in work, his father set him to blow the bellows in a blacksmith's shop, inviting his little playmates to jeer at him with the while. From his thirteenth year, Rossini's interest in music appears to have been aroused, and from this time, his one ambition was to become a writer of operas. 2. Education Rossini was brought up from his seventh year in frequent contact with musicians, although while his parents made musical tours, he was left with a pork butcher to be instructed in Latin. His teacher taught him nothing and the limits of his formal education are indicated by the statement that it was completed when two other instructors had taught him in the three R's. Rossini received his first musical lesson when he was seven years old, from a teacher who was both eccentric and lazy, and whom, when he taught his pupils at all, taught them to use but two fingers. At the age of twelve, the lad was taught singing and accompaniment to such good purpose that soon this youthful treble was in demand at the churches. Instruction in singing continued. 
In his sixteenth year, Rossini entered the Bologna Lyceum as a student of counterpoint under Metti, a pedant, one who could give no good reasons for what he taught. Through the interest of a friend, Rossini had already made the acquaintance of the German composers, in whom he recognized great masters, and whose manner he attempted to imitate. At this time Rossini's first definite ambition was still manifest, for in one day the teacher remarked that his class, who could not yet write sacred music, were complete in their knowledge of opera construction. The sixteen-year-old pupil departed abruptly, stating that he had then achieved his purpose. 3. School standing on progress. C. 2. 2. and 4. Rossini's education was almost entirely in music. 4. Friends and Associates For the most part, Rossini's associates were musicians, music teachers, and fellow students. An exception to the rule was an engineer, the Cavalier Gusti, who took an interest in the lad and read with him the masters of Italian literature. 5. Reading, C. 2. 4. 6. Production and Achievement While still very young, perhaps even before he was twelve, Rossini sometimes joined his parents in their musical excursions, playing the second horn when his father played the first. Between the ages of twelve and fourteen, Rossini sang in the churches, receiving small sums for his services. He worked hard with his treble, even singing transposed bass and tenor solos. On one occasion, he took the part of Adolfo Impeyer's Camellia at the Bologna Theatre. His principal source of income lay in teaching the opera singers their roles. Few of them could read music, and in playing the spinet at representations. When he was about fourteen, Rossini could execute the most difficult music at first sight and was able to act as musical director to a little provincial travelling company. At the age of fifteen, he conducted the monthly concerts of the Academia di Il Concordi. There were some murmurs at the appointment of one so young, but the lad's talent, his firmness, and his rigour soon made the grumblers obey and hold their tongues. It was perhaps during his sixteenth year that Rossini signalised his reign by a deed of daring. He rehearsed and presented Hayden's seasons, and his execution was said to have been so perfect that it excited the admiration of everybody. The date of this incident is uncertain. It may have occurred later, although the single best authority places it before Rossi was sixteen. At about the same time, Rossini began to appear as Maestro Al Cambello in the concerts in the various towns where his father played the horn. His ability was beginning to be noticed, and a member of a company of itinerant opera singers, impressed by his performance, gave him verses to set to music. The boy was flattered, and he did his best, quite unconscious that the verses were connected and formed a complete story. Thus, bit by bit, he composed the opera Demetrio e Polibio. Before he was sixteen, Rossini had mastered the art of singing in such fashion as to be able to teach its secrets to the best artists in Italy. He could reduce full scores to the keyboard at first sight. He was a finished accompanist. He had composed by instinct little duets for two horns, a number of pieces for the voice and pianoforte, and an opera without having learned a rule of counterpoint. He was an accomplished pianist and hornist, and was familiar with a number of other instruments. His desire to acquire sufficient knowledge for a good writing of both the theory and the practice of music. As the best student of the year, he was commissioned in the music school to compose a cantana for public performance, and the same year he composed a symphony and a mass which are still preserved. 7. Evidences of Precocity, C. 2, 2, and 6. AIIQ 120. Relief coefficient of data, 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Rossini continued his musical studies in Bologna, and compositions continued to flow from his pen. His first opera, La Cambielle di Matrimono, appeared in Venice when its composer was 18, and the following year he introduced two operas, one appearing in Bologna, the other in Rome. Five new operas appeared, before the writer was 21, in three cities, Venice, Ferrara and Milan. One of the three, Tancredi soon achieved European fame for its young composer. At 23, Rossini was engaged as musical director for two Neapolitan theatres for a term of seven years, while the proviso that he produced two new operas each year. In less than a year, he produced four. One of these, The Barber of Seville, composed in 13 days for a Roman theatre, was an immediate and brilliant success, while Otello, another production of the same year, won a triumph less immediate 
but less lasting. AII IQ 130, relative quotient of data 0 0.60. Joseph Justice Scalinger, 1540-1609, a celebrated Protestant scholar. AI IQ 120, AII IQ 155. 1. Family Standing Joseph Justice's father was a distinguished scholar, Julius Caesar Scaliger, a learned classicist and noted writer. An Italian, he claimed noble ancestry, but without satisfactory proof of his claim. The mother came of a French family of good standing. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. When he was 11, Joseph was sent with two younger brothers to a Latin school in Bordeaux, where two distinguished friends of his father held teaching posts. He remained there until he was 14 and then returned home because of an outbreak of the plague. From the age of 14 to 18, he was under his aged father's tutelage and was limited to the training which the school at seminary could give him. 3. School Standing and Progress During the years of study with his father, Scaliger was required to produce daily a short Latin declamation also to keep a written record of the perennial vow of his father's Latin verse. It was thus he acquired his early mastery of Latin, for the aged man produced near a hundred lines of Latin verse each evening. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of Precocity, no record. AIIQ 120, relative coefficient of data 0.11. 3. Development from 17 and 26. Young Scaliger wrote, at the age of 17, a Latin tragedy, Epidus, not preserved, the remembrance of which, even in his advanced age, gave him no cause to blush. Soon after his father's death at the age of 19, he went to Paris, where he attended lectures and mastered Greek by himself. His stay in Paris from his 20th to his 24th year was marked by his conversion to the Reformed Church, and by his association with brilliant and learned men. In his 25th year, he journeyed to Rome as a companion of the French ambassador, and there issued his first publication, a study of the Latin poet Pharo. AIIIQ 155 Relative coverage of data, 0.53 Louis Adolphe Thiers 1797-1877 A distinguished French statesman and historian. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing Thiers's paternal grandfather was a parliamentary lawyer of Provence. A registrar in Marseilles, his brother was at the time of his son's birth, a workman about the port of Marseilles. The brother belonged to a commercial family, in somewhat straitened circumstances. 2. Development to age 17. No dates are available for Theo's early life. It was only possible to say that his attendance at the Le Sea was over when he reached the age of 18. 1. Interests. No record is preserved except of his school activities. 2. Education. Theo's was reared by his mother's relatives, and it was they who obtained for him a scholarship at the Le Sea of Marseilles. 3. School standing and progress. In the Le Sea, he did well in his studies as often the way with scholarship students who are stimulated by their precarious position. He already manifested ceaseless activity, willingness to work, and insatiable desire for knowledge. He was also actuated by self-respect and by ambition, and that self-confidence which contributes to success. From the high character's work in Marseilles, we may infer that he gained a fairly good knowledge of the humanities, especially Latin, but he gave special attention to mathematics in preparation for the military career toward which everything was brought to bear. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Reduction and Achievement, no record. 7. Evidence of Precocity, no record. AIIQ 120, relative coefficient of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 18, Theos concentrated his efforts upon the study of the law at Aix and at 21, was admitted to the bar. In the meantime, he had devoted much attention to philosophy and speculative analysis, both mathematical and metaphysical. The doctrines of Leibniz and Descartes engaging his attention particularly. At the age of 23, he gained first and second prizes at the Academy of Aids. 
besides winning a high reputation for two able essays he had submitted which discussed the same question from opposite points of view at twenty-four after abandoning the war for journalism he began to gain prominence in paris by his political writings and by his critical articles on painting at the age of twenty-five he travelled in france and switzerland and his experiences and observations were reported in an article published a little later at twenty-four and twenty-five he was probably working on his history of the revolution which appeared when he was twenty-six first brought the young author into real prominence aii iq one hundred and forty relief coach data point five three sir anthony van dyke fifteen ninety nine to sixteen forty one a famous Flemish painter best known as a portrait painter AIIQ 120, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing. Van Dyke's grandmother, with the assistance of her two sons, carried on the prosperous silk and lining business left by her husband at his death. The artist's father, a particular in this successful family enterprise, had also, like others of his calling, a share in the administration of the cathedral. The mother is reported to have been very skilled in the art of embroidery. The family lived a well-to-do, cultivated life. They were fond of music and owned a clever court. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests It was probably because Anthony displayed his disposition of painting so early that upon the advice of a friend of his father, he was placed at the age of 10 where he could pursue artistic studies. 2. Education It is probable that Van Dyck received in his earliest years the usual schooling of a wealthy burgher's son, but how long he continued in school is uncertain. His eleventh year, he was entered by the dean as an apprentice of the guild of St. Luke at Antwerp. At this time, only Rubens was possible in Antwerp, and the young student learned to imitate and copy him in every respect. 3. School standing in progress. No additional information. 4. Friends and associates. Many engravers and painters were among the family friends with whom Van Dyck was early associated. Van Bellum was his teacher, and Jan Bruegel the younger was his colleague and bosom friend. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. At the age of 14, Van Dyck painted a portrait of an old man that is still extant, and at 16 he was living and working independently in Antwerp. As evidence of his maturity at this early age, it is recorded that, as a person of independent means and position, he was allowed to plead his own case in a settlement of his grandmother's property. Apparently, at the time when the artist was 16 or 17 years of age, he was beginning to teach pupils of his own. His progress in art is shown by the fact that a series of heads from his rapid pencil and brush were exhibited by a noted contemporary connoisseur and art dealer, and it is clear that he was known among artists when Rubens himself had visited his studio. 7. Evidences of Precocity, C26, AIIQ 120, Relative Coverture Data.20 3. Development from 17 to 26. After entering Rubens' studio as an assistant at the age of 18, Van Dyck rapidly perfected his style, and he was received in the Lucas Guild as master painter the following year. Many of his pictures from this period are highly distinguishable from those of his master. At the age of 21, already a skilled portrait painter, Van Dyck spent some time in England at the invitation and the employ of Charles I. In his twenty-third year, he went to Italy, where he studied for some years. His high position as an artist was there recognised, and he won the patronage of Cardinal Bentifoglio. AIIIQ 135, Relative Coast of Data.43 William Wilberforce, 1759-1833 An English philanthropist, statesman and orator, famous as opponent of the slave trade. AIIQ 120 AIIIQ 130 1. Family Standing Wilberforce's forebears were people of property and of dignified standing in their communities. William's father was a merchant. His mother numbered among her relatives a leading banker, an Archbishop of Canterbury, and a Bishop of Winchester. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests, no specific record. 2. Education At the age of seven, a sickly and diminutive child, William was sent to Hull Grammar School. His second school was Wimbledon in Surrey, whither he was dispatched as a parlour boarder by an uncle who took charge of him after the death of his father. The proprietors of this school were catering chiefly to merchant sons, and they taught, therefore, everything and nothing. 
French, mathematics and Latin are mentioned by Wilberforce as subjects studied. At this same time, while in his uncle's home and under the care of his aunt, young Wilberforce acquired a familiarity with the sacred writings and a habit of devotion, the results of which were perceptible throughout the whole of his more mature life. But now his mother, hearing that her boy was being perverted to Methodism, placed him under the Reverend Basket, master of Pocklington Grammar School. To him, William became indebted for some general knowledge of polite literature and an intimate acquaintance with the best dinner tables in that part of the country. 3. School Standing and Progress When William was seven years old and attending his first school, so rich were the tones of his voice and such the grace and impressiveness with which it was modulated, that his teacher would lift him on the table that his schoolfellows might admire and imitate such a model in the art of recitation. Little is known of the lad's progress in Wilton, but it is said that at Pollington he became generally popular and was especially admiring for his singing. Although often idle, he did well in composition and learned much English poetry. 4. Friends and Associates, no specific record. 5. Reading, no specific record. 6. Production and Achievement. While still a schoolboy, Wilberforce wrote several religious letters, much in accordance with the opinions he subsequently adopted, and he contributed a letter to a York newspaper protesting against the odious traffic in human flesh. 7. Indications of Precocity, C2, 3, and 6. AIIQ 120, relative quotient of data point two zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26. From his 18th to his 22nd year, Wilberforce was in residence at St. John's College, Cambridge, studying little and living a fast life with a group of merry fellows. At 21, he was elected to the House of Commons from Hull, and at 25 from Yorkshire, as a result of a brilliant speech against the unholy alliance. At this time, his political future already shone very brightly. AII IQ 130, relative coefficient of data 0.43. John Wilkes, 1727-1797. An English politician, publicist, and political agitator. AIIQ 120, AIIQ 125. 1. Family standing. Wilkes' ancestors were businessmen or farmers. His father was a prosperous distiller, jovial, lavish, and ambitious to rise in the social scale. His mother, a nonconformist, was distinguished by strength of will and at times by hot temper, although as a rule she was good humoured and tolerant. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. Beginning when he was 7 years old, John attended a boarding school at Hereford, kept by a learned master who watched over his pupils with great care. From the age of 12 to 18, the lad studied under a clergyman. However, the instruction of this man can scarcely have furthered his pupils' progress, for he was a superficial pedagogue, a morbid sophist, whose brain was enshrouded by the mists of theology. 3. School standing and progress. At Hereford, John gained a fair knowledge of Latin and Greek. He must have been an excellent scholar, for a letter written to him by John Worsley after he left the school spoke not only of his generous sentiments, but also of that love of letters which I myself beheld the first dawnings of, and no mean advancement in, with so much pleasure. 4. Friends and associates. At Hereford, he made many friends among his companions. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of Recursity. It was early evident that little John Wilkes had a brave spirit, and as he advanced in years, his cheery good temper and charm of manner won the hearts of all who knew him. From the first, he was his father's favourite, both on account of his spirit and because of his keen sense of humour. AIIQ 120, Relative Coefficient Data, 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. As a student of Leyden, aged 18 to 21, John was referred to as the Studious Wilkes, and during his stay there, he managed to gain some reputation as a conversationalist. He learned a good deal of Latin, a fair amount of Greek, to converse in French with facility, to love liberty, and to make a graceful bow. He married at 22, and Hyres, 10 years his senior, with whom, unfortunately, he had nothing in common and for the next few years he combined the life of a rural squire with that of a man of fashion. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0.43. Joseph Edison, 1672-1719, a famous British essayist, poet and statesman, 
AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing Addison's father, a man of unusual character, was a clergyman who became a royal chaplain. He wrote religious treaties of sufficient note to be included in the encyclopedias. The mother was the sister of a bishop of Bristol. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. No record. 2. Education. Joseph was a weak, sensitive child who was hardly expected to survive infancy. He attended his first school at Amesbury before the age of 12 and afterward proceeded to Litchfield Grammar School, where he showed normal schoolboy enterprise. Later he entered the Charterhouse, and it was here that his friendship with Steele began. At 15 he entered Queen's College, Oxford. 3. School Standing and Progress, C2-2. 4. Friends and Associates. Edison's friendship for Steele dates to the period before the poet was 15 years of age. C2-2. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ 125. Relief coefficient of data 0.20. 2. Development from 17 to 26. It is said that at college, Edison was distinguished among his fellow students by the delicacy of his feelings, by the shyness of his manners, and by the assiduity with which he has so often prolonged his studies far into the night. At 19, he held his first post as tutor to a young man of birth and fortune. Two years later, he received the Master of Arts degree, and during the same year, wrote his account of the greatest English poets and his first verses, addressed to Dryden, who welcomed them. At this time, he was intending, by his father's advice, to enter the church. During the following years, and before his twenty-six, Addison supervised the translation of Herodotus and wrote a number of critical essays, translations, and verses in both Latin and English. Verses in Latin, written at twenty-five, won high patronage, and ultimately secured a royal pension for the young poet, who is now a probationary fellow at Oxford. AII IQ 140, relative quotient of data, 0.53. Ludovico Ariosto, 1474-1533, an Italian poet. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing The Ariostos, an ancient and noble family of Bologna, were soldiers, lawyers and scholars with scientific and literary interests. Ludovico's grandfather was governor of Reggio. His father was created by the emperor a count of the Holy Roman Empire. He held various important military commands. The poet's mother belonged to the petty nobility. She was the daughter of a physician and poet of local reputation. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. It is probable that Ariosto's father frequently took the boy to the theatrical performances at the court of the Duke of Ferrara, since it is recorded that Ariosto often, in the absence of his parents, dressed his little brothers and sisters in the most suitable clothes he could lay hands on, and made them come out of the rooms into the hall, reciting like stage players what he had invented for them. See also 2.5. 2. Education Of Ariosto's earliest schooling, there is no record. When he was about four, his father sent him to study law, with the intention of making him a notary. But never did he look at a book that belonged to the study of law, Though restrained by respect for his father, he dared not openly lay aside what the latter desired him to learn. He says himself that when he was at the age most disposed for prosy, my father drove me with goads and lances, not merely with spurs, to turn over texts and glosses, and kept me to that rubbish for five years. 3. School Standing and Progress, C2-2 4. Friends and Associates Two friends are mentioned beside the members of his immediate family. A cousin, Ronaldo di Francesco, a dashing and wealthy nobleman, older than Ariosto, and of very different tastes, and Pentolfo, another kinsman, of the same age as himself and devoted to literature. His friendship with the second continued through later years. 5. Reading While supposedly studying law, Ariosto in secret consumed all his time in reading the fables or romances of every kind that came into his hands. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no specific record, but C21. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. 
At seventeen, Ariosto was willing to listen without an excuse or a plea for mercy to a tremendous lecture by his father on all the alleged misdemeanors, because it made such excellent copy for a comedy. At eighteen, he was chosen, among others, to recite comedies. At nineteen, he wrote an elegy, his earliest extant work. It is reported that he won much applause when, at twenty-one, he recited an original Latin oration in honor of the prince. The four years before he was twenty-six, Ariosto had devoted to the study of the classics, to poetry writing, and to social life. His associates were men of noble rank and high position. On the death of his father, when Ariosto was twenty-five, the young poet gave up his studies to care for his mother, brothers, and sisters. AII IQ 135 Relative quotient of data, 0.53. Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685 to 1750, a famous German composer and musician. AI IQ 125, AII IQ 140. 1. Family standing. The Bachs were musicians, organists, cantors, or town musicians, for successive generations. Johann's father, a town councillor and town musician, was a man of good understanding gifted with art and skill, respected and listened to in his township. While the mother is reported only that she was the daughter of a furrier, and that she died when Johann was nine. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Bach was brought up in a musical environment. In his father's and later in his brother's home, as well as at school, he was surrounded by enthusiastic and gifted musicians. The boy's interest in his art is shown by the long expeditions which he made on foot in order to visit musicians or to be present at musical festivals in a distant city. By gaining admission to the private performances of the cell band, he had an opportunity of hearing French music. 2. Education Bach was probably taught by his father to play on the violin before he was nine, after his mother's death. He lived in the home of his brother, who instructed him in music. From the age of... 10 to 15, he attended the Orthodox Town Academy, where the curriculum included music in addition to theology, ancient languages, rhetoric, and arithmetic. From his 16th to his 18th year, Bach attended the Lewenberg Academy of St. Michael, where his musical development was considerably influenced by the musician Baum, a great musical genius. 3. School Progress and Standing Bach appears to have passed through the regular course as far as the first class, and although musical study gradually encroached more and more upon his time, there is no indication that his scholastic duties were neglected. 4. Friends and Associates Bach appears to have been a favourite pupil of the young cantor in the academy. It is probable that the latter suggested to him and his fellow student Erdemann that they should join him at the new school to which he had been transferred. So great was the young musician's admiration for that elder genius that he walked the long road to Hamburg several times to hear his teacher's master, the great Renekin. 5. Reading. No specific record is preserved, but it's clear that Bach must have read many a musical work, in addition to the regular school requirements. 6. Production and Achievement. Young Bach was restive under the instruction of his brother. He was irrepressible for his desire to advance rapidly and to undertake difficult work. In the choir of the school, which he attended from his 11th to 16th year, he became one of the former singers. Splitter believes that three extant choral fugues and a clavier fugue belong to this period. At 15, Bach removed to St. Michael's School, Lunenburg, where, because of his musical proficiency, he became one of the select group of Matin scholars, and he was granted the second grade salary. When soon after he lost his voice, he continued his musical activities as violinist, clavier player, and organist. 7. Evidences of Precocity Because his brother refused young Buck the use of a certain musical work, the boy aged 10 is said to have pulled the desired manuscript through the lattice off the shelf on which it was kept, and to have copied it entire by night. His only light while performing this labour was from the moon, and so the periods when the work could be carried on were limited as completion required more than six months. Tradition adds that the boy's eyesight was permanently weakened by this performance. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 18, Bach was appointed court musician at Weimar. 
A few months later, he was invited to become organist in Arnstadt with an unusually large salary. Before he was 20, he had produced works of unmistakable genius. At 22, he became organist at Mulhausen, a city that prided itself on its musical tradition. At 23, he was appointed court organist at Weimar, with double his former income. From this time onward, he devoted himself to his official duties and to musical composition. AII IQ 140, relative coastal data 0.43. Theodor Pisa. 1519-1605 A noted theologian, the successor of Calvin as leader of the Reformed Church. AIIQ 125 AIIQ 140 1. Family standing Beza's family were of old Burgundian stock. The father's kinsmen were persons of considerable prominence, and the father himself held an honourable and influential position as Bailey of Vesalais. The mother of noble descent was a woman of unusual intellectual and moral endowment, as kindly as she was clever. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Beza's pronounced interest from his earliest years was in classical literature. 2. Education. He was educated most tenderly, for he was a puny child of weakly constitution, and for a long time he suffered untold agony from a skin infection. When sufficiently recovered from this ailment, he began his studies under a tutor. At nine, he was sent to Orleans, to the school of Olmar, the great Greek scholar, and there he remained until he was sixteen. From the age of sixteen until he was twenty, Beza attended the University of Orleans, where he had planned to devote himself to the study of law, but where he was drawn instead to the study of the classics. 3. School Standing and Progress Under Walmart's instruction, Beza and his companions acquired such a knowledge of Latin and Greek that has been rare at any period. C. 2. 2. 4. Friends and Associates From his tenth year, Beza was closely associated with his admired and beloved teacher, Walmar. At the University of Orleans, he had the closest intimacy with all the most learned men at the university. 5. Reading, no specific record, but C. 2. 2. And 3. 6. Production and Achievement, no specific record. 7. Evidences of Precocity, when he was scarcely out of the cradle, Beza so impressed a visiting uncle that the latter determined to adopt him, and this he did with the father's willing and the mother's reluctant consent. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 and 26. After completing four years at the University of Orleans, Beza continued the pursuits of the scholar outside its halls, refusing to follow his father's wish that he enter upon the practice of law. Before he was twenty, he was uncommonly learned for his age in classical literature, and he had produced a volume of Latin verses in the manner of Virgil, of Ovid, and of Catullus, that had won him much praise. Before his twenty-fifth birthday, he had finished a treatise on the Salic law. Although he continued to hold two rich benefices, his interest was centred in study. AII IQ 140, relative coefficient of data 0.43. Robert Blake 1599-1657, a famous English admiral, AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 130. 1. Family Standing The Blakes were members of the country gentry in Somersetshire, prosperous traders and landowners, holding important municipal offices. Robert's father and grandfather were both men of recognised influence in the community, and each in turn served as chief magistrate of Bridgewater. Of the mother, it is recorded only that she was the daughter of a man of property. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Blake appears to have shown some ambition for a classical education, and, as he was the first of his race to show such a predilection, his father, proud of his talents and his studies, resolved that he should have every chance of rising to eminence in his chosen walk that means of education could confer. 2. Education. Before his 16th birthday, Blake had attended the local grammar school, where he made decent progress in Greek and Latin. He appears to have learned something of navigation, shipbuilding, and the routine of sea duties from his father, or from his father's factors and servants. At 16, he was prepared for the university, and his own earnest desire proceeded to Oxford. 3. School standing and progress. No specific record is preserved, except as contained in 2.2. Two. 4. Friends and Associates. Blake at Oxford with Reynolds, 
Artwood Bishop of Worcester, and Earl Artwood's Bishop of Salisbury. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data, 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the university, Blake applied for, but failed to secure a scholarship, and later a fellowship. It is probable that he took the degree of BA at 18, that he then remained for a number of years for further study at college, and that he devoted himself thereafter to the management of the family property. AII IQ 130, relative coach data 0.20. Simon Bolivar, 1783 to 1830 a famous Venezuelan general and statesman. AIIQ 125, AIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing Bolivar's father was a militia colonel, Don Juan Bolivar of Ponte, a member of the Spanish-Venezuelan nobility. The family who were proprietors of great tracts of land were considered leaders in the community. Of the mother's family, no record has been found. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. After the early death of Bolivar's father, the boy was carefully educated under the direction of his mother by a tutor of strange ideas and habits, but constant his devotion to his pupil, and afterward, his intimate friend. At fifteen, on the death of his mother, the youth was sent to Madrid by his uncle and guardian, and there his education was continued. 3. School standing on progress, no specific record. Bolivar's education was under the care of private tutors. 4. Friends and Associates Young Bolivar associated with men of action and thought in Venezuela, in Mexico, where he visited at the age of 15, and in Spain. His ability appears to have been recognised by his associates. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement, no specific record. 7. Evidences of Precocity It is reported that in his early youth, Bolivar gave evidences of a certain precocity and nervousness of action and speech which distinguished him as an enthusiastic and somewhat idealistic boy. When at fifteen he visited Mexico City, he had several conversations with the Viceroy, who admired his wit. But the official became alarmed when the boy came to talk on political questions and with an assurance superior to his age, defended the freedom of the American colonies. AIIQ 125, relative coverage data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 19, Bolivar visited Paris, where his favourite occupation was a study of political science and economics. Married at 19, the youth lost his beloved wife before he was 20. He then determined never to marry again, but rather to devote his life and energy to the study of the great problems of his country. He visited Spain, France and Italy, studying everything and informing himself of all the currents of public opinion. Upon his return to South America, he was engaged for four years, from 20 to 27, in managing his great estate. AIIQ 135, relative coverage of data 0 0.20. John Bright, 1811 to 1889, English liberal statesman and orator. AIIQ 125, AIIQ 130. 1. Family Standing. John Bright was a son of a shrewd and dexterous Quaker weaver who had become successively bookkeeper, salesman, and finally owner of a cotton mill in Rockdale. The older Bright was characterised as just, broad, liberal, and generous. The mother was said to possess an excellent natural capacity, was the daughter of a respectable tradesman. Both parents were intelligent and philanthropic. Their ancestors included wool combers, serge weavers, and farmers, among whom were Quakers who had suffered imprisonment for consciousness' sake. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Although his constitution was delicate and his spirit considered timid, Bright excelled at football, cricket, swimming, and marbles. At school, aged 10 to 12, he was regarded as independent and somewhat pugnacious. At Newton, aged 13, he acquired a love of fishing. He was fond of dogs. At 14 and 15, he was said to be more thoughtful than other youths at that age, and often made quite mature and wise remarks. 2. Education at an early age, Bright was instructed by a governess. At eight, he entered Mr. Littlewood's school in Towhead, and I.e. he entered the Quaker school at Penketh, near Warrington, but soon withdrew from it to attend the well-known school at Ackworth, also a Quaker establishment. 
Thence he went at twelve to a York school, and at thirteen to a school at Newton in Lancashire. 3. School standing and progress. At Mr. Littlewood's school, Bright exhibited no precocious talents, but he possessed an aptitude for mental acquirements, and the master who preferred cultivation of the understanding to learning by rote soon discovered the superior ability of his pupil. Although one of the youngest in the school, Little Bright showed tenderness of heart and firmness of purpose. At Ackworth School, aged 10 to 12, he studied the usual subjects. It was said to be difficult to command his attention, but his comprehension was quick. At York, he always maintained a good position in the class, with apparent ease, but he did not otherwise distinguish himself. And he was further advanced in classics than any but one. When Bright left school, he had passed through the regular course which, however, included neither mathematics nor science. 4. Friends and Associates Bright was said to have been spirited and popular, but who his early associates were, other than members of the family and teachers, is not reported. 5. Reading While he was engaged in his father's mill, Bright, aged 15-25, studied daily from 5.30am until breakfast time. History, poetry, topics of the day, and statistics engaged his attention. 6. Production and Achievement A letter written at 15 indicates the, a boy's normal interests. Before he was 16, Bright left school and entered his father's mill, where he soon showed proficiency in both the practical and the theoretical sides of his occupation. 7. Evidences of Precocity Having heard the story of the Peterloo Massacre, eight-year-old Bright wanted thoroughly to understand the whole movement toward political reform. He was called a thinker by his family. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. During the period from his 17th to his 27th year, Bright's interests and activities were varied. An otherwise continuous period of service in his father's mill was broken twice when at 21 and 23 he visited the continent. His first visit to France was brief. The second was an extended tour to Italy, Greece and Palestine. Bright's political interest was apparently first aroused in 19. His first speech was on behalf of temperance. His ability as an orator developed rapidly and his eloquence and power did not pass unnoticed. A future career as an orator was predicted for him. When he was 21, he assisted in founding a literary society and presided at its first meeting. At 25, on his return from the continent, he delivered lectures on his travels. AII IQ 130 Relative coefficient of data, 0.53. Georges Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, 1707-1788, a celebrated French naturalist. AIIQ 125, AIIQ 130. The first dated event in Buffon's life after his birth is a journey to England at 26. 1. Family Standing Leclerc's father, a man of moderate fortune, was a councillor in the Parliament of Dijon. No further information with respect to members of the family has been found. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Buffon was allowed to choose his own vocation. He began to study law, but soon exhibited a marked predilection for the study of the physical sciences, more particularly for mathematics. 2. Education. He was given an excellent education. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of Precocity, no record. AIIQ 125, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Buffon studied law at the Jesuit College of Dijon, and there he met and became the friend of a young Englishman, Lord Kingston, who was travelling with a cultured and broad-minded tutor. Buffon, with his father's consent, joined his friend in his further travels, and the party sojourned for some time in France, Switzerland, and Italy. When he was 25, Buffon succeeded to a considerable property, and from that time onward, his life was devoted to regular scientific labour. At 26, he translated Hale's Vegetable Statics and Newton's Fluxions, AIIQ 130, relative coefficient data 0.11. Philip Dormer Stanhope Fourth Earl of Chesterfield, sixteen ninety four to seventeen seventy three, an English politician, orator, and writer, famous as a man of fashion. AIIQ one hundred twenty five, 
AII IQ 135. 1. Family Standing. The family of Stanhope was ancient and distinguished. Philip's grandfather, the second earl, was one of the most admirable of the name. His father, the third earl, one of the least superb. For several generations, the Stanhopes had devoted their energies to the forlorn hope of restoring the Stuarts. Philip's mother was a daughter of the famous Marquis of Halifax, a statesman and wit. His grandson closely resembled him. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. Stanhope and his sisters, strangely neglected by their father, were cared for and educated by their grandmother. The young gentleman was trained by private tutors who instructed him in the subjects which he was pleased to learn. He became proficient in languages, for he was a clever boy, but he remained sadly deficient in mathematics. He learned French very early from an old nurse, and he was later instructed in history and philosophy by a French Huguenot clergyman. 3. School standing on progress. It is impossible to compare the grade of performance of young Stanhope with that of others of the same age. Because his instruction was private, but it would appear that he excelled in the subjects in which he was interested. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 125, relative quotient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 18, Stanhope was entered at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, where he lived for two years, a brilliant youth whose desire was to experience life fully in all its aspects. In the midst of many activities, he acquired considerable learning and developed his gift for oratory. A year of travel on the continent followed. At 20, he was appointed a gentleman of the bedchamber to the Prince of Wales, and about the same time he entered the House of Commons and made his first speech. There, just before his 21st birthday, his membership in the Commons continued until upon the death of his father, Stanhope, aged 32, as Lord Chesterfield, entered upon his notable career in the House of Lords. AIIQ 135, relative of course, data, 0.53. John Dryden, 1631-1700, a celebrated English poet and dramatist. AIIQ 125. AIIIQ 130 1. Family Standing Dryden's great-grandfather was another John Dryden, a friend of the great Erasmus. His grandfather was Sir Erasmus Dryden, who succeeded to an estate, was high sheriff of Northamptonshire under Elizabeth, and was created a baronet under James I. His father, Erasmus Dryden, acted as Justice of the Peace. On the maternal side, Dryden's great-grandfather was Sir Gilbert Pickering, so conspicuous in his opposition to the Catholics that his murder was a part of the gunpowder plot. His maternal grandfather was a Protestant clergyman. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. Dryden became a King's Scholar at Westminster School under Dr. Bushby, the most famous schoolmaster of the century. 3. School standing in progress, no further record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading. No information other than that inferred from 2.6. 6. Six, production and achievement. At Westminster, Dryden translated into English verse the third satire of Perseus as a Thursday night task, and this was published when its author was 19, and was also an epistle in praise of a volume of religious verse by his friend John Hodgson. Later he recalled the writing of many other similar exercises at Westminster. 7. Evidences of precocity. No further record. AIIQ 125. Relative coefficient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. In his 20th year, Dryden matriculated at Trinity College, Cambridge, where he was elected to one of the Westminster scholarships. At 22, he received the bachelor's degree, but did not leave the university for some time thereafter. It was at this period that his father's death left him an independent income of about £60 a year. At 24, he was reading the classics, writing verses, falling in love and out again. At 26, he went to London to set up for a poet, as his head was too roving and active for him to confine himself to a college life. AII IQ 130. Relative quotient of data, 0.43. Albrecht Zuller, 1471-1528. to 1528 a famous German painter and engraver. 
the founder of the German school. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing Dura's father was a goldsmith, and the son of a goldsmith, a man of recognised position and character. His mother, whose father was also a goldsmith, was benevolent, gentle, and beloved of all who knew her. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Taken into his father's workshop at about 13, young Dura felt more inclination for painting than for the goldsmith's trade, at the age of 15, he persuaded his father to apprentice him for a period of three years to the noted artist, Orgamut. 2. Education Of himself, Dura says, When my father saw that I was diligent in my studies, he sent me to school, and as soon as I had learned to read and write, he took me away and taught me the goldsmith's trade. Albert's professional training was received from Orgamut. C. 2. 1. 3. School standing and progress Dura, no doubt, learned little besides a few Latin words at school. But while serving his apprenticeship with Wolgmut, he followed with rapid strides in the path pointed out to him by his old master. 4. Friends and Associates When Albrecht was still serving in his father's shop, Wolgmut's apprentices were probably his playfellows, and curiosity may have often enticed him into the famous studio. 5. Reading Dura informs us that he read Vitruvius in his youth. 6. Production and Achievement A number of drawings have been preserved from the period of Albrecht's apprenticeship to his father. The drawing of himself at 13 and several other sketches exhibit remarkable ability with a pen for one of his age. Other early drawings are preserved that show Wolgmut's influence. 7. Evidences of Dicosity C26 AIIQ 125 Relative Kosher Data point two zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26 after finishing his apprenticeship at 18, Dura travelled and studied for four years. He sketched, drew and painted portraits. Watercolours, pen sketches, landscapes and miniatures preserved in this period include a number of examples from the artist's best work. On returning home, age 23, Dura married and set up a studio. AIIIQ 135, relative quotient of data, point four three. Joseph Fouche, Duc de Otrante. 1759 to 1820. A French revolutionist, and later a Napoleon Minister of Police. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 130. 1. Family Standing. Fouché's father was a captain in the merchant service at Nantes, and his family belonged to the comfortable bourgeoisie. No information has been preserved concerning the mother and her family. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. The only interests recorded were in scientific studies at school. 2. Education. At 9, Fushi was taken to the Oreton College at Nantes to be trained to become a sea captain. There he is said to have disliked grammar, but he was attracted to arithmetic, physics, and the exact sciences. 3. School standing and progress. As he had a keen intellect and an ambition which was already awakened, he threw himself into the study of mathematics and science with passion and with success. Science became such a passion with him that the head of the school marked him for science and philosophy rather than for the sea. The report refers to the period when Fouché was between the ages of 9 and 22. 4. Friends and Associates. No record. 5. Reading. Fouché studied with enthusiasm the works of Pascal and other scholars of Port Royal and the Jasonet literature. 6. Production and Achievement. No record. 7. Evidence of Precocity. No record. AIIQ 125. Relative cost of data. Point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Because of his frail health, Fouché could not realise his hope of becoming a sea captain. The head of the school urged him to prepare for teaching and so, having already received minor orders, he entered at 22 the Oratorian Seminary in Paris, distinguished himself there in philosophy and mathematics, and was sent the following year as assistant teacher to the College of Nuert. At 24, became tutor at Sulmar, in charge of the fourth class, and a year later was promoted to teach the second class at Vendôme. At 34, Fouché came into prominence as a Jacobin fanatic. AII IQ 130, relative coach to data point two zero. Joseph Louis Guy Lussac, 
1778-1850, a distinguished French chemist and physicist. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family standing. Guy Lussac's grandfather was a physician. His father was king's prosecutor and judge at Pont de Noblac. Of his mother and her ancestry, no record has been found. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As a boy, Guy Lussac was boisterous, turbulent, and very adventuresome. On one occasion in his boyhood, he experienced such humiliation at being surprised in the very act of telling a falsehood that he resolved never again to depart from the truth, a resolution said to have been religiously kept during the rest of his life. The Republicans tried to enlist the hardy youth of fifteen in their ranks, but he proved that he was underage and so remained true to his father's cause. 2. Education During the early days of the Revolution, while his father was imprisoned as a suspect, Guy Lussac began the study of Latin under a priest who resided in St. Leonard. Later, his father, released from prison, devoted himself to the education of this loyal son. 3. School standing and progress That his taste for the noisy pastimes of youth might not interfere with his desire for performing his duties, he devoted a portion of the night to study, after playing all day with his comrades. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No record. AIIQ 125. Relative coverage of data. 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Guy Lussac's eager diligence continued. He attended successfully two Paris schools and was especially coached by the director of the second. By a brilliant examination at 19, he gained entrance to the Polytechnic School, where he became one of the most distinguished of the scholars. In addition to performing his school's duties, Guy Lussac gave lessons, thus supporting himself independently of his family. At 22, he was privileged to be chosen Berthollet's laboratory assistant. At 24, he became assistant professor, often supplying his superior's place. Before he was 25, his first chemical paper had appeared. He was at this time beginning to be known as one of the most distinguished among the very able professors in Paris. AIIIQ 155, data point six zero. Claude Adrien Helvetius, 1715 to 1771, a French philosopher and literateur. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing. Helvetius belonged to a family of distinguished physicians, originally refugees from the Palatinate. Both father and grandfather were men of great distinction. The father was court physician and counsellor of state, a member of the Berlin, London and Paris academies, and the author of a number of medical treatises. There is no record of the mother. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Young Helvetius' early fondness for fairy tales developed into a passionate love for the classics and later for philosophy. 2. Education. Private instruction began before he was five years of age, was followed by a course at the College of Louis Le Grand, no dates. 3. School standing and progress. Helvetius distinguished himself for the brilliance of discrimination of his figures of speech. He seems suddenly to have acquired a wonderful knowledge of men and things of ancient times, and was passionately interested in the Greeks and Romans. His voluminous notes show with what care he studied the characteristic details, usages, and notable or unusual words in everything that he read. 4. Friends and Associates P. Pori, the brilliant humanist, was one of his teachers who took particular pains in instructing him. 5. Reading. The Iliad and Quintius Curtius are mentioned as being admired passionately. Locke's human understanding, he said, worked revolution in his thinking. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity. It is said that Helvetius did not shine at all in the beginning of his studies, but he knew how to read and how to interpret texts. AIIQ 125. Relative coverage of data, point four three. Edward Jenner. 1749 to 1823, an English physician famous as the discoverer of vaccination. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing. The Jenner family of great antiquity in Gloucestershire and Worcestershire produced several eminent men, among them Dr. Thomas Jenner, president of Magdalen College, Oxford. Edward Jenner's father, an Oxford M.A., and the owner of considerable property, was rector of Rockhampton and vicar of Berkeley. 
The mother's father was a clergyman of standing, a descendant of an honourable and ancient family. Edward's brother is one of whom, brought him up with maternal tenderness, also held church offices. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Before he was nine, Jenner made a collection of the nests of the Dormouse. He spent the hours devoted by the boys to play in searching for fossils which abounded in the neighbourhood. At an early age, no date, he was apprenticed to a surgeon of Sudbury, near Bristol. It was at this time that he was greatly impressed by the statement of a country woman that she could not take smallpox because she had had cowpox. 2. Education. Jenner attended the private school at Watton Underage at the Syrencaster. No date is given for his removal to Sudbury to train as an apprentice in surgery. 3. School standing and progress. At Syrencaster, he made a respectable proficiency in the classics, and his taste for natural history showed in his schoolwork at an early period. 4. Friends and Associates. No names are recorded, but it is reported that Jenner's school life at Syrencaster laid the foundation of friendships which continued throughout his life. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Reduction and Achievement. C22. 7. Evidences of precocity. No further record. AIIQ 125. Relative coast of data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Jenner's apprenticeship, age 20, to John Hunter, had an important influence on his mind and character, and the return of Captain Cook from his world voyage, 1771, gave him, aged 22, new inspiration. When on Hunter's recommendation, Jenner had skillfully arranged and prepared the specimens that had been collected by Sir Joseph Banks. He was offered an appointment, at 23, as a naturalist on Cook's second voyage, 1772. At 24, he began private practice in his native town of Berkeley, and about the same time began his endeavours to interest the medical world in the possibilities of vaccination. A scientific paper on the cuckoo is probably of this year as are also the papers preserved but not published describing many scientific experiments. Some of Jenner's varied interests appear in the specimens of verse, both serious and humorous, preserved from this period. AIIIQ 145, relative coverage of data, 0 0.60. Justus Liebig, 1803 to 1873, a celebrated German chemist. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 165. 1. Family Standing Leibig's forebears were peasants in the Odenwald, men who held positions of trust in their communities. His father was a dealer in drugs and colours, a quiet industrious man who built up a substantial business. The mother was an unusual woman of sound practical common sense who acted as her husband's business associate while she reared ten children. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests at twelve, Leibig's interest began to centre in the study of chemistry. He read widely in chemical works, at the same time developing to a remarkable degree the ability to visualise experiments as he read about them. From twelve to fifteen, he carried on a vast amount of experimentation. He repeated the experiments on which he had read until he knew them by heart in their minutest details and could reproduce them mentally at will. His father's laboratory became his favourite resort. He watched the process of soap making and then reproduced it, with improvements in his laboratory. He visited in the workshops of tanners, dyers, smiths and bronze molders, and he became thoroughly familiar with their varied techniques. After he had observed the making of formating silver by a quack doctor, a process in which he recognised the action of nitric acid and alcohol, he was able successfully to reproduce the experiment at home. When asked by the school principal on one occasion, whatever would become of him, he responded that he wished to be a chemist. This created much amusement, as no one at that time thought of chemistry as a science to be studied. When he was fifteen, Leibig, who was then apprenticed to an apothecary, carried on experiments with explosives. It was perhaps because a piece of the roof was blown off in one of his experiments that he left the service of this master. At sixteen, Leibig experimented and studied at home for a year, among other endeavours, he attempted to prepare a certain green colouring matter, but his chief interest was then, and during the following years, in experiments with explosives. 2. Education At seven, Liebig was prepared by a private instructor for entrance to the gymnasium. 
which he began to attend a year later, entering with his ten-year-old brother. Ancient languages became the pierce de resistance of the course. At fifteen, Leibig left school to become an apothecary's apprentice. 3. School standing in progress. Although he was at entrance two years below the regular age for his class, just as completed grade four in the usual two years' time, and was promoted as 23rd of 28. In the next grade, he lost the two years he had gained, but was promoted as 17th of 27. From his 13th to his 16th year, he seems to have remained in the second class of that promotion, and during this period, he was perhaps more than once reprimanded by the school principal for his lack of industry. It is interesting to note that Leibniz's associate at the foot of the class was later Imperial and Royal Court Director of the Vienna Opera House. While the others were studying Greek and Latin, this youth was composing music and Leibniz was thinking of chemical experiments. 4. Friends and Associates. No specific record. See 2, 3 and 5. 5. Reading. The 14-year-old boy fetching books for his father's use in the court library attracted the attention of the librarian, who rewarded his evident interest by giving him free access to the chemistry library. Thus encouraged to Leibig read, eagerly, enthusiastically, all the books in the collection. For the contents, he said, my 14-year-old head was like the stomach of an ostrich. Leibig later recalled from this library, Macquarie's Chemical Dictionary, 32 volumes, Basilius Valentius, Tremfulcar, Stahl's Philogistic Chemistry, thousands of articles and distinctions of the periodicals of Gottling and Gellin, the works of Kirwan, and those of Cavendish. All of these he read before he was 18. 6. Production and Achievement, C21. 7. Evidence of Precocity, C21 and 3. AIIQ 125, Relative Coast of Data, 0. 0.53. 3. Development in 17 to 26. At 17, and after he had completed the study of the books on chemistry in the court library, Liebig was sent to the University of Bonn, where he followed the lectures of leading chemists and increased the interest of his fellow students by organising a chemical-physical association among them. At 18, his first paper was published, soon to be followed by others. At 19, having received a travelling scholarship, Liebig went forth to Paris, where he received enthusiastic encouragement from Gay-Lussac, Humboldt and others. After a year of intensive study, he presented a thesis to the University of Erlangen, whose faculty granted him the doctor's degree in absentia upon the recommendation of his professors. At twenty, Leiby became generally known to the chemical world by a significant chemical paper on mercury and silver fulminate, and an associate professorship at the University of Giessen was offered to the young doctor on the recommendation of Humboldt. During the next four years, the youthful professor, whose students were for the most part older than he, was engaged in establishing the first experimental chemical laboratory in Germany. Students soon began to flock to his course. Happily married at 23, Loeby entered the same year upon the professorship, which he held for 26 years in Gießen. AII IQ 165, relative coefficient of data 0.75. End of section 18. Section 19 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2 The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 16 Cases rated at AIIQ 120 to 130, Part 3. Abraham Lincoln. 1809-1865, the 16th President of the United States. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing The Lincolns were of English descent. The American branch of the family, who had settled in the South, were, for the most part, modest, thrifty, unambitious people. Lincoln's grandfather was an energetic frontiersman, his father a careless and inert one, mentally and physically dull and slow. He was a good carpenter, but he would not seek work. Lincoln's mother was, remotely, of Quaker descent. Her immediate family were illiterate, superstitious, poor whites. She, however, was superior to her surrounds in education and in intellect. 2. Development to age 17. 
1. Interests Lincoln fished when he was scarcely more than three, and chased hedgehogs before he was seven. Quick-witted and always ready with an answer, he began at ten to exhibit deep thoughtfulness. He was inquisitive and apt to ask the first question. He learned his letters so that he could read books. He learned to write so that he would have an accomplishment his playmates had not. Then so that he could help his elders. And finally, so as to copy what struck him in his reading. He learned to cipher in order to go into more congenial work than farming. He was quiet during playtime and fond of solitude. In all the intervals of his work, he read, wrote, and ciphered incessantly. He was the life of the home circle, whose members recognized him as their superior goodness and cleverness. No one had a more retentive memory. A good thing once read or heard never escaped him. His investigating mind dug after ideas and never stopped until bottom facts were reached. He was fond of swimming and hunting, a boy of courage who had few difficulties with the other boys. Preaching was a favourite activity during his early teens. 2. Education It is said that Mrs. Lincoln took pains to teach her children what she knew and that she told them Bible stories, fairy tales and legends. Before he was seven, Abe learned his alphabet and a little more at a country school. At ten he attended school again for a short time. Meanwhile, he learned the rudiments of carpentry and cabinet-making from his father. When he was fourteen, his mother began to take an active interest in his education, for to her he seemed full of promise, although not as quick of comprehension as other boys. She arranged that he should be allowed to study at home as well as at school. At night he read, or ciphered with charcoal on the fire shovel. He wrote on every available space. 3. School Standing and Progress Lincoln is reported by his schoolmates to have been an unusually bright boy at school, one who made splendid progress in his studies and indeed learned faster than any of his schoolmates. He lost no time at home, and when he was not at work, he was at his books. His powers of concentration were intense. He studied hard, often at night, by the light of a log fire. He was at school early and attended to his studies. In consequence, he was always at the head of his class. Long the champion speller of the district, he became something of an authority on astronomy also. 4. Friends and Associates At school, Lincoln was chosen to adjust difficulties, and because of his dry wit and good stories, he was a favourite at social gatherings among the simple, rude, frontier people who were his associates. 5. Reading When he was 14, and no longer attending school, he kept up his studies on Sundays, and on weekdays carried his books with him to work so that he might read while he rested. The scope of his reading was necessarily limited, but he read everything he could lay his hands upon, among others, Aesop's Fables, Robson Crusoe, Pilgrim's Progress, A History of the United States, and Weems' Washington. And he read them over and over until he knew each one almost by heart. The Bible and Aesop's Fables he kept always within reach. He also read a Louisville paper regularly, and at times, for want of other matter, would read a dictionary by the hour. From the books he did not own, he took voluminous notes. 6. Production and Achievement As soon as he was large enough, Lincoln was put to work in the fields with his father. He learned to know his father's farm from line to line, and to carry on all of its activities. He drove the team, cut the bushwood, handled the shovel plough, wielded the sickle, threshed the wheat. Indeed, he knew all the branches of farm work so well that he could be hired out to the neighbours when his father did not need his help. Some of his employers thought him lazy because he sat about reading or thinking, but there is no evidence to show that he studied during working hours. At fourteen, he wrote a number of essays or dissertations. He took an active part in school debates and frequently entertained his companions by repeating to them long passages from the books he had read or the sermons he had heard. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 125. Relative Coach Defender. 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When he was 17, Lincoln was able to attend school for a time. He studied every book he could lay his hands on. He tried writing simple verses with some success, but he was prouder of his physical strength and his capacity to perform difficult manual tasks. Essays written by him on the American government and on temperance won local praise. In 19, Lincoln, with another youth, successfully sailed down the river to New Orleans with a load of produce, which was disposed of at a good price. 
Before he was 22, Lincoln made his first public speech, and his effort was commended by a local candidate. At 22, a second voyage was made to New Orleans, where it is said the sufferings of the slaves made a deep impression. During the same year, Lincoln entered business at New Salem. He became a candidate for the legislature, but was defeated. He served with honor in a campaign against the Indians. On his return from the war, he commenced, in partnership, to run a store, but this venture did not pay. After a period of desultory work on the farm within the store, he was appointed at 24 postmaster of New Salem, a position he held for four years. At 26, with the support of both Whigs and Democrats, he was elected to the state legislature. AIIQ 140, relative coefficient of data 0.75. Carlos Linnaeus, 1707 to 1778, a celebrated Swedish botanist and naturalist, founder of the Linnaean system of botany. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. The paternal ancestors were peasants, but Linnaeus's father was a Swedish country clergyman with a love of beautiful things of the plant world. The strong character that in the household was the mother whose ancestors had been people of culture for at least three generations. It was her ambition to see her firstborn inherit the pastorate of her husband, which had long been filled by members of her own family. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. When Carolus was four, flowers beyond all things were his chief delight. He wanted to know the names of all the familiar plants in his father's garden, and upon a picnic excursion, nearly monopolised, the pastor's time with questions of plant names. At eight, he had a garden spot of his own and showed much energy in collecting and planting all manner of wild flora. 2. Education Leonaeus, aged seven to ten, was educated at home by a tutor who taught him to speak, read and write Latin. At ten, he was sent away to a Latin theological preparatory school at Vexio. 3. School standing and progress His progress at Vexio appears to have been satisfactory, he entered the school a year younger than was customary and was encouraged by his master to study botany. He was later remembered by one of his tutors as a favourite pupil. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading. Between the ages of 11 and 18, Linnaeus acquired a number of scientific and botanical works which he studied assiduously. 6. Production and Achievement, C. 2. 1. 7. Evidences of Precocity. As a child of four, he was active and intelligent beyond his years. See also 2 1. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When at 17 Linnaeus passed into the College of Vexio, he was advised to give up his university course because it appeared that Hebrew and biblical learning failed to interest him. But Dr. Rotham, lecturer in medicine at the college, recognized his ability and took him into his own home, for a year giving him instruction in medicine, natural history, and physiology. At twenty, Linnaeus entered the university at Lund, remaining for a year and winning the admiration of Dr. Stobowas, with whom he lived. The following year, he entered Uppsala and was able, before long, at twenty-three, to support himself by lecturing publicly in the botanical gardens. At twenty-five, it was arranged by Rudbeck, professor of botany, that he should make a scientific expedition to Lapland. On his return late the same year, he wrote his excellent Flora Leponica, AII IQ 145, with a coefficient of data 0. 0.60. John Locke, 1632-1704, a celebrated English philosopher, one of the most influential thinkers of modern times. AII IQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Locke's father came of a stable middle class family. Educated for the law, he made for himself a good position as a country attorney. He was a man of parts, of more than ordinary intelligence, actively interested in the political questions at that time reading the country. He served for a time as captain of a troop of volunteers in the Army of Parliament. He strongly influenced his son by his severe but reasonable discipline and training. The mother left an impression of pity and affection. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Political and religious interests were stimulated through the occurrence of the time and by home discussion. 2. Education. 
Locke probably attended a local elementary school in addition to receiving parental instruction. At 14, he entered Westminster School, at that time one of the three leading university preparatory schools attended by sons of the aristocracy and the professional class. Here the school course included Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, themes and extemporary verses, and much memorising. Both the course and the educational method were later condemned by Locke. 3. School study and progress. On the basis of his conduct, general ability and knowledge, and after passing a stiff examination in Greek, Latin and grammar, Locke was elected on the foundation, that is, he was officially recognised by the conferring of a school honour as above the school average in attainment. 4. Friends and Associates None of Locke's school friends achieved distinction, however they became respectable professional men. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 125, relative coverage data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 20, John Locke became a student of Christ Church, Oxford, where he continued to pursue learning during the next five years. Among his college friends was James Turrell, later barrister and author of historical and legal works. Locke was probably a superior student under a strict university discipline. His literary achievement is evidenced by his contribution of poems in Latin and English to a volume presented to Cromwell on his victory over the Dutch. The barren and unprofitable course of study gradually alienated Locke, and he became at last utterly disgusted with it. AIIIQ 135, relative coefficient of data 0.43. Nicolas Malebranche, 1638-1715, a French metaphysician, a follower of Descartes. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing. The family of Malebranche was well known in Paris and Metz. During the ministry of Richelieu, the father was appointed sole treasurer of five large farms. The mother was related to people of standing. Her brother was a councillor of state and a viceroy of Canada. She was a woman of rare intelligence and great virtue. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Before Malbranch was 16, the feebleness of his health caused him to feel a disgust with this world and as he did not expect to live long, he turned his attention towards eternity. Poetry and oratory, the rudiments of which he had already learned, seemed frivolous to him and unworthy of occupying the attention of an immortal soul. But it was told that philosophy would teach him the great truths which he wished to learn, and this gave him a great desire to study that subject. Accordingly, when he was sixteen, as his health and somewhat improved, he entered the college de la Marche to study philosophy under the famous peripatetic M. Rillard. But after a few days, the young philosopher saw that he had been deceived. He found in philosophy nothing of greatness and almost nothing of truth, only subtly perpetual equivocation and play with words. 2. Education. Because of a bodily infirmity present from birth, he was not seen at school with his brothers, and whether he gained or lost by this fact we do not know. At any rate, his mother devoted herself to his training, and he is said to have owed his excellent style to her teaching. For account of his entrance to college, see 2 1. 3. School Standing and Progress. During Nicholas's early studies at home, it is certain that he overcame the first difficulties of science with an intellectual ease that was astonishing and which aroused the jealousy of his brothers. His sweetness and patience soon overcame such feelings, however, and in this manner he triumphed over his first adversaries. At college, although disappointed in the study of philosophy, he still felt it was his duty to apply it himself, and he did so with such success that he won the approval of his professor. 4. Friends and Associates No Record 5. Reading No Additional Record 6. Production Achievement At college, Malbranch sustained a thesis with great credit. 7. Evidences of Recursity C23, AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Disgusted with the fruitlessness of philosophical study, Malbrecht entered the Sorbonne hoping to find truth in theology, but here again he was disappointed. It is reported that he received at 18 the degree of Masters of Arts in the University of Steguer, and they took ecclesiastical orders about his time. 
At twenty-two he was offered a stall in Notre Dame, but his studious disposition and the meditation occasioned by his mother's death two years before led him to prefer a less worldly position, and he joined the congregation of the oratory. He devoted himself to intensive study, but without finding the satisfaction for which he hoped. AIIQ 135, Relief Coast Data Point to Zero Auguste F. L. V. Damamont, 1774-1852, a French marshal. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing Marmont's father was an army captain, decorated 28 for distinguished service, and it was this very remarkable man who devoted himself to the education of his son. The older Marmont's interests were in sports, philosophy, and politics. The mother was an heiress, with more common sense than wit. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests As a child, Marmont dreamed of glory and his taste for a military career developed early. At 13, Charles XII of Sweden was a hero whom he wished to imitate. He was fond of mathematics and history, but his threefold wish was to excel in arms, literature, and love. 2. Education Marmont's early education was directed by his father, who trained him in literal thought and in outdoor sports. At home, he was petted and pampered by his father, by an unmarried uncle, and by a childless aunt. At 15, he was sent to Dijon to prepare to enter the School of Artillery. He passed the entrance examinations when about 16. 3. School standing and progress. At Dijon, Marmont did fair work. His Latin was poor, but for mathematics and exact sciences in general, he had taste and ability. When probably at 16, he took his examination under Laplace, the geometrician's cold and severe main so affected him that he was unable to say even his own name until the world of encouragement restored his self possession. 4. Friends and Associates At Dijon, Jean Marmont met Bonaparte. No other associations beside his relatives are mentioned. 5. Reading In his youth, Marmont read Necker's Comte Rendue, which expressed his father's views. 6. Production and Achievement At 15, the youth was commissioned second lieutenant in the militia and entitled to wear a uniform. 7. Evidences of precocity, no specific record. AIIQ 125, Relive Coast of Data, point four three. Three Development from 17 to 26 Marmont was at 17 a second lieutenant of artillery of moderate political opinions. At 18 and a half, he was in command of a company of artillery engaged in actual warfare. It was little later, and before he was 20, that Marmont met Napoleon in Paris and was sent thence, at his own request, to the Siege of Mainz. Napoleon had at this time been removed from the army, but on his reinstatement he called Marmont, aged 22, to his staff. In Napoleon's Egyptian campaign, the latter served with distinction, and at 24 was promoted general of brigade. In the following year, he was counselor of state for the Department of War and organized the artillery for the expedition to Italy. At 26, he commanded the artillery of Marengo with great effect, and for his services he was made general of division. AII IQ 135, relative coast of data point four three. John Napier, 1550 to 1617, a Scottish mathematician famous as the inventor of logarithms. AI IQ 125, AII IQ 125. 1. Family standing. Most of the Napiers played a more or less important part in public affairs. One became Burgess of Edinburgh, another Comptroller of the King's Household, and Foreign Ambassador, and so will receive the honour of knighthood. With their honours they also gained lands, and Merchiston Castle became one of the strongest places in the neighbourhood of Edinburgh. Sir Archibald, the seventh baronet of Murchison, and the father of John, fully maintained the repute of his ancestors for energy and sagacity. He was a justice depute under the Earl of Argyle, and for more than thirty years was master of the mint. He became Protestant and several times sat in the General Assemblies of the Reformed Church. John Napier's mother was Janet, daughter of Sir Francis Bothwell and sister of Adam Bothwell, Bishop of Orkney, known to history as an active agent in effecting the unhallowed union of Mary and the Earl of Bothwell. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests At college, Napier determined to employ his study and diligence to search out the remnant mysteries of that holy book, the Apocalypse. 2. Education 
It is not known where Napier received his early education, although from a letter of his uncle, written when the boy was ten, it is inferred that he was taught at home. At thirteen he was sent to St. Salvatore's College in the University of St. Andrews, whose head was Dr. Rutherford, the most distinguished teacher of the time in Scotland. But Napier took no degree. From this time until he was twenty-one there is no record. Napier may have studied abroad, as this was a common custom of the time with sons of Scottish nobles and gentlemen. 3. School Standing and Progress Napier acquired a wide knowledge of classical literature, although probably not at St. Andrews. Then he received an impetus to theological studies under the influence of the worthy man of God, Master Christopher Goodman. 4. Friends and Associates At college, he contracted a loving familiarity with a certain gentleman who was a papist, against whom he burst out in continual reasoning because of the blindness of the papists. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 125, relative coast of data, point two zero. Three Development from 17 to 26. There is no further record until Napier was 21, at which time he lived at Carchness, where his father possessed lands, and where he was soon engaged in building a spacious mansion. At 22, young Napier married Elizabeth, daughter of Sir James Stirling, his father's old friend. There is no further information until Napier, at the age of 38, was chosen a member of the General Assembly. AIIIQ 125, relative coastal data, point one one. Horatio Nelson, 1758 to 1805, a celebrated English admiral. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. On his father's side, Nelson came of a family of partisans, complex men who did their duty and had not a spark of genius. His father was a plain country parson, pierced, ponderous, grave, of weak physical constitution. His mother belonged to a family that included a number of persons of some note. Her father was a clergyman of distinction. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Tales of his early childhood credit Nelson with fondness for out-of-door activities requiring unusual physical courage. It is said that at 12 he volunteered the wish to go to sea with his uncle. His ambition from that time was to be a seaman. Before he was fifteen, Nelson prided himself in fancying that he could navigate his cutter better than any other boat in the ship. 2. Education Before he was twelve, Nelson had attended two grammar schools. From twelve to fourteen, he served under his uncle, Captain Suckling, on a guard ship, whence he was sent on a merchant ship to the West Indies to learn the elements of his profession as a foremast hand. When he had returned thence, a practical seaman, he turned his attention to navigation and gradually became a good pilot. Before he was fifteen, he was appointed to go to a polar expedition, and at fifteen, he went to the East Indies, a three years trip. 3. School Standing and Progress Nelson had no formal schooling after he was twelve. For his progress in seamanship, see 2, 2, and 6. 4. Friends and Associates Captain Suckling and the captains of successive ships on which he served took notice of Nelson and gave him an opportunity to learn and to advance. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and Achievement Before he was 15, Nelson prevailed upon Captain Lutwidge, in charge of the North Pole Expedition, to take him on as a coxswain to fill a man's place. Later he succeeded in winning appointment as the commander of a four-oared cutter with twelve men. At fifteen, he was possessed of the complete knowledge of an able seaman. On the journey to the East Indies, aged fifteen to eighteen, Nelson's smartness and attention to his duties were soon noticed. He was appointed midshipman and frequently permitted to manoeuvre the ship. From being a frail little boy, he had now become a stout athletic sailor. 7. Evidences of precocity. No specific record. AIIQ 125. Relative coast of data. 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. The voyage to the East Indies proved so detrimental to Nelson's health that in order to save his life, he was sent home before the completion of the cruise. At 18, he was appointed fourth lieutenant to a ship of 64 guns, and he enjoyed the complete confidence of his captain. After passing his lieutenant's examination in 19, he was appointed second lieutenant to a frigate of 32 guns and served with her a year, suffering again the while from ill health. A number of promotions followed, and at twenty he became post-captain with the frigate, which was markedly successful in capturing prizes. 
then followed a voyage to the West Indies, where young Nelson distinguished himself in a campaign against the city of Granada, but afterward he was stricken down with fever and returned to England. At twenty-three on his recovery, he was given command of a small frigate, and for two years he cruised in many waters, without any outstanding event occurring. His commander, Lord Hood, held him in high esteem for his knowledge of naval tactics. At twenty-five, Nelson returned to England and was presented by Lord Hood to the king. After an unsuccessful love affair, he left England again the following year in command of the Boreas. AIIQ Washington 45, relative question of data, point seven five. Joshua Reynolds, 1723-1792, a celebrated English portrait painter. AIIQ 125, AIIQ 125. 1. Family standing. Both of Reynolds' parents belonged to families of professional or cultural superiority. His father was a university man and the master of a free grammar school. His mother, a shrewd woman, came of a family of squires and rectors. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. All the Reynolds' children were fond of drawing. The younger ones, having no paper and pencils, were allowed to draw with burnt sticks on the walls of a long passageway. Joshua's productions were the least promising. He was the youngest of the artists, and he was called the Clown. A little later, the boy became fond of literary composition, and had not his love for art prevailed, it is probable he would have become an author, for the earliest accounts of him, as well as latter ones, indicate that he was a thinker. Under a perspective drawing of a wall perforated by a window, his father wrote, This is drawn by Joshua in school, out of pure idleness. But it was also his father who encouraged the boy's early interest in drawing. Joshua said at sixteen, when the choice of a profession was being made, that he would rather be an apothecary than an ordinary painter. 2. Education Joshua was taught by his father, under whose instruction he acquired a tolerable amount of Latin. At sixteen, his parent considered whether Joshua should become an apothecary or a painter. For the former occupation, the boy had already made some preparation. 3. School standing in progress. No specific record. C. 2. 2. 4. Friends and associates. No record. 5. Reading. At eight, Joshua read with great avidity and pleasure the Jesuits' perspective, which he had found by chance. He completely mastered the theory of this work. Reading Richardson's treatise on painting delighted him and influenced his artistic development. 6. Production and Achievement In his childhood, Joshua is reported to have composed rules of conduct. His first attempts at drawing were made in copying several little things done by two of his sisters. Afterward, he copied such prints as he met with among his father's books, especially the illustrations in Dryden's translation of Plutarch and Cat's Book of Emblems. He attempted at eight to draw the school at Plimpton, a building elevated on pillars. His father said the result was wonderful. From this the young artist proceeded to draw likenesses of the family and of friends with tolerable success. When not more than twelve, he painted a portrait on a piece of canvas which was part of a boat sail. This his first oil painting is said to have possessed little merit. During the following years, Joshua must have made some progress, for the painter Warhamol, who had seen his work at sixteen, said he would rather take him as an apprentice for nothing than another for fifteen pounds. 7. Evidences of Precocity C. 2, 1 and 6 AIIQ 125 Relative coefficient of data 0. 0.43 3. Development from 17 to 26 At 17, Joshua was apprenticed for three years to Mr. Hudson, who was then the principal portrait painter in England. Reynolds was, for a time at any rate, very happy with his master, but his apprenticeship was cut short before the appointed time, probably owing to jealousy on the part of the master. The young painter returned to his home, but soon was back in London, where his portrait of Captain Hamilton brought him, at twenty-three, considerable notice. The death of his father occurred at this time, and Reynolds returned to Plymouth, where he remained three years. He executed a number of portraits, including two admirable likenesses of himself, which show his gradual emancipation from the style of his teacher, Hudson. At 26, Reynolds sees an opportunity to visit Italy, an event which proved to be a turning point in his career. AIIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data, 0.43. Madame de Sevigne, Mary de Rabotun Chantel, 1626 to 1696, a French epistolary writer. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 
one family standing. On the paternal side, the Chantel family, although old and distinguished, had been gens de Epe, except for an author of valuable memoirs. The grandfather, at one time governor of Samur, was rewarded for bravery in battle by being made gentilhomme ordinaire de sa chambre by the king. The father, a great duelist, is described as dashing, lovable, and witty, one of the most accomplished cavaliers in France. He is reputed to have had an original and independent character. Madame de Savigny's maternal grandfather, who is one of the best and most honourable men of his time, was at one time a farmer, but rose to become Conseil de Roy and ses Conseils de Prive. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Mary was always fond of reading. She had the interest and taste of a charming and witty young woman of the highest and most cultivated society. She danced well and had a taste for singing. 2. Education. For a year after her mother's death, when she was seven and a half, she was instructed by her maternal grandmother. At the age of ten, she was placed in the care of a devoted uncle, the Abe de Livry, who gave her an excellent and unusual education. Indeed, the Abe appears to have been what she termed him, being born, and posterity is to be congratulated that her faculties were allowed to expand under his honest and reasonable intelligence. From this period, Mary's tutors were two learned men of considerable reputation, who had excellent literary judgment, and Menage, who was well versed in ancient and modern languages. At the age of sixteen, Mary was presented at the court of Anne of Austria, and there she soon learned the refinements which are required in polite society. 3. School standing and progress. Mary learned Italian very thoroughly, and she was also instructed in Spanish and Latin. 4. Friends and associates. No records are found of others than relatives, tutors, courtiers, etc. 5. Reading. C. 2. 2. The Italian poets were always numbered among her favourite authors, and the romances of Scanduri were her earliest occupations. 6. Production achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no record. AIIQ 125, relative question data 0.20. 3. Development of 17 to 26. After two brilliant years at the French court, Mary de Gentel married the clever Marquise de Savigny, whom she loved devotedly in spite of his unfaithfulness to her. With her husband, she continued to move in the scintillating intellectual court circles of the day. At 22, on the occasion of the birth of her son, her second child, Madame de Savigny wrote to her cousin the first of her celebrated letters. After her husband's death in a duel when she was twenty-five, Madame de Savigny devoted herself to the education of her children. AIIQ 135, will have coached her data point four three. Anthony Ashley Cooper, Earl of Shaftesbury, 1621-1683, a noted English statesman, created first Earl of Shaftesbury in, in 1678. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 130. 1. Family standing. Shaftesbury's paternal ancestors were of the first rank of gentry. His grandfather had been a member of one parliament, and his father, a baronet, had served in two. The maternal ancestry was even more distinguished than the paternal, for Shaftesbury's mother's father, a man of unusual character and ability, had served many years as a clerk of the Privy Council. He was knighted because of the part he had taken in the expedition against Cadiz. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. No record. 2. Education. Before Cooper was six and a half, his education began under the care of a tutor. From the age of 10 to 14, he was instructed by various tutors, of whom one was an excellent instructor in grammar. At 15, not unusually early age for those times, he entered Exeter College, Oxford, 3. School standing and progress. Cooper is said to have made an unusual progress in learning. At Oxford, his wit, affability and courage gained him the good will of the university. He improved himself more by conversation than by study. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. Cooper's grandfather grew very fond of the little prating boy. After the grandfather's death, when Cooper was six and a half, a great uncle wrongfully attempted to gain possession of the inherited estates. When only thirteen, Cooper went in person to the king's attorney, to whom he represented his cause with such pertness that his case was undertaken by the attorney, a friend of the grandfather, without fee. 
By his own account, Cooper was a recognized leader of the freshman class, for this was a military leadership rather than a scholastic one. He succeeded by his tactics in abating a number of evils to which the students had been subjected. 7. Evidences of Precocity, No Record AIIQ 125, Relative Quotient of Data, point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26 At 17, Cooper entered Lincoln's Inn as a law student. At 17 and a half, he married the daughter of a distinguished family. The next year, he was elected a member of the Parliament, entry in 19, a procedure which, although technically unlawful, was yet not uncommon. At 22, he joined the Royal Corps in the Civil War and was commissioned colonel. Later the same year, he became governor of Weymouth and Plymouth Islands. At 23, he went over to the Parliamentarians for a cause not explained and was in command of the parliamentary troops at the taking of Warham. The same year, he was commissioned Field Marshal General. At 24, he failed the election to Parliament. At 25, he was High Sheriff for Wiltshire. AIIIQ 130, Relative Coast of Data, point two zero. William Takuma Sherman, 1820-1891, an American general. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Sherman's ancestors were among the first colonists in America. His father was a judge of the Supreme Court. His mother was a plucky woman, descended from one of their historic families. 2. Development 2017. 1. Interests. It was said of Sherman that when he was at West Point, he was a healthy, affectionate boy, already committed loyally to his profession. His interests covered a range from painting to farming. 2. Education. Between the ages of 9 and 16, Sherman attended the Academy at Lancaster, and at 16 he entered West Point. 3. School standing of progress. No record C. 2. 1. 4. Friends and associates. Sherman was adopted upon the death of his father by the Honorary Thomas Ewing, a man who achieved a national reputation as lawyer and statesman. It was Ewing who secured Sherman's appointment to West Point. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production achievement. At 14, Sherman was Rodman on a canal survey. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ 125. Relative quotient of data. Point two zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26. In 19, Sherman stood 4th in the engineering class and 6th in geology, rhetoric, and moral philosophy. At 20, he graduated from West Point, ranking 6th in a class of 43. At 21, he was made 1st Lieutenant, having attained in 17 months a rank which requires generally 5 to 8 years of service. During the years from 20 to 25, Sherman's interests were not limited to the military profession. He studied painting and read law as well. AIIQ 135, Relative Commission of Data, point six zero. Jonathan Swift, 1667-1745, a celebrated English satirist and man of letters. AIIQ 125, AIIQ 130. 1. Family Standing Swift's grandfather was Thomas Swift, vicar of Goodrick, distinguished for his loyalty to the king during the Civil War. He invented warlike contrivances to annoy the roundheads. Swift's father had a tolerably good understanding. On the maternal side, Swift's grandfather was Elizabeth Dryden, a niece of Sir Rasmus, grandfather of John Dryden. His mother, who was very exact in all the duties of religion, was a woman with an easy and contented spirit and a sense of humour. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. When Jonathan was at school, the Latin words, me, dux, et, amas, dilux, struck his fancy and aroused a taste for the rhymed Latin English in which he later indulged. When he was fifteen, his interest in poetry was unusually strong, as is evidenced by his picking out an extraordinary strain in Cowley's love verses. In school, he neglected his academic studies, for some parts of which he had no relish by nature, and turned himself to reading history and poetry. 2. Education During the first three years of his life, Swift was in the care of a nurse, who was so careful of him that before he was returned to his mother at the age of three or four, he learned to spell. Between the ages of six and fourteen, he attended a grammar school, and at fourteen he entered the University of Dublin. 3. School Standing and Progress In college, aged fourteen and seventeen, 
Swift was so discouraged and sunk in his spirits by the ill treatment of his nearest relations, who, according to his own account, gave him the education of a dog, that he too much neglected his academic studies. When the time came at eighteen for taking his degree of Bachelor of Arts, though he had lived with great regularity and due observance of his statutes, he was stopped by his degree for dullness and insufficiency. He was defective in two out of three subjects in the usual terminal examinations. However, a study of the examination role of the 89 students examined in the same subjects reveals that Swift compares favourably with the best in all the list, excepting only two names. The degree was finally granted, but without distinction. 4. Friends and Associates. No record. 5. Reading. No information other than that given in 2.6. 6. Six Production Achievement. At the age of three, Jonathan could read any chapter in the Bible. 7. Evidences of Precocity. C. 2, 2 and 6. AIIQ 125. Relative Quotient of Data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After taking his degree, BA, at 18, Swift continued at college. When before he was 21, he had a mass of general reading in nearly every department of philosophy and letters, seldom equaled in its range and extent. But he was at least once admonished publicly, with six others, for notorious neglect of duties and frequenting the town. At 22, he served as amanuensis to Sir William Temple, a relative of his mother, and at the end of the same year, his patron recommended him for a Trinity College Fellowship. The result of the recommendation is not recorded. After another period with Temple, Swift was graduated M.A. at Oxford at 24. Swift's first literary effort, a paraphrase from Horace, was written before he was 25, and was followed merely by much other writing. It is said that Dryden remarked to Swift, at this time, you will never be a poet. At 25, Swift represented Temple, but without success, on a political mission. AIIQ 130, relative quotient of data, 0.53. Jacques Auguste de Thule, 1553 to 1617, a French historian and statesman. AIIQ 125, AIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Thule's paternal grandfather was president of the Parliament of Paris. His paternal grandmother was granddaughter of a chancellor in France. His uncles in the Thurl family were, respectively, Bishop of Chartres and a magistrate of unusual genius and a corruptible honesty, who was councillor clerk in the Parliament of Paris. His father, Christophe de Thurl, was president of the same parliament and a man of literary interests. Thurl's mother was a near relative of Chancellor Oliver and granddaughter of Denis de Guenet sister of the Chancellor of the same name. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Although a delicate child, Thur was always opposed to laziness. He showed an aversion to amusements and the pleasures which usually occupied children of his age, and devoted all his attention to painting. One of the most decided interests. He copied the engravings of Duder so correctly, his memoirs tell us, that he learned to form the letters of the alphabet before he could read. 2. Education. At ten, he attended the College de Bourgogne, where he was instructed by three celebrated French philosophers. He learned the elements of arithmetic and geometry, and he was especially drawn to the sciences. Three, school standing on progress. Since his health did not permit very arduous application to study, he was allowed to follow his own inclinations. Four, friends and associates, no specific record. Five, reading, no specific record. 6. Production and Achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of Precocity. C21. AIIQ 125. Relative coefficient of data. 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Though studied at Valence with Jacques Cujas, and he began a lasting friendship with the great scholar Joseph Scalinger. At 18, Thurl received minor orders and succeeded his uncle as canon of Notre Dame. But not content with books, he wished to know men of the world. At twenty there began for him an interesting period of travel in Italy and France, where he became a follower of Paul de Foy, and from this time dates his friendship with de Orsat, later cardinal. At twenty five, Thou was received as Councillor au Parliament, and thereafter he fulfilled the duties of his office satisfactorily, although he had little interest in them. 
AIIIQ 135, relative quotient of data put to zero. Diego Rodriguez de Silva y Velasquez. 1599-1660, a celebrated Spanish painter. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family standing. The Silvas were a fan with a long and honourable record. They did not lack means and always lived as noblemen. The painter's father acquired a decent competence by following the legal profession. The mother's parents were both members of the lesser nobility in Seville. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Diego in school turned his copy books into sketchbooks. 2. Education. At the grammar school he made good progress in languages and philosophy until he reached the age of 13, when his parents determined to let him give up his other studies and follow his decided talent for painting. His first painting teacher was Francisco Herrera, the first Spanish artist to throw off the timid conventional style and adopt the free, bold manner which was to become characteristic of the painting of Seville. After a year with this artist, Velasquez continued his studies for five years with Francisco Pacheco, learning a little from his master's teaching, but much more through self-instruction. 3. School standing and progress. Young Velasquez showed decided talent for every branch of knowledge. His kindred genius soon enabled him to understand and acquire Herrera's methods of execution, and in Pacheco's study, he learned all that his master himself knew. 4. Friends and associates. No further record. 5. Reading. No record before 19. 6. Production and Achievement While studying with Pacheco, Velasquez discovered that nature herself is the artist's best teacher, and industry his surest guide to perfection. He kept a peasant lad always with him as a model, and from him he executed many studies of heads. Grappling with every difficulty of expression, he devoted himself to still life also in order to acquire facility and brilliancy in colouring. Then came a period when he studied subjects of common life found in rich and picturesque variety in the streets and on the waysides. The celebrated water carrier of Seville, two young men at a meal, the vintage, the steward, the musicians, the breakfast, and the old woman preparing an omelette were executed before the artist was nineteen. 7. Evidences of Recursity His quick intelligence gave his parents a lofty idea of his gifts. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data point two zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Among Velasquez's first religious pieces were The Immaculate Conception and St. John the Evangelist, which were painted, probably, when the artist was 18, for the Calcieto Friars. At Pacheco's house, the youth came in contact with men of good taste, intellect and refinement, and listened to their discussions on art, science and letters, and especially poetry, for Louis de Congora was a visitor. In the master's rich supply of pictures, statues and books, and in his well-chosen library, he found additional sources of stimulation and instruction. Books on art, anatomy, perspective and architecture were his special interest, but he also mastered Euclid's geometry and Moyer's treatise on arithmetic. Velasquez's first dated picture is the Epiphany, painted when he was twenty. At the age of 23, the young artist went to Madrid with letters and introduction to gentlemen and patrons of art there who were instrumental in procuring him admission to all the royal galleries. Velasquez spent some months studying at the Prado and the Escorial. When, in the following year, Philip IV saw a portrait of Fornesca by Velasquez, he himself decided to sit for a life-size equestrian portrait. The resulting work met with such approval that Velasquez was at once engaged as court painter and the expenses of bringing his family to Madrid were paid by the king. At twenty-five, the artist painted another equestrian portrait of Philip IV, one of the finest portraits in the world. Another and very different picture of this year is Los Bebedores, which, for force of character and strength of colouring, has never been excelled, and its humour entitles Velasquez to the name of the Hogarth of Andalusia. AIIIQ 140, relative cost of data point two zero. Sir Robert Walpole, Earl of Orford, 1676 to 1745, a noted English statesman. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 130. 1. Family standing. 
Among Walpole's paternal ancestors were a number of persons of property and position. Both grandfather and father sat in Parliament. The latter, who was also a militia officer, was a jolly old squire of weak politics who revelled in outdoor sport and the pleasures of the table. The mother was the only daughter of Sir Geoffrey Burwell. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. In his boyhood, Robert cared little for books and subjects which can be learned from books. But he was precociously fond of an argument and full of ready humour. 2. Education. Up to the age of 14, Walpole received his preparatory training in a private school at Missingham, and from 14 to 19 he studied at Eton. 3. School study and progress. At Eton he was at first naturally indolent and disliked application, but the emulation of a public seminary and the exhortations of his father finally overcame the original inertness of his disposition, and before he quitted the school, he had so considerably improved himself in classical literature as to bear the character of an excellent scholar. His talents for oratory began to develop themselves at a very early period. A schoolmaster, hearing later that several former Eton scholars had distinguished themselves for their eloquence in the House of Commons, remarked, But I am impatient to hear that Robert Walpole has spoken, for I am convinced he will be a good orator. Walpole is said to have been, at Eton, superior to his future political enemy, St. John, quicker in brain and readier in tongue, an enmity existing between the two even then. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading. At Eton, Walpole developed a fondness for the works of Horace. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, C2, 1, and 3. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data, 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Walpole attended Cambridge from the age of 19 to 21, studying scarcely more than he had at Eton. He was withdrawn by his father when, upon the death of two older brothers, he became the family heir. They lived the life of a country landholder, and after his father's death, whereupon at 23 or 24, he was nominated to succeed the latter in Parliament. He married at 23. At 25, he went to Parliament to represent a more important constituency than his earlier one. AIIIQ 130, relative coefficient of data, 0.43. George Washington. 1732 to 1799, a famous American soldier and statesman, the first president of the United States. AIIQ 125, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Washington's parents belonged to the gentry. Both were members of successful thrifty families of property and standing. The father was kindly and affectionate, but absorbed in his business affairs. The mother was a woman of strong sense, imperious, not brilliant, but capable. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Washington was fond of outdoor sports. He could outwalk, outrun, and outride any of his companions, among whom he was recognized as a leader. When about 14, he thought of going to sea, but the plan was given up and he returned to his mathematics and mechanical drawing. The same year, he fell deeply in love. He began between 14 and 16 to write verses to the first lady of his affections, and latter to another. Washington liked to draw or caricature. He attended at 16 a singing school, engaged also in sword or fencing practice. 2. Education At an early age, between 3 and 7, Washington learned the alphabet and writing. At 7, he attended his first school. At 11, after his father's death, he attended a second school near the home of his stepbrother, with whom he lived. Here he received a fair common school education, with some mathematics, but no foreign languages except perhaps the rudiments of Latin. He learned to write a fair bold hand, and to make geometrical figures and notes of surveys with neatness and accuracy, but he was never a good speller. At fifteen or sixteen he seemed to have taken lessons from the licensed country surveyor. 3. School study on progress. Washington was usually studious. He was remembered later as industrious and assiduous at school. 4. Friends and Associates George's half-brother Lawrence and Lord Fairfax, both mature men of high standing, valued the boy's ability and believed him a youth of promise. 5. Reading Mather's Young Man's Companion, a companion with information on a wide variety of subjects, was a favourite work. When Washington was between 10 and 14, he studied it carefully and transcribed much of its material, especially taking to heart the rules of conduct. 
At 16, he had access to a library, and there he read the history of England and the essays of the Spectator. 6. Production and Achievement At 15, Washington became a professional surveyor. A number of his surveys made between the ages of 15 and 19 are preserved, and these are described as marvels of neatness and careful drawing. The responsible business of surveying the Fairfax estate was entrusted to the youthful engineer at 16. A diary kept at this period gives a singularly objective account of his experiences. 7. Evidences of recursity. No specific record. AIIQ 125, relative coefficient of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Washington's service as surveyor to Lord Fairfax lasts until his 19th year. The work was hard and the youth was exposed to considerable hardship. His confidence, carefulness and industry developed. Lord Fairfax was pleased with his work and on its completion obtained for him a post as public surveyor. Friction began to develop at this time between the French and the British, and in anticipation of war to come, George was trained by his brother in martial arts and exercises. At 21, George was appointed adjutant general and major and detailed to warn the French not to trespass on English preserves. On this journey, he was able to win the allegiance of the Indians, and he returned with a valuable report on the French forces. At 22, Washington was appointed lieutenant colonel of a Virginia regiment, and during the tenure of this appointment, was noted for his coolness and his energy. Although a first successful encounter was followed by a forced surrender to the French, Washington was considered a courageous and gallant soldier, and on the conclusion of the campaign he was appointed, age 23, colonel on Braddock's staff. In the same year, he distinguished himself by his bravery in further encounters with the French, and he showed by his advice, which was, however, not accepted, a grasp of conditions essential to success. At the conclusion of the campaign, he made a trip to Boston, where he enjoyed the gaiety of city life for a season. At 25, he was appointed chief of the forces for the defense of Virginia, and in spite of stupidity and inefficiency on the part of the government, he carried out his duties for three years with prudence and skill. His reputation as a military commander was firmly established. AIIIQ 135, relative coverage of data 0.75. End of section 19. Section 20 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses, by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 17. Cases rated at AIIQ 130 to 140. Part 1. Honoré de Balzac, 1799-1850, to 1850, a celebrated French novelist. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. Balzac's father, who held a high position in the military commissariat in 1814, was descended from peasants, small landowners and day labourers. He was studious and an original thinker, the author of numerous pamphlets on philanthropic and scientific questions. The mother, a distinctly practical woman of strong character and many gifts, was quite unable to understand her son's dreams and ambitions. At the time of Honoré's birth, his parents were in comfortable circumstances and of good social repute. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Balzac's interests were literary from a very early age. He composed juvenile comedies before he was eight, and was passionately devoted to mature reading during his school days at Vendôme. At fourteen, he confided to his sister and brother, You shall see, I am going to be a great man. 2. Education After receiving his first instruction from a nursery governess, he attended the principal day school in the town. From the age of eight to fourteen, he attended the college school at Vendôme, where the school life was semi-monastic, with their discipline of iron. The pupils never left its walls until their course of study was ended. A tutor was supposed to give Balzac special lessons in mathematics, but by tacit understanding, the teacher paid no attention to the pupil, who spent the time thus left free in reading. After leaving Vendôme, Honoré attended successfully at an institution at Tours and two establishments in Paris. 3. School standing in progress. Though he showed no aptitude as a scholar, 
Balzac was still very young when he began to make remarks Francis, of singular penetration and meditative wisdom. But he was seldom successful in the competitive examinations and accordingly received from his parents more reproaches than praise. 4. Friends and Associates None are mentioned specifically. 5. Reading Before he was eight, Balzac read with enthusiasm fairy stories whose dramatic endings made him weep. During his school days at Vendôme, no book seemed to him to restore, nor too repellent, nor too obscure for his youthful understanding. He read widely in religion, chemistry, physics, history and philosophy, and even developed a special taste for dictionaries. 6. Reduction and Achievement As a little lad less than eight, he manifested a certain inventiveness in improvising baby comedies, which had more appreciative audiences than some of his mature stage productions. While at school in Vendôme, he began a metaphysical composition entitled Treatise of the Will, which was, however, confiscated and never restored to him. Between the ages of 15 and 17, he composed for an examination the speech of Brutus's wife after the condemnation of her sons, which, according to his sister, exhibits his characteristic energy and realistic presentation. 7. Evidences of Precocity in his autobiographical Louis Lambert, Balzac described his prodigious memory and power of assimilation when he was a schoolboy at Vendôme. His eye would take in seven or eight lines at once, and his mind would grasp the meaning with a velocity equal to that of his glance. His memory could retrace the progress and entire life history of his mind from the earliest acquired ideas down to the latest ones. See also 2, 3. AIIQ 130 Relative quotient of data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Balzac continued to cherish ambitious hopes while his father made practical plans for him. For three years, 17 to 20, the youth served a law apprenticeship, finding time, however, to write both prose and verse, but upon receiving his notary's license, 20, he refused to become a practicing lawyer. After a year of incredible hardship in a garret, during which he produced nothing successful, he returned home and entered upon a period of enormous productivity. While the novels of this period are not in any way compared with his later masterpieces, being frankly hack work, he wrote within five years, 21 and 26, more than 31 volumes of romantic novels, of which 13 were published at the time, as well as a number of excellent pamphlets. AIIIQ Washington 45, relative coastal data, 0.75. Robert Burns, 1759 and 1796, a famous Scottish lyric poet. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 130. 1. Family Standing The Burns family had been farmers for four generations, but the grandfather was interested in education, and with some of the neighbouring farmers built a schoolhouse for the children. The father was a peasant and a saint of the old Scottish stamp. He understood men, but his temperament did not make it easy for him to get along with them. The mother was a peasant girl of humble birth and of no education, but very sagacious. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Favourite pastime of Robert's youth included listening to the weird tales and strange legends of an old neighbour woman, reading every book he would lay hands on, C25, and learning French, C22. Interests like these absorbed his attention when he was free from the hard manual toll of the farmer's day. 2. Education At the age of five, Burns was sent to a little school at some distance from his home, which he attended until, a little later, his father and some others established a school near at hand. Here the textbooks included the Bible, the spelling book, Mason's collection of prose and verse, and Fisher's English grammar. After the schoolmaster left his charge when Robert was nine, the Burns boys were instructed by their father, who tried to give them some idea of geography and history, and provide also for their reading works on astronomy and natural history. When Robert was thirteen, his father became concerned over the boys' poor writing, and so the two brothers were sent to school for the summer term. At fourteen, Robert received a brief course of training from his former teacher while visiting him for a few weeks in the town. Some years later, he concluded his schooling with a final summer term. At fourteen, he acquired a little French from his master, who was himself learning it. Later, he continued his study without instruction, reading 
first Telemanque, and later, after a little further help from an interested country gentleman, various French prose writings. He was advised to learn Latin in the same way, but this proved too dry, and the attempt was given up. Young men of education took an interest in the lad and gave him books. 3. School Standing and Progress Burns's teacher said that Robert and his brother made rapid progress in reading and tolerable progress in writing. In reading, dividing words into syllables by rule, spelling without books, parsing sentences, etc., Robert and Gilbert were generally at the upper end of the class. Even when ranged with boys by far their seniors, they committed to memory hymns and other poems with great facility, and they soon learned to make prose paraphrases. But neither had an ear for music. At first, Gilbert appeared to exceed Robert in imagination and wit, while Robert was grave, serious, contemplative, and before he was ten, a critic in substantives, verbs, and particles. 4. Friends and Associates Burns teacher, Mr. Murdoch, was also his valued friend, exerting upon the pupil perhaps a greater influence than any beside his parents. Robert's social disposition knew your bounds. His friends included both commoners and gentry. 5. Reading The two books which gave young Robert the greatest pleasure were The Life of Hannibal, read at nine, and The History of Sir William Wallace, read somewhat later. For a time these were his only books, outside of school, and he read and re-read them. Before he was ten, he heard Titus Andronicus read aloud, which so injured his sensibilities that he cried out that he would burn it, if it were left there, although the master had brought it to him as a gift. The school for love was then left in its place. At nine, the lad read with avidity the books his father could obtain, such as The History of the Bible, Popular Scientific Works, or An Arithmetic. A collection of letters from eminent men was sent by an uncle. At thirteen, Robert read his first novel, a volume of Richardson, and a volume of English history. At fourteen, he read Pope's works and some other poetry, almost the first that he had seen. 6. Production and Achievement Burns' early activities were varied. He assisted at thirteen in threshing the corn, and became at fifteen the principal labourer on his father's farm. He first committed the sin of rhyme, at fourteen in composing that charming little song, Handsome Neil, and became enough a debater and disputant at about the same time to rouse a hue and cry of heretic. 7. Evidences of Precocity Before he was seven, Burns was noted for a retentive memory, a stubborn, sturdy something in his disposition, and an enthusiastic idiot, childish pity. But at school his teacher never guessed that he was to be a poet. His quick acquisition of French at fourteen was considered unusual, and brought him to the notice of people in the town. AIIQ 130, relative kosher data, 0.75. 3. Developed from 17 to 26. Burns wrote of his life from the farm at Mount Oliphant, as characterised by the cheerless gloom of a hermit with unceasing moil of a galley slave. The family condition was bettered on the whole by removal to Leclerc, when Burns was 18, yet the youth was still dissatisfied with farm work. To divert himself, he read quickly in agriculture, philosophy, religion and poetry. The reading at this time of a collection of songs had an important influence on his literary development. Ambition began to stir him, and as yet he had no aim. In the attempt to escape from a weary routine of his life, he dallied with love affairs. He formed a bachelor's club with the object of amusement and admiration of the fair sex. Then he fell in love with Ellison Begbie, and wrote for her Mary Morrison, but she rejected him a year later. During the Leclerc period, Burns wrote, beside Mary Morrison, My Nanny O, Winter, an Autumn Song to Peggy, and other simple folk tales. In the meantime, he had taken a course in surveying. At twenty-two, he became a flax dresser of Irvine. But now his fortunes heaped upon him. The shop was burned, his father was stricken down with consumption, and he was jilted by a second lady. Burns described himself at twenty-four as a man of some sense, a great deal of honesty, and unbounded good will to every creature, rational or irrational. After the death of their father, when Robert was twenty-five, the poet and his brother took a farm at Mossigel. The prevailing despondency and melancholy of that year is reflected in the satire of Holy Fair and Holy Willie's Prayer. The next year at twenty-six, Burns met Jane Armour, 
and this event in his life was followed by a year of great literary production, whose outstanding examples are The Cotter's Saturday Night and The Jolly Beggars. AIIIQ 130, Relative Quotient Data 0 0.60 Antonio Canova, 1757-1822, a celebrated Italian sculptor. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 140, 1. Family Standing the Canovers were workmen, stone cutters, and builders, who for several generations supplied their region with its minor works of the stone cutter's art. Antonio's father and grandfather were both successful craftsmen. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. The bias of Canova's mind was to sculpture, and every opportunity for learning was seized upon. Interest was centred in his art, and in the studies related to it. A gallery of plaster casts belonging to his patron in Venice delighted him and became a place for careful study. Canova formed resolution when he was about sixteen, which he adhered to for some time, never to close his eyes at night without having formed some design. 2. Education Antonio's early training was given by his grandfather, who had adopted him after his father's death and the mother's remarriage. The boy's early years were passed in study, as soon as he was able to hold a pencil. He was initiated into the principles of drawing, employed by his grandfather a little later on the works on which the latter was engaged. He acquired mechanical skill and accuracy in execution. Then followed two years of training under the sculptor Tordato, and at their conclusion, Canova accompanied his teacher to Venice, where he studied and worked for eight years, aged 15 to 23, first under Tordato, and after his death under his nephew Ferrari. At sixteen, the boy determined to strike out for himself in an attempt to follow the paths of the ancients to true art. Because of their importance for sculpture, he began to study of anatomy, archaeology, ancient and modern history, and continental languages. He had formed a studio of his own in a monastery where friendly monks permitted him to work. 3. School standing and progress. Canova had no formal school training. 4. Friends and associates. His master, the elder and the younger Toretto, and the patrician and patron of art, Falieri, befriended and encouraged him. See 2, 2, and 6. 5. Reading. Canova's reading was incidental to the study of his art. See 2, 2. 6. Production and achievement. At the age of eight, Canova executed two small shrines of Carrara marble, which are still extant. From about this age, he appears to have been constantly employed under his grandfather, that he had attained considerable proficiency at the age of thirteen is attested by two baskets of fruit, his workmanship at that time. It is no wonder that his skill was noticed. It is fortunate that he who noticed it was the nephew of the noted Venetian sculptor Toretto, who placed the boy, for his greater advancement, with this famous uncle and arranged that he should go with him to Venice. Canova began his first important statue, Erudice, at fifteen and completed it before he was sixteen a work highly esteemed by his artistic friends, and he had begun the companion statue, Orpheus, before the Erudice was finished. 7. Evidences of precocity. Antonio's carvings at 8 attest the early appearance of his special talent. AIIQ 130, relative coach to data, 0.20. 3. Developed from 17 to 26. From his 15th to his 23rd year, Canova studied under Toretto, and after the latter's death, with Ferrari, scorning the debased and artificial Rococo art of the day. The young artist turned to nature, whom he studied and imitated. The Orpheus, executed first at 16, in soft stone and repeated at 19 in marble, was exhibited by the Academy of Venice, and acclaimed with admiration. The early impression made by the young sculptor on his countrymen was strengthened when at 21 he exhibited the life-size group Daedalus Necorus. Approval was general, and for this work Canova received his first significant financial reward. At 23, Canova removed to Rome. This time, modern Italian art was dead, but the young sculptor, introduced for the first time to classical antiquity, regarded this period as the true beginning of his artistic life. He was befriended by the Venetian ambassador, who secured his entry to literary and artistic circles. It was during this year, or the next, that a pension was granted by the Venetian government, with a provision that the sculptor furnished to the city copies of ancient works. Because of the restriction, Canova refused to accept this bounty. 
At 24, Theseus Fanguishing the Minotaur was exhibited. Its style and beauty occasioned surprise and admiration. A year later, Canova commenced the monument to Ganginelli, Clement, 14, which, on its completion, when he was 29, established firmly the artist's reputation. AIIQ 140, Relative Coast Data, point four three. Pierre Corneille, 1606 to 1684, a celebrated French dramatist. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing Corneille's family had for several generations been prosperous members of the middle class. The paternal grandfather held the position of councillor in the Parliament of Rouen. The father was a parliamentary lawyer and a government official of some standing, who was eventually ennobled. The mother was of similar social standing, both her father and grandfather having been in the legal profession. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests. No specific record. 2. Education. At an early age, Pierre was placed in the Jesuit school at Rouen, where he remained until he reached the age of 16. After leaving school, he spent two years in the study of law. 3. School standing and progress. At 12, Corneille won a second prize for Latin verse, and at 14, he was awarded another prize for distinction in the same subject. At 14, he finished the course in rhetoric in his school, at 15, in logic, and at 16, the course in physics. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production achievement, no record. 7. Evidence of precocity. No record beyond the evidence given in 2, 3. AIIQ 130, relative coach to data, point five three. Three development from 17 to 26. After leaving school, Corneille studied law and was admitted to the bar at 18. But he practiced with neither pleasure nor success, and shortly he began to devote himself to poetry. By the time he was 23, his father had secured for him two offices, probably sinecures, which he held for 21 years. About this time, his first comedy, Millet, was successfully produced in Paris, and was followed at intervals by other dramatic productions. His fame was established in 1636, where at the age of 30, he reduced the tragedy to Cid. AII IQ 140, relative data, point six zero. Heinrich Hain, 1797-1856, a celebrated German poet and critic of Hebrew descent. AII IQ 130. AIIIQ 145. There is some question as to the year of Heine's birth. 1797 seems the most probable date. 1. Family standing. Heine's paternal ancestors were Jews, many of whom had, in the last two generations, become successful businessmen. His father, a poor businessman of Hamburg, was, however, a weak, vain man whose chief pleasure was to dress well. Aimless and superficial, he was incapable of guiding his own or his family's destinies. The duty of home direction fell upon his wife, an energetic, loving mother, herself uneducated, but the descendant of a Jewish family man of whose members had been professional men. In contrast to her husband, she had a good deal of taste for literature, art, and music. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Little Heinrich's first nurse was a believer in witches and their craft, and it was she who introduced her willing listener to the folk superstitions. At twelve and again at fourteen, in catching sight of the great Napoleon, Hein felt his own natural thirst for independence and liberalism accentuated. 2. Education Hein was taught the alphabet by his mother, who drew the letters on a door with chalk. His first school instruction was imparted by an old dame, but at ten he was sent to the Lycee at Dusseldorf, where grammar, history, geography, Latin, Greek, French and arithmetic were taught. At this school he had a first lesson on the dangers of free speech, for he received a sound thrashing as a result of the uproar which arose when he told the news that his grandfather was a little Jew with a long beard. Out of school hours, Hain made the acquaintance of an old French drummer, with whom he learned the French language and French politics. Hain entered the highest class of his school at fourteen, the usual age of entrance for the sons of the professional class. Two or perhaps three years later, Hain, aged sixteen or seventeen, left school, but without taking the university entrance examination. 3. School standing and progress. Hein was a studious boy and learning was easy for him. He was well trained in modern languages and knew as much of the ancient as his ill-prepared instructors were able to teach him. 
4. Friends and Associates Among his classmates, Heinrich was friendly with Dieterich, the painter, and one Franz. Rector Schellmayer and Professor Schramm were interested to him as a little boy, and assisted him in his lessons. But the most influential of his friends were the French drummer, the Grand, and an uncle, a peculiar man who wrote for obscure periodicals and newspapers, and first aroused Heinrich's desire to write. He allowed the boy the use of his library. 5. Reading In the library of his uncle, Hein borrowed, among dusty manuscripts, tomes of philosophy and occultism, antiquated medical works and more orthodox classics. The lad himself mentions the effect Don Quixote made upon his youthful mind and states that he read also Gulliver's Travels and Stern's novels. 6. Production and Achievement At sixteen, Hein wrote his first verses, the poem Weinbergiade, a satirical lay of school life, characterised as a clever performance. He probably wrote several other poems before leaving school. 7. Evidences of Precocity The youth early manifested signs of a satirical humour and a taste for the romantic. At sixteen, he fell in love with the niece of a witch whom he adored, as he says, in scorn of society and all its dark prejudices. AI IQ 130, relative coefficient of data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Heinrich would like to go to the university, but since his Jewish blood debarred him from all professions except the medical, for which he had no taste, he turned to commerce. He served at Frankfurt with a banker, and later in Hamburg with his millionaire uncle. During his residence in the northern city, he fell in love with his cousin, and stimulated by this devotion, wrote a number of poems, of which six were printed in a local newspaper. The commercial aspect of the town and his life depressed him. He longed for fuller intellectual experience, and so at 21, he went to Dusseldorf to prepare for the University of Bonn, which he entered six months later with a reputation already established as a verse-maker. Now he attended lectures on law, literature and history, and with the encouragement of professors Schlegel and Arndt, took up the translation of Byron's Farewell. At 22, he published three poems, but a year later he was again despondent. The pedantic atmosphere at Bonn grated against his nature. His verses were refused by Brokhoas. His cousin, Amiel, was engaged to a landowner, and finally he was suspended from the university for being a challenger in a duel. At 23, he left Bonn and went to the University of Berlin. The more brilliant atmosphere of the capital satisfied him. He attended lectures by Hegel, Hagen, Bopp and Wolff, and resumed his law studies. In the following year, at 24, he published George Leiden, Almanzar, Radcliffe, and Lyricis in Thermesor. Following this, he paid a visit to his home, where, bored and listless, he loitered away nearly a year. At 27, he was baptised, a necessary preliminary, and received his doctor's degree. AII IQ 145, relative quotient of data 0 0.60. Johann Gottfried Herder, 1744-1803. to 1803 a German critic and poet of the so-called classical period of German literature. AIIQ 130, AIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing Herder's grandfather, a native of Silesia, was a small farmer. The father, by trade a weaver, was a teacher of a girls' elementary school. He was a man of strict regularity, unflinching industry, unfailing devotion to duty, and of so great a reputation for honesty that he was often resorted to by his neighbours for counsel. Herder's maternal grandfather was a blacksmith. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Young Herder early learned to love melody and tone, for it was the custom of the family to meet together, after the work of the day, to sing a religious song led by the father. The latter must have had ability in this line, as he directed the choir in the Polish church of his city. The boy, who was always grave and serious, never playing like other children, he loved solitary walks in the woods, listening to the birds and collecting flowers. Such a passion for reading developed in early childhood that the father finally had to forbid the bringing of books to the dinner table. At five, Herder was first afflicted with a fistula in his eye, which was a source of suffering throughout his life, and perhaps increased a tendency to melancholy. Oppressed by the harshness of his teacher, Grimm, and the tyranny, of the pietistic Treschow, Herder at sixteen longed for death. 2. Education Johann Gottfried memorized many verses from the Bible, 
and was instructed in the elements of learning at home. Then he was sent to the town school, which, however, did not at that time maintain a high standing. The stern schoolmaster exemplified tyranny, dry pedantry, and dogmatic learning, but he taught Latin grammar thoroughly, together with a smattering of Greek and Hebrew. A new pastor, Treshko, convinced Herder's parents that their poverty and the weakness of the boy's eye were insurmountable obstacles to the getting of a higher education, and so induced them to allow their son to become, at sixteen, his general servant and amanuensis. 3. School Standing and Progress Herder's thirst for knowledge, his pleasing manner, and his rapid school progress made him one of his teacher's favourite pupils, with the practical consequence that the pupil received private lessons from his instructor in the Greek New Testament, in Homer and in logic. 4. Friends and Associates Herder was drawn closely to his mother because of her tenderness, sympathy, and imagination. She taught him to pray, to think, and to feel. But he lived for the most part in the world of his own, shunned human society, and confided his hopes and plans for the future to no one. His teacher and a pastor encouraged the boy in his ambitions for the ministry, but another pastor, Treshko, refused to recognise the budding genius. 5. Reading Herder's passion for reading was so great that as he walked along the streets, he would watch the windows, and whenever he saw a book, he would knock at the door and ask to borrow it. In Treshko's library, Herder, at 16, found a treasure house. He reads secretly, far into the night, in the works of the Greek and Roman authors, in books of travel and theological literature, and he devoured the works of the new German poets, Kleist, Gellert, Uz, Kopstock, and Gleim. 6. Production and Achievement Eight undated poems are assigned to the period before Herder was 17. They show classical training, deep feeling, and the effects which misunderstanding had upon his sense of spirit. The titles of the eight suggest their character, Battle Song of the Besiegers of Heaven, to himself the Pindaric Imitator, Song of Mourning, Wishes for a Friend, The Emotions of Friendship, Lament for Himself, Elegy, and Longing for Rest and Death. 7. Evidences of Recosity. No further record. AIIQ 130. Relative coast of data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Herder's first dated poem, an ode purporting to be written by an ancient Jew to Cyrus, was placed by its author anonymously with the manuscript of Trishko's when the latter was dispatched to the bookseller. Although the poem was favourably received and printed, Trishko's only comment was a reprimand to Herder for his unwarranted act. A physician of a Russian regiment, recognising Herder's talents, took him to Konigsberg to teach him surgery, in return for which Herder was to translate a medical work into Latin, but the poet soon found that the study of medicine was utterly distasteful. At 18 he passed with honour the required university entrance examinations before the Dean of Theology. While he attended the university, he maintained himself by teaching. He attended the lectures of Professor Kant, and was much influenced and inspired by his teacher's point of view. The great Hermann became his close friend. When after two years of study Herder left Konigsberg, he was already regarded as a genius destined for distinction as poet, teacher, preacher, or man of science. The following years Herder spent in Riga, where he held the office of instructor in the cathedral school. He was successful in teaching and in disseminating progressive educational ideas. He became an intellectual leader and was sought after as an honoured friend. In order to keep him in Riga, the city government appointed him pastor adjunctus of two suburban churches. People crowded to hear him preach. At 22 and 23, he published fragments on the new German literature and forests of criticism. After an illness, he left Riga and spent his 26th year in travel visiting Nantes, Paris, where he met Diderot and de Allenbert. Hamburg, where he met Lessing, among other notables, and Strasbourg, where he met the youthful Goethe and became his mentor. The same year, Herder received the prize of the Berlin Academy for an essay on the development of language, one of his best works, and he accepted the position of head preacher at Duckburg. AIIIQ 155, relative coefficient of data, 0. 0.75. Christian Huygens, 1629 to 1695. Dutch natural philosopher and mathematician. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family standing. Huygens' father was Sir 
Constantin Huygens, son of a man of great political importance, who was secretary to the state council at The Hague. Sir Constantin was a famous Dutch poet and diplomatist of extraordinary intellectual powers, great physical beauty and strength, and skilled in playing the lute and painting pictures. He became, indeed, the most brilliant figure in Dutch literary history, and is characterized as the grand signer of the Republic, the type of aristocratic oligarchy, the jewel and ornament of Dutch liberty. Concerning the mother of Christian, Susanna van Berl, there is no information. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. C. 2. 2. 2. Education. Christian received from his father his first instruction in ancient languages and mathematics. When he was nine, he was called by his parent an example of living pity. At fifteen, he was taught mathematics by Stampion, a mathematician of some fame. And at sixteen, he went to the University of Leiden to study law under the famous Vinius. According to the rules of conduct which his father sent him at this time, he read a chapter of the New Testament every morning, studied drawing, and took music lessons on the organ beside following the lectures of Vinius and the course in mathematics. Each day before dinner, he devoted some time to literature. 3. School standing and progress. C. 2. 2. 4. Friends and associates. No further record. 5. Reading. No further record. 6. Production and achievement. No further record. 7. Evidences of precocity. No further record. AI IQ 130. Relative quotient data. 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. From 17 to 19, Hagen studied mathematics at Brady University with the famous Van Schutten. He also exercised his ability in drawing and said the greatest pastime he had was drawing with chalk. At 20, he accompanied the mission of Henry of Nassau to Denmark. At 22, he published the Exitasis Quadraturae Circuli, an attack on the unsound system of quadratures. Before he was 23, he published his next scientific work, De Circuli Magnitudinine Inventa, which attracted the attention of Descartes. At 25, he wrote a treatise in which he made the closest approximation so far obtained to the ratio of circumference to the diameter of a circle. AII IQ 150, relative coast of data 0.53. Washington Irving, 1783 to 1859 an American historian, essayist, and novelist. AIIQ 130, AIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Irving's father was descended from one of the oldest and most respectable families of Scotland. He was a sedate and God-fearing man who had small sympathy with the amusements of his children and lost no opportunity of giving their thoughts a serious turn. The mother, granddaughter of an English curate, was a woman of lovingly demonstrative and impulsive character, whose gentle nature and fine intellect won the tender veneration of her children. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Through his boyhood, Irving was full of vivacity and innocent mischief. In fact, his sportiness and disinclination to religious seriousness gave his mother some anxiety. He had a love of music which later became a passion and a great fondness for the theatre, he would steal away early to play, return for family prayers, then slip through his window and return to enjoy the finish of the piece. He was inspired by his reading with an impelling desire to go to sea and would wander about the pier heads watching the departing ships. 2. Education At four years, Irving was sent to a school kept by Mrs. Kilmaster, in which he continued nearly two years. From 6 to 14, he attended a school kept by a revolutionary soldier. He completed his preparatory course before he was 16 and then entered upon a two-year apprenticeship in a law office. He never ceased to regret in later life that he did not go to college as his two brothers had done. 3. School Standing and Progress In his first school, he made very little progress beyond the alphabet. In the second, he was a favourite with the master, whose portability, however, seems to have been due to an appreciation of the boy's truthfulness rather than to the recognition of any indications of talent. Irving excelled in some position, but arithmetic he found tedious. He would sometimes do the written work of other boys in exchange for the solution of mathematical problems. Irving's period of apprenticeship in law was marked by considerable proficiency in better's letters, but very slender advancement 
in the dry technicalities of the practice. Four friends and associates, no record. Five reading. A taste for reading was early developed. A ten hooks translation of the Orlando Furioso inspired the youth to perform mock feats of bravery in the yard of his home. Books of voyages and travels became his passion at eleven, this interest being first awakened by Robinson Crusoe and Sinbad the Sailor. Not allowed to read at home after retiring, Irving used to secrete candles in order to indulge in the forbidden pleasure. He would also take books to school and snatch moments of reading under the shelter of his desk. 6. Production and Achievement After seeing Jefferson in the comedy Speculation, Irving, age 13, was inspired to write a play which was then presented at a friend's house. 7. Evidences of Precocity C. 2.3 AIIQ 130, relative cost of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Following his apprenticeship, Irving became a law clerk in the office of Josiah Hoffman, whose household became his second home. A little later, aged 21, on account of poor health, he was sent on a trip to Europe, where he visited France, Italy, Switzerland, and England. He was admitted to the bar on his return, but found his chief interest in the publication of the humorous Selma Gandhi a semi-monthly periodical started by his brother and James Paulding. At 25, he began work on A History of New York, which was finished and published the following year. AIIIQ 145, relative coast of data 0.43. Jean-Paul Marat, 1743-1793, to 1793, a French revolutionist. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 130. 1. Family Standing. Marat's father has been reported variously as a man of education, by profession, a physician, a designer who had abandoned his country and religion and married a Swiss Protestant, and a painter and designer. All authorities agree that he was interested in giving his son a good education. Marat's mother, to whom her son was devoutly attached, loved justice and humanity, and inspired in her son John Paul a spirit of service to his fellow men. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Marat wrote from his earliest years, he had devoured by the love of glory, which never left him for a moment. At the age of five, I wished to be a school teacher, at fifteen a professor, at eighteen an author, at twenty a creative genius. By the age of ten, I had formed the habit of leading a studious life. 2. Education. The boy received a very thorough education in his father's home, and thus escaped all the vicious practices of childhood, which degrade and enervate the man. He is supposed to have spent two years, about 16 to 18, studying medicine at Bordeaux. 3. School standing and progress. Docile and diligent, my masters could obtain anything from me by kindness. At the University of Bordeaux, his capacious mind readily absorbed learning, yet a keen perception and his memory was mildly retentive. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidence of Precocity, no record. AIIQ 130, relative coefficient of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. From the age of 16 to 30, history loses sight of merit, except to record that he spent his 14 years in travel and study. At 30, he made his first appearance as an author in the Philosophical Essay of Man, which shows remarkable knowledge of philosophy and psychology and an original approach to both. AIIIQ 130, relative coast of data 0.11. Jules Mazarin, 1602-1661, a French statesman, AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Mazarin's parents were Sicilians who were living in Rome at the time of Jules's birth. The father was a man of fair education and shrewdness who found favour with his patron, and advanced his own fortunes and those of his children. The mother was a lovable woman who held the affection of her son. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. From the age of five, Jules was distinguished for the spirit and graceful manner in which he joined in the religious exercises of the Oratorian Fathers. By the age of sixteen, he had an aptitude for things, but particularly for intrigue, and was well known for his passion for gambling. 2. Education. His mother wished to give him his first instruction then when he was barely seven, 
he was sent to a Jesuit college in Rome, where he remained for nine years. 3. School Standing and Progress At the Jesuit college, he showed himself an apt scholar. 4. Friends and Associates At 16, Mazarin entered the world as an attaché of the colonial family. His companions were then young nobles, eager for pleasure and impatient of restraint. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement In a dramatic representation by the Jesuits, Mazarin, at 16, played the leading role with such ability and naturalness that the whole assembly was overwhelmed with admiration, and he was feted and honoured as the greatest actor they had ever seen. When the famous comet of 1618 appeared, Pere Grassi, his professor in astronomy, had the boy, aged 16, sustain a public thesis on this subject before a great number of cardinals, princes, and other learned men. Mazarin proved worthy of his professor's confidence, and displayed in his arguments such ease, confidence, and eloquence that he won unanimous commendation. The Jesuit fathers desired so promising youth for their order, but he resisted their solicitations, preferring to enter the service of the court. At that time, gambling was universal, and superior skill and judgment enabled Mazarin and Luck to join in this amusement of his betters, and gain from it the means of equaling their extravagance and display. See also 2, 1, and 3. 7. Evidence as a precocity. At birth, Mazarin had hair and two teeth, a fact to which he always enjoyed alluding, and it is said that his parents were struck by the intelligence which he manifested very early, See also 2, 1, 3, and 6. AI IQ 130, relative coefficient of data, 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After passing several times from poverty to riches, Mazarin tired of court life and was glad to be sent by Colonna to the University of Alcora as chamberlain to the young duke. Here he won distinction for his gambling and his gallant adventures rather than for superiority in his studies. He thoroughly mastered the Spanish tongue and the Spanish fashion of making love, and was barely extricated by the Duke from an untimely marriage. At twenty he took his degree as Doctor of Laws, and then became Captain of Infantry in the Regiment of Coluna, taking a distinguished part in the petty civil wars of that period. AII IQ 135, relative coast of data, 0.43. Jean-Baptiste Poquelin, Molière, 1622-1673 a celebrated French dramatist and actor, the greatest French writer of comedies. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 130. 1. Family Standing Moliere's paternal grandfather and father, and his maternal grandfather as well, were prosperous upholsterers. The father became royal tapissier. He was a strenuous, thrifty shopkeeper, but a generous father, intensely concerned in giving his son an excellent education. The mother was apparently a woman of considerable character and some education. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. It is said that little Moliere was taken to the theatre by his grandfather, who, when the father remonstrated, said that he hoped his grandson might become as good a comedian as the favourite of that day. This inspired the boy with a desire to go on the stage, and developed in him a dislike of the upholstering trade. At school, his inclination for literature made him study the poets with great care. 2. Education Up to the age of 10, the boy was educated by his mother. From the age of 14 to 19, he attended the Jesuit College of Clermont, which would presuppose considerable previous instruction. The course of study was devoted chiefly to the classics, especially Latin, but the students sometimes presented dramas. At 15, Moliere was officially appointed his father's successor as royal upholsterer. 3. School standing and progress. As school, it is said that his quick intelligence distinguished him from all others. Good in classics, he was excellent in philosophy. 4. Friends and associates. No specific record. 5. Reading. Moliere knew the classics well, especially Terence. He was an enthusiastic student of Lucretius, and it is thought that he made a translation from that poet while he was at school, for a few lines of such a translation occur in Le Misanthrope. 6. Production and Achievement, C25. 7. Evidence of Precocity, no specific record. AIIQ 130, relative coefficient of data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. While at Clermont, Moliere counted among his friends Chapelle, 
Bernier, Hesnault, and the famous Cyrenel de Bergerac, who were with him pupils of Gassendi the Epicurean. At nineteen, Moliere left the college and probably spent the next two years studying law, but at twenty-one he had decided to adopt the theatre as his profession, and so renounced his claims to the office of Tepesier du Roy. This incurred the displeasure of his family, who could not sympathise with the eccentricity that would exchange Bourdieu's solidarity for the precariousness of a comedian's life. A troupe of ten actors was formed, with Moliere as one of the principals, and Jean-Baptiste Poquelin signalised his severance from the Bourdieu's world by adopting the stage name Moliere. The Théâtre Illustre, however, was not crowned with success. Twice the enterprise failed, and in 1645 Moliere, aged 23, was imprisoned for debt. In the following year, the presumptuous young actors left the fierce competition of Paris for the provinces, and there Moliere played for the next twelve years, content to be an actor, and as yet showing no ambition to become a playwright. AII IQ 130, relative quotient of data 0.43. Sir Isaac Newton, 1642-1727, a famous English mathematician and natural philosopher. AII IQ 130, AII IQ 170. 1. Family Standing Newton's paternal forebears had, for a hundred years, been in possession of a small manor. But the father, though lord of the manor, was in fact a small farmer of good family. Of the character or standing of the mother and her ancestors, nothing is recorded, but it is stated of her that she became convinced that her son was not destined to be a tiller of the soil, and resolved to give him all the advantages which education could bestow. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. With the aid of little saws, hammers, hatchets, and tools of all sorts, Newton was constantly occupied during his play hours in the construction of models of known machines and amusing contrivances. In addition to water clocks in which he specialised, he constructed a carriage to be moved by the person who sat in it, and also a windmill. And so carefully had he observed the construction of windmills that he was able to make his own model a marvel of clean and curious workmanship for the lady of his affections and for her dolls, he made little tables, cupboards, and other utensils. Newton was a sober, silent, and thinking lad, who never took part in the ordinary games and amusements of his schoolfellows, but employed all his leisure hours in invention. He would invent diversions for his comrades, such as paper kites, after carefully investigating the best forms and proportions. At night he attached paper lanterns to his kites, thereby terrifying the country people who thought them comets. The imperfect measure of time given by his water clocks led him apparently to a study of the sun's motion, and he succeeded in making three unusually accurate sundials. He was expert also with his pencil and pen. He drew portraits and framed them, and he drew on the walls, birds, beasts, men, ships, and mathematical diagrams. He wrote verses, but no authentic specimen of them is extant. The love of study and a dislike for every other occupation increased with his ears. 2. Education. Newton was a posthumous child, and on the remarriage of his mother when he was three, he passed under the care of his grandmother, who sent him, at the usual age, to a day school, where he acquired education in the three R's. At twelve he was sent to the public school at Grantham. At fourteen, on the death of his stepfather, and having acquired all the knowledge that his school could supply, Newton was recalled to his home. After an unsuccessful attempt at making a farmer of her boy, Newton's mother sent him back to Cretham to continue his studies, and there he remained from the age of 16 to 19. 3. School Standing and Progress Newton later reported that he was extremely inattentive to his studies, and stood very low in the school, apparently his mind was on other matters. But an indignity suffered at the hands of a fellow pupil determined him to vanquish the offender by scholastic superiority, as well as by immediate physical chastisement. After a hard struggle, Newton rose to the highest place in the school. 4. Friends and Associates Before he was fourteen, Newton met a young lady whom he later wished to marry, but his poverty prevented this. She was twice married, while he died a bachelor. In his early years, he preferred the society of the young ladies in the house where he boarded to that of his schoolfellows. 5. Reading C2-6 6. Production and Achievement, C2, 1, from Invention, etc. At 14, Newton undertook the management of the little family estate, but it soon appeared that he was not destined to be a farmer, as he was constantly engaged with his books. 
7. Evidences of precocity. C2, 1 and 2, and contradictory evidence in 3. AI IQ 130, relative coefficient of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When Newton left Grantham School at 19, his old teacher made a speech in praise of his character and talents, and held him up to the scholars as a proper object of their love and imitation. The youth entered Trinity College, Cambridge, as a sizer, and there probably devoted himself to mathematics. He received the degree of B.A. in 1665, age 23, and in March of the same year reported his first great discovery of fluxions. This year the famous apple observation is said to have been made. In the following year, Newton experimented with a glass prism to try therewith the phenomena of colours. He fled from Cambridge in 1665 because of the plague, but returned two years later, aged 25, as a minor fellow. Records are preserved from these two years, indicating that Newton purchased books and instruments of a mathematical and physical nature. In 1668, at the age of 26, he took his degree of M.A., being 23rd in a list of 148, then the following year he was appointed to the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics, before which date all his discoveries had germed in his mind. AII IQ 170, relative coefficient of data 0 0.60. William Hickling Prescott, 1796 to 1859, an American historian. AII IQ 130, AII IQ 135. 1. Family standing. The Prescotts belonged to the original Puritan stock of New England and were distinguished as people of culture and leaders in the Massachusetts colony. William's father was a successful lawyer, a member of legislature, and a chairman of the committee appointed to revise the constitution of his state. The mother was characterized by her activity and energy. Both parents were great leaders. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Prescott never fancied rude or athletic sports. He preferred quiet social games or those involving an intellectual element. Among his favourites were playing at circus, acting out some particular battle of antiquity, and telling long fantastic tales. In storytelling, Prescott's inventions were of the wildest, and his sense of the ridiculous were at times almost so strong as to overpower him. When the other boys were occupied with their exercises of physical strength, Prescott amused himself at home with light reading. He was always fond of books. 2. Education Prescott's first instruction from his mother was followed by training at a primary school where he was one of the favourite pupils. At six and a half, he entered the school of Master Cap in Salem, where he continued for five years. When he reached 12 years of age, the family removed to Boston and Prescott was placed in Dr. Gardiner's school, then known as the best classical school in New England. The attendance was limited to perhaps a dozen pupils, and the instruction, which was oral and individual, was excellent. Prescott studied in Greek and Latin classics and English with Dr. Gardiner, and in addition took private lessons in mathematics, writing, and foreign languages, French, Italian, and Spanish. At 15, he was ready to enter Harvard where he pursued the regular classical course of that day. 3. School Standing and Progress Prescott was a bright, merry boy, with an inquisitive mind, quick perceptions, and a ready, retentive memory. He generally learned his lessons, but he loved to play better than books, and was too busy with other than academic activities to become one of the best pupils of the school. With Dr. Gardner, Prescott, 12 to 15 years old, learned easily, but in daily practice, he always made a distinction between university requirements and classical accomplishments. He never went further than was required, fearing that he might encourage the assignment of additional tasks. In modern languages, and in arithmetic and writing, Prescott made little progress, and this, in the case of the languages, was because they were not required for college. In his college entrance examination, he was told, when he inquired from a professor how well he had done, that he did himself a great deal of credit. Prescott's ambition at college was to acquire the culture of a gentleman. He worked out a regular schedule for study, but he was very careful not to exceed the time he had mapped out for any particular study. He never kept the rules that he made for himself, but he always kept within the limits prescribed by honour and his academic standing. 4. Friends and Associates As a little boy, Prescott was not liked by all of his associates, 
because he expressed his opinions and feelings more confidently than was agreeable, a habit perhaps due to home indulgence. During his college preparatory years, Prescott was a favourite among the boys, although he was rather mischievous and still somewhat overbearing. Two lifelong friends were schoolfellows with him at Dr. Gardner's. The younger Gardner, his teacher's son, later an eminent lawyer, and Ticknor, his own biographer-to-be. 5. Reading Prescott was fond of books from his earliest childhood. As a very little boy, his imagination would become so excited by certain works that he dreaded being left alone, and would cling to his mother's gown and follow her about the house. He enjoyed reading Oedipus Tyrannus, but became fitful when he was asked to read Prometheus Finctus, because the latter was not required in the regular college preparatory course. He liked Horace, Juvenal he disliked, and Perseus he would not read at all. He read great numbers of books of the lighter sort, especially when he had the privilege of access to John Quincy Adams' library in the Boston Athenaeum. Of all reading, he preferred extravagant romances and books of wild adventure. 6. Production and Achievement Prescott's Latin verses were superior to those of any other boy in his school. That he was a clever letter writer is witnessed by a missive written at fifteen, giving a lively account of his college entrance examination. 7. Evidences of Precocity C. 2, 2, 3, 5, and 6 AIIQ 130 Relative coverage of data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Owing to an accident while at Harvard, Prescott at 17 lost completely the sight of his left eye. His industry, however, was unimpaired. He distinguished himself in his college work, and at his graduation was chosen to deliver an original Latin poem. Walker, a university contemporary, later president of Harvard, said that Prescott was in classic learning one of the most accomplished. On leaving the university, Prescott studied law for six months in his father's office, but became subject to chronic rheumatism. He abandoned the pursuit and turned a merchant. Then, in search of health, he cruised, age 19, to the Azores, England, France, and Italy, solaced in periods of total blindness that occurred during the journey, by listening to the works of Scott, Shakespeare, books of travel, and histories which were read aloud to him. He returned home at 21, and in the two ensuing years, aged 22 to 24, entered more into society and edited a paper, which was, however, only moderately successful. At 24, he married, and as starting a little later on a literary career, he mapped out a strict course of preparatory study. His first literary contribution, a review of Byron's letter on Pope, was accepted by the North American Review, and appeared the same year before Prescott reached the age of 26. AIIQ 135, relative coast of data 0.60. Sir Walter Raleigh, 1552 to 1618. An English courtier, officer, colonizer, historian, and poet. AIIQ 130, AIIQ 130. 1. Family Sterning. Raleigh's father, a contemporary gentleman of Devonshire, was a pronounced Protestant. His mother was a woman of noble wit and of good and godly opinions. Both were well descended. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. It is believed that, until his 15th or 16th year, Rayleigh lived on the Devonshire coast, where he probably came in contact with the new and growing spirit of English enterprise, then beginning to rival Spanish achievement. Very little definite information about young Rayleigh has been found, but a hint as to his character is contained in the story that, at 15 or 16, and during the Oxford period, he advised a complaining fellow, an excellent archer, who would be mowed an insult to challenge his abuser to a match of shooting. 2. Education At 15 or 16, the youth became a commoner of Oriel College, Oxford, and his natural parts being strangely advanced by academic learning under the care of an excellent tutor. He became an ornament of his juniors, and was worthily esteemed a proficient in oratory and philosophy. The date of his entry to the university is uncertain, but he must have entered not later than 1568. When he was 16 and still a very young statesman, even for Elizabethan days. 3. School setting and progress, C22. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 
6. Reduction in achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record. AIIQ 130. Relification of data point two zero. Three, development from seventeen to twenty six. At seventeen, Rayleigh left Oxford to join the Huguenots in France, a dangerous service since captured by the enemy was liable to lead to death by hanging. Three years later, in fifteen seventy two, his name appears on the Oxford Register, but he did not take an Oxford degree. He may have been the Walter Rayleigh of the Middle Temple who, in 1576, when Rayleigh was 24, published some commendatory verses prefixed to the steel glass of George Gascion. The verses have much of the savour of Rayleigh's mind and diction, but even if he was of the Middle Temple, he did not study law. AII IQ 130, relative coast of data, point one one. John Jacques Rousseau 1712 to 1778, an eminent Swiss French philosopher. AIIQ 130, AIIQ 125. 1. Family standing. Of old French stock, the Swiss Rousseau family belonged to the class of skilled workmen. One was a tanner, and his son, grandson, and great grandson were watchmakers of high standing. The last in the sequence, Jean Jacques' father, was restless, sensitive, unstable, heedless of ordinary affairs, with a punctilious sense of personal dignity. He was a great reader, especially of imaginative literature. The mother's forebears included men of ability and culture, and she herself was a person of distinguished education. But her father was dissolute. Jean Jacques lost his mother at the time of his birth. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. At home in Geneva, where reading was not a task. Rousseau was devoted to it. But at Bossy, whither he went at twelve, reading was required, and so the boy's interest turned from it to outdoor pleasures and manual activities. From the age of twelve to sixteen, Rousseau manufactured all kinds of things. C26, among others, was a puppet theatre for which he and his cousin composed comedies, presenting them to the family audience. The theatrical fad was later replaced by an enthusiasm for preaching sermons. Rousseau states that the organic sensations of emotion were consciously present almost at birth. Two youthful love affairs occurred before the boy was sixteen. A little later came a period of depression, when he was disgusted and discontented with himself and his surroundings. He spent most of his time in reading, C25, but still joined his youthful companions in occasional hilarious outbursts. 2. Education Rousseau preserved no recollection of his first five years, but he reports that he was a sickly little fellow who was not expected to survive. When at a very early age he had somehow learned to read, he and his father devoured every night after supper some part of a small collection of romances. The father's intention was to improve his son in reading, but so absorbed did the two become in the works themselves that they often sat up all night in order to finish one of the volumes. As a result of this fantastic experience, Strange and romantic notions of human life developed early. Fortunately, when he was seven, John Jacks turned to history. The boy's early years were directed and guided by his father and his aunt with care and affection until, when John Jacks was ten, his father was banished as a result of a quarrel with an influential citizen, and the boy was sent with a cousin to be educated in the home of a pastor. Here he was taught Latin and all the insignificant twaddle which is generally comprehended under the name of education. And it was also here that a punishment, when he was twelve, for a misdemeanor, which he had not committed, upset his whole moral attitude. On his return home, he lived at his uncle's house, and there he and his cousin received some instruction in drawing and geometry. But for the most part, the children were left to themselves. At length, Rousseau was apprenticed first as a clerk and later as an engraver's assistant. He ran away from his second master, and was taken up by a priest who hoped to win him to the Catholic Church. While the priest and his associates were attempting to convert the boy, he, in his turn, had the inspired wish to convert them, and his vanity was gratified when he saw that his arguments embarrassed them. However, it was they, not he, who triumphed, and at length, after living some time in the monastery at Turin, he was received into the church. 3. School standing in progress. No specific account of either is preserved. 
four friends and associates. No record has been found of others than members of the family, and of teachers, patrons, employers, and a friend. See 2, 1, 2, and 6. 5. Reading. The reading of romances, begun at 6, ended at 7. The following winter, while his father was at work, John Jacks read aloud such volumes as Lee Seward's History of the Church and Empire, Paul Seward's Discourses on Universal History, Plutarch's Lives, Nani's History of Venice, Ovid's Metamorphosis, La Boyer Fontenelle, and a few volumes of Moliere. Plutarch presently became his greatest favourite. The boy was fired by the proud spirit of the Greeks and Romans, entering into their lives and living them over again in imagination. Discontinuing his reading for a time, he resumed it when, between the ages of twelve and sixteen, he was apprenticed to the engraver. Now he read in order to forget his troubles, but unfortunately he forgot his work as well. Reproofs followed, but these only increased the taste for reading until it became a passion. The youth read all the volumes of the Leiden Library, both good and bad, until finally he did nothing but read and dream. 6. Production and Achievement From 12 to 16, living in his uncle's house, Rousseau, with his cousin, was actively engaged in manufacturing such articles as cages, pipes, kites, drums, houses, ships, and bows. The boys endeavoured also to make watches, and devoted considerable time to drawing, painting, and colouring. Apparently, Rousseau despised his first serious occupation as clerk. His employer had small sympathy with him, for he called him a fool and a blockhead, said he could not discover any understanding in him, and finally dismissed him. The engraver to whom he was next apprenticed reduced him to servitude, and caused him to forget all the culture he had ever acquired. Although he did not dislike the work, he feared his master. Finally, neglect and irregular habits brought a crisis, and rather than face it, Rousseau ran away. He was taken up by priests who fed and clothed him, and then turned him adrift to work at various temporary posts as servant or lackey. In one position as house boy, he was kindly treated and instructed in Latin by members of the family. In the same house, he distinguished himself, according to his own account, by explaining an old French motto. He won the praise and respect of these people, but after a short period of service, he left them to undertake a journey with a friend from Geneva. 7. Evidences of Precocity Rousseau wrote, I am persuaded that I was never really a child. I always felt and thought as a man. At six, the boy was so carried away by his reading that he shed tears in sympathy with the misfortunes of his romantic heroes. Between twelve and sixteen, he acted like a dunce and was accused of being one. C. 2. 6. AIIQ 130, relative quotient of data, 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the conclusion of a year of wandering, Rousseau reached the town of Annecy Penniless and here he was taken up by Madame de Warrens. The time passed very pleasantly. Rousseau read The Spectator, Puffendorf, St. Evremont, and the Henriade. But as he himself says, it was too good to last. Interrogated by a kinsman of his benefactress, he was rated somewhat of a fool, and so they sent him to a seminary to become a priest. After a short trial, however, the authorities returned him as unsuitable material. He next decided, at nineteen, to try music as a profession. He visited several towns, finally settling in Lausanne as a teacher of music. Although his undertaking was a failure, for he knew nothing of music, he maintained himself for a while by his effrontery, and then attached himself as an interpreter to a Greek monk. At twenty, he had once again sought out an empty warrants, who obtained for him a position on a land survey. Again he returned to his music, and then undertook the supervision of some of his patroness's affairs. He was now living with her in the closet intimacy, and by her was polished for society, sent to dancing lessons, etc. When Rousseau was twenty-four, the two retired to the country. A little later, on his paternal recovery from a severe illness, the young man decided to learn everything, and started with the philosophers, whom he found contradictory. From philosophy, he went to geometry, Latin, physiology, and anatomy. This life continued until, when he was twenty-eight, Rousseau tore himself away from Madame de Warren's, in whose affections he had been replaced by another, and became a tutor at Lyons. AII IQ 125, relative coefficient of data, 0.53. End of section 20.
Section 21 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses, by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 17. Cases rated at AIIQ 130 to 140, Part 2. Claude Henry de Rovroy, Comte de Saint-Simon. 1760 to 1825, a French philosopher, the founder of French socialism. AIIQ 130, AIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Saint Simon belonged to an old and honourable family which claimed descent from Charlemagne. His grandfather, a marquise, was a man of distinction. His father held various high military and political offices, was brigadier of the king's armies and governor of Senlis. The mother was an heiress, descended from another branch of the same family. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. St. Simon was reared in an atmosphere of aristocratic prejudice. He developed an early intense desire for glory and a clear sense of great future awaiting him. The ardent desire to distinguish himself in some way was intensified by his great imagination and became a persistent ideal. In firmness and courage, he was a young Spartan. 2. Education. St. Simon's education was like that of the nobles of his day. He was devoted largely to philosophy. His training was not regularly directed, though he studied with D'Alembert for some time. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity. It is said that, at thirteen, St. Simon showed his sincerity and independence by refusing to partake of his first communion, because he had no conviction as to its meaning. This was in spite of the fact that imprisonment by his severe father would be thus incurred. AIIQ 130, relative caution of data, point four three. Three, Development from 17 to 26. At seventeen, St. Simon enlisted in the army and was sent to America. For his distinguished service there, he was made a member of the Society of the Cincinnati. After another campaign, during which he was wounded and imprisoned, St. Simon was in Mexico for a brief time, and there he presented to the Viceroy a project for bringing the two oceans into communication. At twenty-five he was named Chevalier de Saint-Louis, and Colonel of a regiment, spent a brief period in the study of mathematics under Mainz, the celebrated mathematician and before the end of the year, started on a tour of the continent. At this time, his mind was devoted chiefly to scientific subjects. AIIIQ 135, relative coast of data, point four three. Girolamo Savonarola, 1452-1498, an intelligent religious reformer. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. The Savonarolas were of Paduan descent, the first known being Antonio Savonarola, 1256, a valiant warrior who defended the city against the tyrant Ezzelino. Girolamo's grandfather, a physician of high repute in the Paduan school, was learned, pious and charitable in bestowing his services on the poor. He wrote numerous medical and other works and was a distinguished luminary of the court of Est winning honour as a university teacher and court physician. Of Girolamo's father, little is known. His mother, a member of an illustrious Paduan family, won by her firmness and nobility the worship and confidence of her later distinguished son. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Girolamo was not one to respond to the pageantry of the court of Est. For even in earliest youth, his heart was torn by passions driving him to open war with the world around him. But he had a true passion for study. 2. Education The family hoped he would become a physician, and to this end his grandfather devoted himself to the boy's education. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no specific record is preserved except of members of the family. The grandfather especially influenced Joelma's early years. 5. Reading. So great was his idol over books, and even those beyond his comprehension, were eagerly seized upon and ransacked for hidden treasures. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidence of precocity, 
no further record, but C25. AIIQ 130, relative quotient of data, 0.11. 3. Development from 17 and 26. After the grandfather's death, Joel Lamol was instructed in philosophy by his father. He studied the works of St. Thomas Aquinas and Arabic commentaries on Aristotle as guides to the study of medicine. It was strange to behold so young a boy plunged in this sea, or rather labyrinth, of confused syllogisms, and finding so much pleasure in the task as soon to become a skilful disputant. He acquired a profound knowledge of the scriptures, devoured the ancient writers, composed verses and studied drawing and music, but his life was melancholy and solitary. Before the age of twenty he wrote the Canzon di Ruina Mandi, an ascetic interpretation of life. At twenty-two he wrote a treatise entitled Di Contemptu Mundi, foreshadowing his mission and expressing his conviction of the unfortunate state of Italy. At this time he recognised a call to the priesthood, and after serious pondering of his course he entered the monastery of St. Dominic of Bologna. During the first year of his novitiate, he composed Di Ruina Ecclesiae, treating of the corruption of the church. His early Aristotelian education influenced his lectures at first, but later he relied solely on the Bible for inspiration. AIIIQ 135, relative cost of data 0.53. Richard Brinsley Butler Sheridan, 1751-1816, a noted English dramatist, orator and politician. AIIQ 130, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Sheridan was born a member of an intellectual and highly educated family. Accounts of his paternal grandfather, his father, and his mother are included in the Dictionary of National Biography. The father was at various times a theatre manager, an actor, and also a fertile writer and most enthusiastic educational reformer. The mother was a clever and fascinating woman who achieved some fame in literary fields. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. C. 2. 6. 2. Education. At the age of seven, Sheridan and his small sister attended a school in Dublin called the Ceremony for the Instruction of Youth, conducted by a relative, Sam Wythe. At the age of eleven, the boy was sent on to Harrow, where he remained until he was seventeen. Three, school standing and progress. Evidently, Sheridan did not distinguish himself to any extent at the seminary, except by lampoons and repartee, but he was no dullard. He made some progress in French, and laid the loose foundation of that desultory scholarship, which despite assertions to the contrary, he maintained to the end. A harrow master reports that he was inferior to many of his schoolfellows in the ordinary business of a school, but other teachers recognised in him a clever fellow, and tried, though with only partial success, to spur him to raise his scholarship to a degree worthy of his vestiges of a superior intellect. 4. Friends and Associates in early childhood, Sheridan and his younger sister were closely associated. She wrote later, We had no one else to love. My father's affections were fixed on his eldest son and on my sister. Had my mother lived, our fate would have been different. A Harrow friend, Halhead, is mentioned, who corroborated with young Sheridan in translating classic poetry. 5. Reading. See 2, 3, 4, and 6. 6. Production and Achievement. Though inattentive to most of his studies at Harrow, Richard distinguished himself by his poetry, translating with a friend the seventh ideal, and many of the lesser poems of Theocritus. 7. Evidences of Precocity Richard's father considered the elder son Charles to be the brighter of the two boys. See also 2.6. AIIQ 130. Relative coach data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After completing his course at Harrow, Sheridan, now 18 years of age, went to live in London. Before his 21st birthday, he had struck off a considerable amount of literary composition independently and also in collaboration with Halhead, his former schoolfellow, but only one fruit of the Alliance ever saw publication. This is a metrical translation of Aristonetus, which drew some little attention. Sheridan married secretly at 21. At 22, he stayed for a time at Wealth and at the Middle Temple, and the same year he and his young wife were married a second time publicly. By the time Sheridan was twenty four, the rivals St. Patrick's Day and the Duenna had all been successfully produced, and before his twenty sixth, the young playwright had become manager and part owner of Drury Lane Theatre.
AII IQ 145, Earth Coast Data 0 0.60. Benedict de Spinoza, 1632-1677, a famous philosopher, the greatest modern exponent of pantheism. AI IQ 130, AI IQ 145. 1. Family Standing Spinoza's father and grandfather both held honorary offices in the Jewish community to which they belonged. The former, if not rich, was probably well-to-do. He lived during his later years in a substantial house. The mother was the second of her husband's three wives. 2. Development rate 17. 1. Interests. No specific record. 2. Education. Eisenfurt, a young Spinoza, attended the Jewish school for boys at Amsterdam from the age of 5 to about 18. Here the pupils were given instruction in the Hebrew language, history and religious writings. The boy had two noted teachers, probably during the period of his teens, who were both well-educated rabbis. One was philosophical but prosy. The other was a liberal thinker, a prolific writer, an inspirational teacher, a man of wide sympathies and moral earnestness. Besides the subjects studied in Hebrew at school, Spinoza learned Spanish and Portuguese from his parents, Dutch from his associates, Latin and possibly Italian, and German from a German scholar. It is likely that he pursued also mathematics, physics, and later scholastic philosophy. He was probably confirmed in the Jewish faith at the age of 13. 3. School study and progress. As a little lad, he showed uncommon ability in the perplexing questions he put to his teacher, Rabbi Morteira. 4. Friends and Associates. As a youth at the house of his rabbi, Spinoza would occasionally meet Christians who were interested in Judaism or in the Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament. Here also he may have met Rembrandt. His associates were, for the most part, Jews. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and achievement. At 15 or before, Spinoza was an amateur draftsman. There are records of ink and charcoal sketches which he made of his friends and one of himself in the costume of Mass and Jules. 7. Evidences of Precocity Spinoza showed from his childhood, and his younger years, that nature had not been unkind to him. His quick fancy and penetrating wit were easily perceived. See also 2.3. AI IQ 130, relative quotient of data 0 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. From his 19th to his 22nd year, Spinoza pursued his studies under the able van der Inden, with whom he read and discussed Latin, Greek, medicine, physics, and probably the philosophy of Descartes. The young man's knowledge of philosophy was drawing him away from the Jewish creed, and at 24 he was excommunicated for heresy. Apparently, this was for him no cause for regret, for he said, This compels me to nothing which I should not otherwise have done. From this time on, he applied the art of lens grinding of which he was a master. AII IQ 145, relative coast of data 0.43. Sir William Temple, 1628-1699, an English diplomatist, statesman and author. AII IQ 130, AII IQ 120. 1. Family Standing. The Temple family was one of ancient lineage and honourable estate. William's scholarly grandfather was secretary to Sir Philip Sidney, and Provost of Trinity College, Dublin. Sir John Temple, his father, was a distinguished English lawyer and statesman, master of the rolls in Ireland, a distinguished member of the Privy Council at Dublin, and author of a history of the Irish Rebellion in 1641. The mother was the sister of a celebrated divine of Kent. 2. Development weight 17. 1. Interests. Temple early developed a wonderful desire for knowledge. 2. Education. His early training was under his distinguished maternal uncle, who found in him a solid penetrating mind. At ten, the boy was sent to a school at Bishop Stortford, where he learned all the Latin and Greek he ever knew. Of this, he is said to have retained the former, but have lost most of the latter. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no specific record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no further record. AI IQ 130, relative coverage of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Temple entered Emmanuel College, Cambridge, at 17. Here he improved himself in all the parts of humane learning, and made himself perfect master of French and Spanish. Because of his superior knowledge of these languages, he had been accounted the best furniture of his time. 
He left Cambridge in 19 without a degree. From the age of 19 or 20, he spent eight or nine years on the continent, where he acquired facility in speaking and reading in principal modern languages then necessary to a statesman. He continued to pursue his studies in history and philosophy between the ages of 26 and 32, and at 32, first distinguished himself in public life. AII IQ 120, relative coast of data 0.11. Pierre Victurnien, Vergenord. 1753-1793, a French orator and revolutionary statesman. AIIQ 130, AIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Frugnord was descended on both sides from the ancient bourgeoisie of Limousin. His father was able to increase an already comfortable income through his business enterprise, but failed during a severe scarcity of crops. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. The boy's early education was received at Limoges, under a priest who was a master of ancient languages in the college of that town. 3. School standing and progress. It is reported that the young Vergnord made rapid progress and had great success in his studies at the college of Limoges. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidence of precocity. No further record. AI IQ 130. Will have coached of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Although his father had failed in business as a result of poor crops, Vergnord, aged about 18, was able to enter the College of Plitzes because of a scholarship secured for him by Turgot. Later he attended the Sorbonne spent several years in the study of philosophy and theology, and graduated with high honours. He had already earned the reputation of being deeply learned in the lore of the ancients. There followed a period of uncertainty in which his tastes and inclinations were unreconciled, but before he was twenty-seven, the success of some of his verses gained him an entrance into several fashionable salons at Paris. AII IQ 135, relative quotient of data 0. Count Vittorio Alfieri 1749-1803, a celebrated Italian dramatist. AIIQ 135, AIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing Alfieri was born of aristocratic and wealthy parents. His father, a nobleman, was bred to no profession. Although a man of strict morals, he was wholly devoid of ambition. His mother belonged to an old Savoyard family of Turin. She was an admirable character, respected for her virtue and beloved for her pity. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Alfieri developed early a natural inclination for study, although the members of his family had no interest in education. The imaginative, hypersensitive child was often antagonized by the kinds of punishment to which he was subjected for minor offences, and his spirits were always in extremes. His love for solitude was increased by the mental and physical suffering resulted from a variety of bodily complaints. The most distressing of these was an eruptive disease which covered his body with ulcers and made him the sport of his companions. At thirteen, Alfieri heard grand opera for the first time and found that music produced the most varied and terrific sensations in his mind. In his own practice on the harpsichord, he made little progress because he could never acquire a knowledge of the written characters. Writing, of which he had long had a passionate desire, was prohibited by his guardian, and it was only after the death of the latter, when the boy was fourteen, that he engaged in this activity, and then became very expert in it, and regained his health and vigour through the exercise. At fifteen the boy owned his own stud of eight horses. 2. Education Alfieri's father died when his gifted son was not yet a year old and the mother married again a little later. The boy was first educated at home under a worthy priest, who taught him the elements of arithmetic, writing, and a little Latin, before he was nine. From nine to fourteen, he attended the Academy of Turin, sent thither by an uncle, a man of great intelligence, who saw that his nephew was not being efficiently instructed. Although the masters at Turin proved to be inferior in knowledge and method, Alfieri remained at the Academy until he was fourteen, studying there under the direction of the Turin University authorities. At fourteen, upon the death of his uncle, 
At first he became his own master, gave up study, although he was still officially enrolled at the university, and led an idle and dissipated life. At sixteen he took a journey to Genoa, where he was enchanted by the beauty of the city. 3. School Standing and Progress on his entrance to the Turin Academy, Alfieri was entered into the fourth class by examination and assured of rapid advancement should he be diligent. After re-examination three months later, with other youths somewhat older, he was admitted to the third class, and stimulated by emulation, he soon outstripped the best of his companions. But when he had surpassed them all, his zeal slackened and he sunk into a kind of torpor. In fact, there was little to stimulate interest in the wearisomeness and insipidity of the school course, in which, so he says, the best days of our youth were consumed in vain. After wasting two years under wretched teachers, Alfieri was promoted to a class in charge of an intelligent and sagacious priest, who afforded him all the information in his power, so that the boy became considerable proficient in the Latin. A rival schoolmate, a noble and prepossessing fellow, at this time, stimulated him by sometimes equaling him in composition and usually exceeding him in memory exercises. At eleven, Alfieri had been admitted into the class of rhetoric, and though he was indolent, he passed the examination at the end of the year. He then took up geometry and philosophy in classes at the university, and studied geography and ancient history for pleasure. In the university classes, he replied to the questions perhaps better than any of the others, although he comprehended, he says, neither the pedantic philosophy nor the geometry, and his apparent success was, according to his own account, a simple act of memory. At fourteen, after passing a public examination in logic, geometry and physics, he was awarded the Master of Arts degree. 4. Friends and Associates Elfarieri was devoted to his sister, and after she left home to become a nun, he loved her memory in every young Carmelite novice. The fancy developed into so absorbing an interest in the young man that the youth neglected his studies, employed waxed irksome, and he became disgusted with society. Upon becoming master of his own fortune at fourteen, he was surrounded by friends and parasites, such as follow in the train of prosperity. But none of his relatives took the smallest concern in his affairs, been arranging for his entrance to the academy. 5. Reading At eleven, Afreri had read Metastasio, and Ariosto. A little later the Aeneid fell into his hands, and he read it more than once with the great avidity. At thirteen he was perfectly enchanted with Gil Blas, and enjoyed it more than the Aeneid, the only other book he had read from the beginning to end. Romances such as Cassandra, Alla Machilda, and A Man of Quality interested him at an early age, and he pursued the prose works of Voltaire with pleasure. 6. Production and Achievement from an early age, Alfieri's unbound ambition was gratified by the fact that he usually bore away the prize in composition, but at eleven he could not recite more than four hundred lines from Virgil, and those very incorrectly, a circumstance that gave him much uneasiness. It was at eleven, too, that he wrote his first sonnet. This was so praised by his friends that he thought himself already a poet, but his uncle soon chilled his enthusiasm completely, and he relinquished until he was twenty-five, every idea of again writing verses. 7. Evidences of Precocity At five, Alfieri looked forward to death as released from a serious and painful illness, dysentery. He rejoiced at the thought of becoming a little angel, like a younger brother who had died. At seven or eight, in a melancholy mood, perhaps induced by ill health, he devoured a number of plants which he believed to be hemlock, and which he hoped would bring about his release from a miserable existence. See also 2, 1 and 2, 6. AI IQ 135, relative coast of data, point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26. On leaving the academy, Alfieri received an ensign's commission in a provincial regiment. Here his duties were few, but such as they were, he detested them thoroughly. The next six years he spent in travel, with one period at home devoted to reading French works, and with a special delight, Plutarch's Lives. In the course of his first grand tour, he journeyed through the principal cities of Italy, but with unseeing eyes, for he had no taste for the fine arts. He disliked France and was delighted with England, and his first love affair in Holland. 
His second journey took him to Vienna, Prussia, Denmark, Sweden, Russia, England, Spain, and Portugal, and he returned as much of a philosopher as was compatible with his years, and equally proud as ignorant. A paper that he presented on his return before a society to which he belonged was so well received that he was inspired with a vague desire to produce some work of literary worth. But rousing himself only for the adventure of two or three love affairs, he lived in deplorable idleness until he was near the age of twenty-five. He sent to work in real earnest. His labours were now devoted to producing the tragedy of Cleopatra, of which he had made a sketch, and acting upon the criticism of Father Pechiotti, he worked with indefectible patience until the tragedy was completed. From the night when Alfieri, aged twenty-six, saw his play presented in Turin, a devouring fire took possession of his soul. He thirst one day to become a deserving candidate for theatrical fame. AIRIQ 135. Relative Coach Data 0.53. Lancelot Andrews, 1555 to 1626. An English divine and controversialist. AIIQ 135. AIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Andrews' father, in his earlier years, a seafarer and his later life, one of the masters of Trinity House, was a member of the commercial middle class. Both he and his wife are said to have been honest and religious, and very careful of the education of their children. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Andrews was often so wholly absorbed in study that he had to be compelled to take his part in the school games. 2. Education. At an early age he was sent to the Cooper's Free School of Ratcliffe, but before long he was transferred to the newly founded Merchant Taylor School. Here he was in the care of the first master, an educator who displayed distinct originality and who added to the usual classical curriculum exercises that developed musical and dramatic appreciation. At sixteen, Andrews entered Pembroke Hall, Cambridge. 3. School Standing and Progress In his first school, Andrews exhibited such a passion for study that his master obtained of his parents that he should not be a printress. At the Merchant Taylor School, he made rapid progress. His diligence was extraordinary. Early and late, he was at his studies. He used to rise at four, he would work while others were at play, and indeed had to be compelled to take his part in the school games. He was sent to Cambridge as a holder of a recently established Greek scholarship. Four friends and associates. Thomas Dove, later Bishop of Peterborough, was his chief school and college friend. 5. Reading. No further record. 6. Production achievement. C. 2, 2, and 3. 7. Evidences of precocity. C. 2, 2, and 3. AIIQ 135. Relative cost data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Andrew's enthusiasm for learning continued unabated throughout his school and college career. Although theological questions particularly absorbed his attention, he did not neglect any of the prescribed courses. Rather, he applied his great energy to many lines of research. At 20, he received the BA degree. At 21, he was elected fellow of his college. As a result of a competitive examination, in those days a rare event, at 23, he became college catchist. His catchethical letters attracted crowds of students and young curates. At 25, he was ordained and before he was twenty-six, his remarkable gifts as a physician of souls were already widely recognised. AIIIQ 140, relative coach to data 0 0.60. Antion Arnold, surnamed the Great Arnold, 1612-1694, a French philosopher and Jansenist theologian. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 160. 1. Family Standing Arnold belonged to a family of prominent lawyers. His grandfather was Procureur General to Catherine de Medici. His father, a leader of the Paris Bar and a violent anti Jesuit, was renowned for his fine mind and attainments, his ambition and his pity. Arnold's mother was a granddaughter of an eminent advocate. She was a woman of strong character and, after her husband's death, became a nun in the celebrated convent of Port Royal. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. None are recorded apart from his studies. 2. Education. Arnold, the youngest of twenty children, was reared with two of his nephews, of whom the older was his senior. 3. School standing in progress. 
Arnold could always, says Le Maitre, the older of the two youths with whom he was educated, recite his lessons without any preparation beyond hearing the exercises of the other two, who took their turns at recitation first. 4. Friends and associates. None are recorded except relatives. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of precocity. C. 2.3. AIIQ 135. Relative quotient of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. On the completion of his college course, Arnold's own intention was to study law, but the influence of the great Sir Siran and of his own mother persuaded him to adopt theology at the Sorbonne. His university career was brilliant. In learning a debate, he was equally remarkable. At 23, he defended his thesis propounding the doctrine of grace, and anticipating by six years Jansen's Augustinus. His path seemed straight and easy, but in order to receive the doctorate of the Sorbonne, it was necessary to be a priest, and Arnold did not yet feel fitted to assume holy office. In a dilemma he called upon the advice of St. Siran, who consulted theological studies together with practical religious exercises, solitude, fasts, prayer, and study of the scriptures, the success of the treatment was beyond question. The young man renounced the world's goods and espoused the doctrines of Port Royal. In 1641 and 24, he became doctor, and after the death of his mother, a few months later, he commenced his career of 53 years in the cause of truth, suffering over 30 of these in concealment or exile. AII IQ 160, relative crucial data 0.43. Richard Baxter. 1615-1691, a noted English nonconformist divine. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Baxter's father was a mean freeholder, called a gentleman for his ancestors' sake. After early gambling away his property, he was converted to religion and thereafter lived an altered life. The mother was the daughter of a resident of Shropshire. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests In his childhood, Baxter was fond of the usual sports, indulged in the petty misdemeanors of childhood, a cause of later care to his sensitive conscience. Through the reading of religious books, when he was fifteen, he was turned to religious life. 2. Education Baxter's early schooling was directed by commonplace teachers, ignorant men, but his father's instruction in religion and morals made a deep impression. At fourteen, Richard entered an excellent school, in Roxeter, which he attended for three or four years. 3. School study and progress. The boy was inordinately proud of his master's commendations for learning, and he was later so impressed by the influence of this early praise that he could write. All of them fed my pride, making me seven or eight years the highest in the school and boasting of me to others, which, though it furthered my learning, yet helped not my humility. Records indicate that when Richard was 14, he stood at the head of his class. His own statement suggests that this high standing was not unusual in his school career. 4. Friends and Associates Basso's classmates included a future canon of Christ's Church. 5. Reading When he was 7, Basso was set to read the historical part of the scriptures, which suited his nature and greatly delighted him. At this time he was bewitched with a love of romances, fables and old tales, which corrupted his affection and lost his time. It was Bunny's resolution which converted Baxter, when at fifteen he first came upon it. Other religious works which he read at the same period strengthened his religious convictions. Six, production and achievement, no record. Seven, evidences of precocity, no further record. AIIQ 135, relative quotient of data, 0.60. Three, development from 17 to 26. After a year and a half of private instruction from the chaplain of Ludlow Castle, Baxter was called at 18 to teach classes in the preparatory school he had formerly attended. During the following years, he suffered from serious physical disability, pulmonary tuberculosis and nervous depression, but he nevertheless devoted his time and energy to the study of religious controversies and theological discussions. Because he expected death shortly to the end, his career did not enter upon a college course. From 23 to 24, as first master of a school, he devoted his time to teaching and preaching. When 25, he was appointed assistant minister 
at Budgenworth. AII IQ 135, relative coefficient of data, 0 0.60. Pierre Bayle, 1647 to 1706, a noted French skeptical philosopher and critic. AI IQ 135, AI IQ 140. 1. Family Standing Bale's father, a clergyman of the Reformed Church, came of an honourable family, while his mother, also a Protestant, was connected with two houses of the French nobility. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Education Bale's education up to his 19th year was conducted entirely by his father, who, having taught him Latin, began when the lad was twelve and a half to teach him Greek, and during the next few years, kept him busy reading the best authors in both these languages. 2. Interests None are recorded, apart from his studies. 3. School standing and progress. No specific record, but see 2. 1. 4. Friends and associates. None are recorded, apart from his family. 5. Reading. See 2. 1. 6. Production achievement. No specific record. 7. Evidences of precocity. From early childhood, Bale was remarkable for his lively intelligence and prodigious memory, and insatiable curiosity appeared as soon as he was able to talk, and he questioned his parents incessantly with an eager and attentive interest. He had none to desire to know and to understand, and would continue his questioning on a point until he grasped it at its entirety. AIIQ 135, relative cost of data, 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 18, Bale entered the academy of Puy Lorenz, pursuing his studies with eagerness. During the vacation, he continued his studies with the same diligence, and as a result of his overwork, fell ill. When scarcely recovered, he returned to his labours and redoubled energy, thus bringing on a relapse which kept him at home for 18 months. During his convalescence, aged 20 and a half, he was taken to Severdon, where he had access to the minister's library. But here the confinement, incident to constant reading, brought on a fever which nearly caused his death. After a slow recovery, he returned, aged 21, to the academy, where he again prosecuted his studies with zeal, and at the same time read Plutarch and Montaigne for pleasure. Thinking his progress not rapid enough, Bale at 21 entered the University of Toulouse. Here a month later he was converted to Roman Catholicism. At 22, he presented his thesis, and the clarity, penetration, and modesty with which he responded to his opponents drew in the applause of everyone. He attempted to convert the whole of his family to his new religion, but was not successful, and before he was 23, he was himself brought back to Protestantism. Fearing persecution at home for his change of faith, he went to Geneva, where, until he was 24, he instructed the children of a syndic of the Republic. Following this, he was tutor for two years in another family. AII IQ 140, relative coefficient of data 0.53. Ludwig van Beethoven, 1770 to 1827, a celebrated German composer of Dutch descent. AII IQ 135, AII IQ 140. 1. Family standing. Beethoven's paternal grandfather, the Kabelmeister at Bonn, was a brilliant musician. His father was a highly talented but weak and intemperate man. His maternal grandfather was head cook in the fortress of Ehrenbreistein, and the biographer believes that it may have been from him that Ludwig's mother, a quiet domestic woman, derived her considerable fund of native intelligence. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Beethoven's one interest from his earliest youth appears to have been in music. From forced attention there developed a natural inclination. 2. Education In his earliest childhood, his father gave him lessons upon the pianoforte and violin. From his sixth year, he was given daily lessons and required to practice in spite of his tears. His father, wishing to concentrate upon the boy's musical education, gave him only the barest common school training, including a little Latin, but excluded arithmetic and writing, which he acquired at two elementary public schools. From the age of seven to ten, the little boy is said to have received violin and viola lessons from one of the young court musicians, and piano lessons from the court organist, and occasionally from an able tenor singer. Often late at night, his father and his tenor, on their return from the wine house, would take him from his bed 
and then keep him at the piano until morning. From the age of 13 to 16, Ludwig was instructed by Neef, called organist, receiving instruction in thorough bass and in composition. It is reported that when Beethoven visited Vienna at 16, Mozart gave him some audience. 3. School Standing and Progress A classroom reports that at the common school, Ludwig showed no signs of genius and that he was rather neglected in appearance. But when he was 12, his master, the court organist, characterized him in a communication in Craner's magazine as a boy of most promising talent, who plays the clavier very skillfully and with power, reads at sight very well, and in fact plays the well-tempered clever chord of Sebastian Bach, the non plus ultra of our art. His teacher concluded, this youthful genius is deserving of help to enable him to travel. He would surely become a second Mozart, were he to continue as he had begun. At twelve, Beethoven was already able to read and play the most difficult and involved scores at first sight, and already nine variations of his composition on a march theme by Dressler had been engraved. 4. Friends and Associates Beethoven's associates were the members of his family and his musical friends, but his mother appears to have been the only person for whom he cherished any real affection. 5. Reading no records preserved of reading other than music. 6. Production and Achievement At the age of seven years and three months, Beethoven, under his father's direction, gave his first public concert, playing various clavier concertos and trios. Before he was eleven, he accompanied his mother to Holland, and there played a great deal in great houses, as taught as some people by skill, and received valuable presents. When no more than eleven and a half, he was left in charge of his master's arduous duties as court organist, and at twelve, in order further to relieve his master, his duties had become too heavy, he was appointed symbolist and director of rehearsals for the stage. When he was thirteen, a petition was granted appointing him assistant court organist. The report in the petition is sufficiently indicative of the favourable opinion held by the youthful musician. Before he was fourteen, Beethoven had been suggested as a possible successor to his master. At fourteen, he already showed remarkable skill as an accompanist, and the actor had to forbid his clever tricks when he showed that he was able, in jest, to throw even an able singer off the key. His first composition is said to have been written at ten, a funeral cantata in memory of the deceased English ambassador. The orchestral director said he could not understand it, but when it was performed there with great astonishment at its originality, Approbation gradually increased, until, when it was rendered, there was general applause. The young musician at twelve composed a two-part figure in D for the organ, a song, a rando in C for pianoforte, and a more important work, three sonatas for the pianoforte, were published before he was thirteen. During the fourteenth year, two compositions were printed, a rondo for pianoforte and an arioso. Probably a concerto and a movement of three parts, not printed, belonged to the same year. At sixteen, Beethoven was enabled to make a visit to Vienna, where he met Mozart and played for him on the theme suggested by the older musician. Mozart's attention and interest grew as the youth played until he finally exclaimed, Keep your eye on him. Some day he will give the world something to talk about. 7. Evidences of Recursity. See 2, 2, 3 and 6. AIIQ 135, with a coverage of data 0.43. 3. Developed from 17 to 26. At 17, young Beethoven was appointed music master to Eleanor and Lorenz von Bruening, remaining the while at Bonn, supporting his family. He disliked teaching and frequently neglected his duties, but his patrons were fond of him and treated him kindly. From 17 to 21, he played a viola in the theatre orchestra, receiving at 18 an appointment as chamber musician to the elector. A year later, two cantatas were published which showed artistry and considerable command of musical material. In his last year at Bonn, Beethoven wrote, beside lesser works, his octet for wind instruments and trio in E-flat, op. 3. Shortly before his 22nd birthday, Beethoven arrived in Vienna, and there he received lessons from Hayden in harmony and counterpoint, until his teacher's departure for England in 1794. Beethoven, then aged 23, began taking lessons in violin from the famous Chopin, 
and in counterpoint, for the no less well-known Albrechtsberger. Bedger. The next year, a third teacher was added in the eminent Salieri, from whom Beethoven learned vocal composition. All these teachers valued their pupil very highly, or they found him headstrong and self-willed. Meanwhile, his reputation as a virtuoso had rapidly increased. His piano playing was famous, and is renowned for skill in extemporization. In fact, he was a musical sensation of the time. It was said by one critic, since Mozart, I have heard nothing which can in the least compare with him. AIIQ 140, relative commercial data, point four three. Edmund Burke, 1729 to 1797. A celebrated British statesman, orator, and writer. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 150. There is some question as to the exact date of Burke's birth. It appears to have been between 1728 and 1730, with the best evidence in favour of 1729. 1. Family Standing The Burkes were a Norman family who had settled in County Cork. Edmund's grandfather owned considerable property, and his father was an attorney with an extensive practice in Dublin, one of the first men of his profession. The maternal stock contributed several members to the various departments of the public service. The mother herself was a woman of cultivated understanding. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Burke's brother said, when we were at play, he, Edmund, was always at work, i.e. at study. He was fond of the natural beauties of his surroundings and of solitude. He would find in his own mind a reasoning and a communing with himself, such a fund of entertainment that he seemed not at all to regret his hours of solitude. Yet he was affable, free and communicative, as ready to teach as to learn. Burke's championship of the rights of the oppressed, as well as his support of civil and religious liberty, is said to have begun at school in his early teens. At college, study and the fruits of study became his sole passion. 2. Education Burke was first taught to read by his mother and an elderly lady of the neighbourhood. Probably at five, he was put to school. At eleven, he was sent for a year to a school in Dublin. At twelve, he was entered with his two brothers in the school of Shackleton, a Quaker who had a wide reputation as a successful teacher and a good man. At fifteen, he left the school and entered Trinity College, Dublin. 3. School Standing and Progress Burke's early school progress was not considerable, for his family were more concerned about the welfare of his frail body than about his mind. But C. 2. 1. Shackleton, the schoolmaster, stated that Burke's habits indicated more of solidity than commonly belongs to that period of life, 1215. His powers appeared not so much in brilliancy as in steadiness of application, facility of comprehension, and strength of memory. These characteristics won first the commendation and then the warm regard of his teacher. His memory was extensive and his judgment early ripe. At fifteen, Burke left school possessed of what his teacher called a large miscellaneous stock of learning for his years. His university tutor told Burke that he was a good scholar, understood the authors very well, and seemed to take pleasure in them, and that he was more fit for the college than in three parts of his class. In fact, Burke's intellectual activity at this period was remarkable. Four friends and associates. Among his schoolmates were a number of men later distinguished, but his most intimate friend throughout life was Richard Shackleton, son and successor of the schoolmaster. In his letters to Shackleton, Burke gives a picture of his life and interests at college. 5. Reading Because of the frailty of his constitution in early youth, Burke preferred to lie about and read while other boys played. The old romances Palmerin of England and Don Belanus of Greece were early favourites, and he made the reading of the classics his diversion rather than his business. He was particularly delighted with history and poetry. Young Shackleton, three years his senior, said, He read much while a boy, and accumulated a stock of learning of great variety. Later at college, his tutor planned a heavy course of classical reading, which Burke carefully followed. 6. Production and Achievement While at school, Burke, aged 12 to 15, performed several exercises in verse writing. In friendly rivalry with Shackleton, he translated the 13th idyllium of Theocritus. It is also reported that he wrote some scenes of a play from the story of King Alfred. 
From college, Burke wrote long and clever letters, stating his opinions, and at fifteen he addressed an ode to his friend Shackleton. At sixteen he won a prize volume for proficiency in the classics. 7. Evidences of Precocity C. 2. 1. 2. 3. 5. 6. AIIQ 135. Relative quotient of data 0. 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Burke won a scholarship to Trinity College, Dublin, distinguishing himself in the entrance examination, which lasted two days and required an extensive acquaintance with all the Latin and Greek authors of note. At 18, he was absorbed in his college studies. He wrote that he pursued his studies from sallies of passion rather than from the preference of sound reason. His interest led him to turn to mathematics, logic, history, and then poetry. The two latter subjects were his favourites. At college, Burke was noted as a debater and remembered also as an admirer of Milton. He was secretary and later president of a literary club, and he wrote poetry. At 18, he entered Lincoln's Inn in order to study law, but literature still attracted him strongly, and the following year he wrote several poems including one to his old friend and schoolmate, Shackleton, on the occasion of his marriage. At 19, Burke graduated B.A., and at 21, left home to practice law. Leaving his father caused him little regret, for his parent had become a man of temper and some abuse. In London, Burke found old friends and made new ones. He gradually drifted from the law and took more and more interest in literature, so that after all, he was not called to the bar. Of the London period, 21 to 30, it is said that his excesses were not of dissipation, but in study. The order Burke was so incensed at his son's adherence to literature that he cut off his allowance, and for a time Edmund was reduced to his last penny. When he was 27, the period of Burke's greatest productivity began. One of his earliest works, said to have been commenced when he was 19, was a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas on the sublime and beautiful AII IQ 150, relative coach to data 0 0.60. John Calvin, 1509 to 1564, a celebrated French Protestant reformer and theologian. AII IQ 135, AII IQ 150. 1. Family standing. The Calvins were a family of energy and capacity who belonged to the upper middle class. The father was a solicitor and attorney. The mother, the daughter, of a well-to-do in Kiber. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. None are recorded other than scholastic. 2. Education. Calvin received the rudiments of his education with the children of the noble family of Momor at the college in his native town. Before he was twelve, his father, who destined him for the church, procured him a chaplaincy, a sinecure. But at fourteen he was sent with the Momar children, with whom he had although at his father's expense, enjoyed every advantage, to the high school of Paris, where he laid the foundation of his remarkable knowledge of Latin. Before he was eighteen, he had attended another Paris school as well. 3. School standing and progress. These are states that Calvin surpassed all his schoolfellows in acuteness of mind and strength of memory, and that he set himself up as the censor of his young companions, Sometime before he reached the age of 18, Calvin made remarkable progress at the College Montagu under the tuition of a learned Spaniard. The extraordinary gifts of the young man were strikingly displayed. His mind was so active, and he soon left all his fellow students behind. 4. Friends and Associates Calvin was associated with a superior group of instructors and students. Among the former was Cordier, a renowned teacher who became his distinguished pupil's friend and disciple. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and achievement. C. 2. 3. 7. Evidences of precocity. C. 2. 3. AIIQ 135. Relative quotient of data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Before Calvin's age really qualified him to hold it, his father secured for him, aged 18, the living of Matreville. But in the following year, the elder Calvin was as communicated, and his son was sent to the University of Orleans to study law under Petrus Stella. Here, the young student gained a high reputation in his legal studies, but he did not relinquish his theological interests. His judgment was even requested on the legality of Henry VIII's divorce. So great indeed was his reputation for learning that the degree of doctor was offered him without the usual fees. An honour, however, 
which he declined to accept. From Orleans, Calvin moved to Borges, and there, coming under the influence of Walmar, he was converted to Protestantism. At twenty, he had abandoned the study of law and devoted himself to theology, having the ambition of becoming head of the Reform Party in France and converting the court to metropolis. But it is said that he lacked the courage of Luther and preferred propagating his doctrines by stealth at a safe distance from possible danger. At twenty-three, because of his complicity in an orthodox sermon preached by the rector of the Sorbonne, the police raided his home. Calvin, however, had fled. In the following year, he ventured to return. At twenty-five, he published a treatise against the doctrine of the soul, quitting the body on death, falls asleep till the day of judgment. In the same year, as persecution increased, Calvin, with other conspicuous Protestants, went to Basel, and there the first edition of his Institutes of the Christian Religion was completed. This work contained the principles to which its author adhered throughout his life. AIIIQ 150, Relative Commission of Data, point four three. Jerome Cardin, 1501-1576, an Italian physician and mathematician. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Sterning Jerome's father, Fazio Cardin, was a man of note among the learned in his neighbourhood. A doctor both in law and in medicine, he was also a great mathematician, but he was hot-tempered, careless of money, and a man of few friends. The mother, daughter of a studious man, was a young widow and not legally married to Fazio, who was forty years her senior. She also was passionate of temper and showed no maternal solicitude for her unwelcome son. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Cardin's scientific father aided the constant growth of superstitious feeling in his child's apt mind. The excitement of Jerome's nervous system when he was a mere child caused phantoms to haunt him. Colourless figures that passed before his eyes in a spectacle he enjoyed. He made a secret of this experience, believing that if he told of it, whatever caused the spectacle would be offended and he should see the show no more. A vivid dream, often repeated of a cock with red wings, caused the child to tremble in fright, and the fear of early death not infrequently depressed his spirits. Sometimes he felt vague emotions that grew into the form of hunger for undying fame. A taste for mathematics led to the cultivation of a gift in calculating nicely the probabilities in games of chance. 2. Education The child whose mother had tried to prevent his birth was born nearly dead. He suffered from the plague when one month old and soon after dropsy. He was undernourished while under the care of his second nurse and was kept in a squalid hut. His mother took him at the age of four, but he continued to suffer from delicate health. From four to seven, he was often brought even to the point of death by the results of two frequent punishments, for he was perpetually beaten by his mother, his aunt and his father, who lived in another house. Beginning with Jerome's eighth year, his father and mother dwelt under one roof with their child. At this time, the fragile boy was ordered daily to attend upon his father when he went abroad, carrying his heavy books and papers through the hot streets of Milan. Before he was nine, Jerome was taught reading and writing and the rudiments of arithmetic by his father, and before he was twelve, he heard some principles of Arabian astrology. He was taught to say by rote the first six books of Lucid, but not to understand them and his father carelessly aided him with a few books and advice in the study of geometry and dialectics. In his father's company he learned to chatter Latin. His mother paid for his instruction in music, while other things Jerome had learned for his own pleasure. 3. School standing and progress. The child had his father's aptitude for exact learning and his mother's vivacity of wit, but by want of sympathy he became contemplative and was forced into communion with his own mind. Thus through unjust neglect, he acquired unwholesome self-consciousness and began to dream constantly of doing some great thing that should command homage. When the boy was about ten, his father grew kinder, warmed towards him by the signs of intellect that he exhibited and by the readiness with which he picked up information, and finding that his recollection of dry facts was bad, his father tried to instill into him a system of artificial memory, but without success. 4. Friends and Associates Augusto Levisario was a friend of whom young Cardan was rather proud to lend his first work, a little treatise on mathematics. 
Niccolo Cardan, a relative, was also Jerome's friend, and the death of Niccolo made a deep impression on the 16-year-old youth. Having no school associates and being regarded as a questionable comrade because of his birth, Cardan was much alone. He lived to himself and in some hope of future things despised the present. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and Achievement. In his eagerness to obtain a name that should not die, Jerome determined to write a treatise, and being best prepared in geometry, he wrote of how and why, the longitude and latitude of two places or stars being known, their true distance from each other may be calculated. But his manuscript lent to a friend who died of the plague was never recovered. And at the same time began another book, more ambitious and more original in its design, an elaborate treatise, not completed till he was twenty-three, on the science that belongs to games of chance. With the death of Niccolo, Jerome at sixteen began to reflect upon the shortness of life, and to acquire by what means he might be able to provide something worthy to be remembered by posterity. He then occupied himself with writing a treatise on the earning of immortality. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 135. Relative quotient of data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Denied the education for which he was thirsting, and trained to no trade or profession, Cardin thought worthy advancement was impossible. With recklessness, he turned his energy into games of chance, and became proficient at every game played with dice. At 18, he simulated religious zeal, making a bold push to secure for himself proper instruction. At this time, his father began to convince that Jerome must learn to write his thoughts in Latin if he was to earn a living as a scholar. The same year, the youth earned some pocket money by giving private lessons in dialectics. Book writing was a pleasure to him, and he spent much time working on his treatises. At 19, he was permitted to go to the University of Pavia, where he worked hardest on learning to read and write Latin. He learned many foreign languages so readily that he attributed his success to a mysterious power imparted by a stranger who sold him a copy of Apuleius. At twenty, he disputed publicly with very great success, and became a teacher of Euclid in the gymnasium. He chose medicine as his profession, as a pursuit most likely to beget a philosophic mind. After his father's death, when Jerome was twenty-three, his mother supported him at the university, now at Padua, where the president and Curtius, a physician of note, aided his progress. At twenty-four, Cardan was appointed rector of the gymnasium. But he received none of the rector's privileges and found the position an expensive one. At 25, after being twice rejected, he was admitted doctor of medicine, and with the aid of a zealous friend, immediately began to practice at Succo, establishing himself there in a house of his own. AIIQ 155, relative question data, 0 0.60. Samuel Clark, 1675-1729, a celebrated English divine and metaphysical writer. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing Clark's father was alderman of the city of Norwich and a member of Parliament, a man of an excellent natural capacity and of untainted reputation for property and all virtue. His mother was a daughter of a merchant. 2. Diverma to age 17. 1. Interests No interests other than scholastic are reported. 2. Education Clark received the first rudiments of learning in the free school at Norwich, where he made a very uncommon proficiency in the learned languages. At sixteen, he was removed to Cambridge. 3. School standing and progress. At Cambridge, his impatient thirst after true knowledge and his great capacity both for discovery and improving it presently began to show themselves. His abilities won for him the name of the Lad of Caius. 4. Friends and associates, no further record. 5. Reading, no further record. 6. Production and Achievement. No further record. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 1 to 35. Relative quotient of data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the University, Clark set himself to the study of what was real and substantial. He abandoned the old Cartesianism, which still held sway in the universities for the newer philosophy of Newton. At twenty, he became Bachelor of Arts, surprising his hearers by the excellence of his address on that occasion. At twenty-one, he published a Latin translation of Roholt's Physics, with notes that practically refuted the text, and his edition became a standard college textbook. 
The retiring chaplain of the Bishop of Norwich recommended the youth of twenty-two and on this recommendation and began of his own favourable impression of the unusual gifts of young Clark. The bishop awarded him his new chaplain. At twenty-four, Clark published three or four theological essays, and at twenty-five, his untiring energy and industry had won for him the regard of a considerable group. AIIIQ 140, relative coastal data, 0.53. Victor Cousin, 1792 to 1867, a noted French philosopher and statesman. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 165. 1. Family Standing. The records concerning Cousin's family are very inadequate. They indicate only that the father was a jeweller, the mother a laundress, the boy himself a ragamuffin. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Nothing recorded beyond school studies. 2. Education. Through an heroic act of protecting another little fellow of about his own age, ten years, the street vagabond cousin came to the attention of his little protege's mother, who arranged for his attendance at the Lyceum. He knew how to read and write before entering the school. 3. School standing and progress. During his first three years in the Lyceum, Victor's progress was not phenomenal, but at 13, having been chosen to represent his school at the competitive examination, he won a second prize for a Latin theme. In the following years, he was regularly selected to represent his school in the public examination. At 14, he won a first prize for a Latin translation. At 15, he won two first prizes, Latin theme and Greek translation, and a second prize, Latin translation, and at 16, a first prize in Greek translation, and second prizes in Latin translation and Latin verse. 4. Friends and Associates No specific record, but C2-2. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and achievement. No specific record. 7. Evidences of precocity. C23. AIIQ 135. Relief quotient data. 0. 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Cousin achieved four first prizes and one second prize in the competitive examinations, a brilliant and unheard of triumph. He received national recognition and reward. At 20, he won the doctorate after being among the foremost in his class. He became professor of philosophy the same year and rapidly advanced until, at 23, he had surpassed his teachers. AIIIQ 165, relative coach data 0.75. William Cowper, 1731 to 1800, a celebrated English poet. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Cowper came from superior stock. His mother's ancestry was perhaps more distinguished than his father's, for she was descended from Mary Bullin, sister of Queen Anne, and related to the poet Don, the Dean of St. Paul's. Apparently William had respect, but not much affection for his father. His mother, who died when he was six, he cherished with the tenderest memory. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. C. 2, 3 and 6. Being equally fond of his studies and his sports, he excelled in both. 2. Education. In six years following the death of his mother, Cowper was, in accordance with the cruel custom of the time, sent to a large boarding school. The change from home to a boarding school is bad enough. Now is much worse in those days. He spent two years there, stayed out of school for a year to have his eyes treated, and then, age 10, entered Westminster, where he continued until he was 18. 3. School Standing and Progress The two years of boarding school were very miserable. William's chief affliction, he wrote later, was the cruel treatment for which he was singled out by the school bully. This persecution endured in secret was finally discovered, the perpetrator was expelled and William removed. At his next school, Westminster, Cowper might have been very happy, had it not been for occasional fits of melancholy and symptoms of a more serious character, delusions. 4. Friends and Associates At Westminster, his intimacies were formed with the most intellectual of his schoolfellows, with those who afterwards distinguished themselves. Among these friends were Robert Lloyd, George Coleman, Warren Hastings, and Elijah M.P. But his special playfellow was William Russell, the great-great-grandson of Oliver Cromwell. 6. Production and Achievement Cowper's poetic gift began to show itself when he was about 14, and he won some little distinction at school with his verse which was said to reveal a peer's mind. He translated an elegy of 
tubulus and wrote an imitation of philip's splendid shilling which was declared by southey to show a manner formed seven evidences of precocity cowper's constitution is said to have discovered at a very early season its morbid tendency to diffidence melancholy and despair later he related the only instance of his boyhood aged eight or less in which his spirit conquered over his moods of depression miserable and dreading the appearance of the tormenting bully of his school he recalled the psalmist's words i will not be afraid of what man can do to me and immediately there surged up in him a feeling of courage and cheer see also two one and two six aiiq one hundred thirty five relative quotient data point six zero three developed from seventeen to twenty six after concluding his school days at eighteen Carver served for three years as clerk in a law office spending much of his time in the home of his aunt with his cousin theodora he was twenty-one when he began to be afflicted with religious melancholy which he finally stayed for a time through prayer and change of scene at twenty-three he was called to the bar but he did not practice law about this time too he fell in love with his cousin but her father would not consent to a marriage a little later he made the acquaintance of some men of letters and joined the nonsense club thus marking the beginning of a period of literary activity a i i i q one hundred forty relative coast of data point six zero end of section twenty one